Okay, I think we can probably get started. Um, so welcome everyone to yet another exciting reclosure uh, 2021. Um, so we prepared a quick introduction to uh, some of the aspects of the organization and the format of a few things that you need to know in order to attend the conference the best possible way. So um, here we go. Let me see if I can move this. Okay, so you already joined uh, in the Zoom uh, chat or in the Zoom uh, conference link. Um, this is where the main interaction for the day is going to be uh, primarily. Uh, so we are going to stream talks, we are going to have our guests, we are going to have our panels. And uh, you can use, feel free to use the chat uh, on Zoom. We are trying to keep an eye on all the possible chats that we have available, the other big one being Discord. So all the general interaction and especially the live interaction will happen in Zoom. Uh, on Discord, we, uh, we have all the other kind of uh, offline or asynchronous interactions. Uh, we have prepared uh, a channel for each of the talk and a panel for each of the Q&A so a channel for each of the QA panels. Uh, the idea is to use uh, the channel of the talk for like anything connected to the talk that you want to ask. Normally, uh, the speaker is connected to their chat and uh, checking for questions or comments or things that you want to discuss about a particular topic regarding that talk. Um, similar for the Q&A related channel on Discord, uh, that will be used uh, to collect questions at the end of each of pair of talk. We are going to have um, a Q&A panel with the two speakers who previously um, gave their talk. And you can ask any questions on that channel. And uh, on Discord, there's also like uh, uh, several other kind of spaces organized for you. Um, there are, you know, there's a general chat and there are uh, a couple of uh, audio video enabled channels um, there for the corridor talks or for any um, spontaneous showcase you might want to give to somebody. If you have something uh, nice to show, you can use that um, showcase channel to demo anything you might think is interesting. Um, and there's also the place for organize, like if you want to contact the organization, uh, we have uh, our organizers today. Um, they are uh, they have a suffix of organizers, so you can see that they they are organizers, and there is an organizer channels in the information group that you can use for any communication. If you have any trouble connecting, any trouble, um, you know, of, of any sort, you can contact us. We are also streaming on YouTube. Uh, we sent the link in a few places um, but if you're here you're probably not going to follow on the, on the youtube stream but if you have any friends that uh, is not interested in connecting via zoom you can just post the youtube stream maybe on your like uh, a company slack or, or any other community you're part of and people can join on that without the interaction part but they can see follow the talk in the background if they want to um, the website of course contains the schedule uh, the abstracts and the bios. We're going to do a little bit of that today, introducing our speakers. So you, um, you're going to have some context regardless, but if you want more information and specific information, feel free to go on the website. And Twitter for any mention, uh, feel free to use it and abuse it. Uh, use the hashtag reclosure. Uh, if there's something exciting, just post it there so people know that we are having fun and we have a, a great conference. You can also use the at reclosure to get our attention as well. Uh, the format, uh, a few words. So we we are going to be three hosts um, or co-hosts um, presenting talks and uh, uh, making sure that everything is going smoothly today. Um, Jordan Miller is going to uh, join us in a few hours when uh, she wakes up. And for the moment, it's me and John uh, John, also known as Practicali, maybe you, you know him from his uh, handle everywhere else. Um, John, maybe you can just chime in for a second. 
Hi, yeah, I'm uh, very excited to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I shall be doing uh, like lifting some of the load from Renzo, who does an awful lot of stuff for the workshop to uh, uh, to get this conference going. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, looking forward to lots of exciting talks. You'll see me in the mornings, um, and then I'll be chilling out in the evenings, watching you along with everybody else. Thanks. Fantastic. So um, the format for the two official or like uh, pre-designed days of the conference is 9 30 a.m so we're gonna um we started 9 30 a.m like opening the conference for everyone to get in but the first talk will be at 10 a.m in seven minutes and we are gonna stop at some point like uh, around 9 p.m but we don't know exactly depending on how like uh, if we have any delays hopefully not uh, but uh, it also depends on how long our Q&A with the keynoters will be long. So it's the same for Friday and Saturday, which is handy, so you know um, the structure is not going to change. We are going to have this welcome, this welcome uh, intro, also tomorrow, maybe with some different news. And then it's going to be structured with these five groups of two talks, followed by a Q&A panel, and uh, there, there's going to be break in between them and also longer breaks every once in a while to get some fresh air, a coffee or like just to detach yourself from the screen for a few minutes. Um, so the structure we will be repeating, it's a, it's a nice loop. Um, two talks, the, each talk is 25 minutes, followed by a quick break. Uh, we are going to have some nice visual art this year to um, like uh, fill the gap or like a, show you something interesting while you while we are preparing for the next talk over or, or the next QA panel and uh, the interlude there is just something similar to a talk slot where we're going to use it for something different uh, we have a few community leaders um, other closure community leaders who are uh, reporting about their experience or forming a community and chatting a little bit about um, their problem what works, what is working for them and what is not working so we can help them uh, or they can help us uh, improving our own communities. If you want to maybe to start your own, this is a good, uh, a great start, a great getting started the guide introduction. Uh, we also having um, sponsor pitches. So our great sponsors uh, that I didn't mention at the beginning, but let's go back. Let's this quick one. Um, Hi, Death Unlocked. New Bank, Fresh Code, Juxt, and Kaiwan this year. Um, they, um, some of them are going to uh, share some news about uh, their company culture, if they have any uh, hiring, open roles, um, or anything you might be interested in knowing about how they use Clojure, um, what they do, uh, and how they do it. And uh, there are also sponsors related channels on Discord you can join to ask any questions to them directly if you want to. So this is a little bit like the, the program we are going to finish with the keynote uh, every day. And uh, um, yeah, this is uh, like uh, the current lineup for the interludes. Um, I didn't mention, I, I mentioned community leaders uh, like lightning talks, but we want to open up this space also for other lightning talks. If you want to participate, uh, we are trying, we, we should be like three or four um, additional five minutes slots uh, that we can use. So if you have an idea for a lightning talk, um, a lightning talk being some spontaneous short talk where you present something interesting to the rest of the conference. Um, there is a lightning talks channel on Discord that you can use to propose your idea and then we are going to vote it and uh, the highest the, the ideas getting the highest votes uh, will will be um, granted access to the five minute slot. Um, this is the, 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 the part that I was uh, kind of implicitly talking about talking about the, the, the pre-planned two days conference because we are going to have a third day conference. So this is still part of the awesome work that Cyclodge is doing, um, collaborating with us this year. And also, you know, the driving theme for the conference is uh, data science. So all Clojureans invited, if you want to continue the conversation, think about what you heard at the conference, all the talks, all the nice presentations, uh, you can continue that on Sunday, um, and this is the preliminary uh, program. Uh, there's a lot more that cannot 
it cannot be possibly fit on the slide. So uh, please, um, you can uh, either ask Daslu in the in the Zoom chat or Daslu as as well on Discord. Who is a little bit our like uh, organization master for the third day um, about where to find more information, or uh, you can uh, grab that link bitly data dash science dash special dash 21 dash 12 dash 05. Um, so we are close to the first talk, so I need to probably speed up a little bit. Um, this is the interaction, but we are going to explain this over. Um, over the conference anyway uh, but we have three three ways raise your hands for live interaction if you want to ask your question live to the speaker uh, you can use the zoom chat or you can use discord q a panels chats as well um, remember that we have we are we are enforcing the code of conduct you can find it at this link um, which is you know just reasonably be nice with everyone at the conference and that is uh you know uh, uh, a very like uh, short sentence to say what the con code of conduct is about but just uh, relax uh, enjoy the conference and be nice with everyone else and uh, it will be like a wonderful conference so big thanks the dream team from this year uh, let me let me call them out uh, bruno is not with us today but he helped us a lot uh, daniel david Felipe, who's responsible for the website design and general the website. John, Jordan, Pavel, Peter, Renzo, and Safia. So thanks to our wonderful speakers as well. Uh, it's thanks to the effort that we are, like today we are producing this wonderful program for you. Our wonderful keynoters, of course, all the community leaders and our mighty sponsors. Thank you very much. And above everything else, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining the conference. And um, I we really hope that this is gonna be like an awesome event and you're going to enjoy the show. Thank you very much. So now I'm gonna stop the sharing and we're gonna get straight into the first talk, I think. <laughs> Thank you, Renzo. Thank you. And welcome, everyone. I hope you're enjoying that nice introduction. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing the first two talks, both of which have a theme of combining storytelling and closure REPL driven development. We open with Martin Cavallar, uh, who's in introducing an exciting new project called Clerk, uh, which can create uh, like visual stories all driven from the closure REPL. And uh, Martin is part of a small team that is building the Next Journal, uh, which is a popular notebook or for reproducible research. And uh, this provides uh, Alex, uh, like an essential tool for a lot of different data science and science in general, really. So let's discover what Clerk can do for you. Over to Martin. Hi, I'm Martin. I'd like to talk to you about notebooks and the REPL. So as Clojurians, we all love the REPL, right? And of course, I mean a real editor-connected REPL into our running system. So we love the REPL and we don't really like notebooks. I mean, we, we love our editors. We don't want to edit code in the browser. And these notebook formats that put our code into JSON blobs together with base64 encoded results that we can't reasonably put into version control or reuse they're not so great. But there is a lot of stuff to like about notebooks. Notebooks as a medium take us beyond text. They allow us to make sense of our data, generate insights, draw pictures. They're great at telling a story and we can look at them on the web. If we consider those things, the REPL really starts to look a lot less ideal. It's only text, no visual results. They're not so good at telling a story. The reading experience is just not great with these monospaced fonts. We always need to start a running system and evaluate a form to see a result. These are some of the thoughts that went into building Clerk, our attempt to bring those two things we love, notebooks and the REPL, closer together. I'd like to show you now what Clerk is and what it can do for you, starting with a small live coding session. Let's dive right in.
One of the main perks of Clerk is you get to use your editor that some of you have spent decades tweaking to their liking and you get to keep your REPL. First, this is Emacs here that I'm using and I'm starting a REPL now, starting my closure process and I get a connection. I can evaluate this form and this will start Clerk, tell it to open a browser when it started and watch these paths for file system changes. So I'm creating a new closure namespace. Let's make the font a bit bigger. And this is basically hello world in Clerk. As I save this, you see this shows up as pros, this line comment, and I can do computations. Cool. Let's explore our dictionary a bit. And you can see my editor being helpful here. So it's completing these paths and I can slurp those. Cool, you can see in Clerk, this is a fairly large string, a megabyte, two and a half million characters. And I'm getting a tiny preview of this in Clerk and I can load more data on demand. Let's also add a small namespace declaration here and let's massage this a bit. So I'm splitting this into individual lines. This is now 230,000 words. Again, Clerk renders this nicely for me. Let's group this by the first character. Cool. Now, again, I have a map now here. I can load data at the root level as I can further down the tree. And so I think this might be a bit nicer still. So you see we have upper and lower case characters. Let's fix that. And turning this into a keyword might make things a bit nicer still. And how about we sort this as well? Cool. So this is our data set we're gonna look at. We give this a name, so these are kind of letters to words, right? Looking good. And you can see as I would evaluate this in Emacs, I'm not sure if you can see this here, I just get the bar name back. Where's clerk? shows us the data behind the bar. We can now bring in Clerk and with just some tiny, tiny code, we can make this a lot more useful. So let's put this into a table. Nice. We have a table of all the characters and again, we can to understand most of the different table formats that folks would use in Clojure and convert them to understand them automatically. Next, I'd like to explore what's the distribution of words by starting character. We're mapping over the count of the values in this map. I'm using the REPL now to evaluate this. This looks good. Now let's put this into a plotly plot. That doesn't look quite right. I think I need actually a map of data and get this in here nice. Um, but the axes are wrong. Let's change them around. And some labels would still be nice. Cool. I think it's pretty clear if you compare these two things here that I can make sense of this graph and get the answer that I need much quicker and get a much clearer picture. Now I see that P and S are the most common letters. And overall, it's very, very little custom code that I need to get these things. So that's the first example with plain closure and clerk. We're going to look at two more now. So. First, tap. So 
So you might be familiar with closure core tab. If you're not, it's a closure core function, allows us to send values to a tab and we can add these listeners via add tab, which means whenever we tap a value, closure core is gonna call all of these function handlers that we've registered. And what we do here, we just conch this onto this atom we've defined. We're using a def once to make sure it is only defined once, starting out with the empty list. And now I can actually run some forms to see this in action. So you see these numbers are showing up as I tap them, some random integers. Let's also add a vector of random numbers, a map, some random words, and a few more integers. Cool, and you can see I can still lazily load more data. Again, clerks, default viewers are being helpful here by not overflowing the REPL or not overflowing clerk with two large values. If we're printing a big data set to the REPL, we run into problems. This is what we're trying to solve here. So that's tap and on to the next one. What you've seen up to here are just clerks built in viewers. I think you've seen that they can be pretty useful in a lot of situations, but sometimes you just need something special. And we're going to look at that now. Rule 30. So I'm sure everyone has seen the game of life. There are many systems like it, each named for the order in which the rules were discovered. This is a clerk notebook exploring rule 30. I'm just going to walk you through how this works. In the REPL first, we define rule 30 as this map. This defines for each entry state kind of the successor state. So if I get three cells with ones in it, and we use numbers here as a binary representation. And yeah, this is how, how my REPL would show it. Then we get the first generation as a vector with zeros and a one in the middle, and then we can finally evolve the board, right? And let's look at that. So yeah, we can kind of squint and see that there is a pattern here, but it's kind of hard to see what's going on, right? And so we can bring in some clerk custom viewers specific for our problem at hand to, I think, yeah, get a clearer insight of what's happening here. So let's do that first. So clerk viewers in general, there are maps of predicates and a render function. They can have more things on them, but that's kind of the essence. And as I enable this, you can see each cell is being displayed as this tiny square. We're using our HTML viewer here with these diffs with a fixed width and height, and as well setting some classes, and they're gonna be either with a black or white background. I can lazily load more data again here, and things should look a lot better if I bring in more of these viewers. So we also define a viewer for vectors as well as for lists. And so compare these two things here, right? I can get a much nicer picture on the right, really without a lot of custom code. This is all the code I had to write for this situation. And it's really not that much code and not that hard. A final example of plain closure and clerk before we get to the more exciting stuff. My kids have this game, but they lost the dice that came with it. So it's not really hard to make a dice in closure, right? This is pretty standard stuff. We have a, um, six sides to our dice. We have an atom that's going to store the state and we can kind of roll it from the REPL, right? Blau. We're also saying what the side is. Gelb. And we're printing it to the REPL. My kids can't really use anything that they can't touch on their iPad. I want to get them to use the REPL, but I think we're still a few years off here. We can bring in Clerk to make this actually happen, again, with very little code. And so what we're doing here, we're defining a viewer that's just a render function in this case. And we're putting this just on this form using clerk with viewer. It will be called with the value inside the dice atom, which is a side. And then we're rendering this with a pretty large font, as well as a button with an on-click handler that when invoked uses the clerk eval function of the viewer API 
to send this quoted form over to Clerk, where Clerk will eval it in the JVM. Let's try this. Blau. Blau. Grün. That's it. Now, up to here, this was all just plain Clojure and Clerk. But we can combine Clerk with any libraries in the Clojure ecosystem to do many more interesting things. And I'm excited to show you two great examples of this. First, Sikkim Utils. Let's make this a bit bigger. Sikkim Utils is a closure port of a scheme library for classical mechanics from Sussman. This closure port is built by Colin Smith and Sam Ritchie. Sam was kind enough to collaborate with us on this notebook here. In Sikkim Utils, you can write closure code to represent equations that we can use to drive physical simulations. Now, this is pretty meaty stuff. We'll just fly over it and I'll share this so you can read along later. We're not going to interact with this interactively now. This is its own story that you can read along and you can play with in your editor. We'll provide a sample repo for you to play with. The first thing to note is that you have closure forms representing a physical system using functional geometry. What's cool is that SIGIM utils can perform algebraic simplifications on them and render different representations of a given expression. Here you kind of see a prefix notation. Here you see a simplified version of this, and here we see a LaTeX rendering of the simplified version. So we're going to mostly scroll pretty quickly past most of this stuff. Here is initial conditions being set up for our double pendulum. Then there's going to be some helper code for visualizations. And until we finally get to this great picture. So what you see here is, a, again, using just a quirk, Clerk Vega Light Viewer, very little custom code. And yeah, we can move the slider here to, to run through time, right? As well as have a visualization of the pathways this took through time. And so this is kind of the chaotic case for these chaotic initial conditions. And here we have the same thing for regular data. And yeah, there's a lot more to Sikkim utils. Um, Sam is working, working on a lot of stuff that's yeah even more mind blowing. He's just added general relativity to it, and I'm really excited to to really gain a deeper understanding as somebody who studied physics then, to deepen my understanding of physics uh, through computation. Well, so, that's so that's it for physics with Clark and Sikkim utils. And you almost made is, it just one final yeah, example. Object, uh, getting the world's knowledge into Clerk. This notebook is using another cool library, Jack Russia's Mandaneum. It's named after Paul Oatlitz's attempt to index the world's knowledge. Some consider it a precursor to the internet. I think it's fair to oh, it's call this a precursor to, to Wikipedia for sure. Again, you can read along. This is a pretty good narrated story. You can read along later. I just want to highlight kind of that not a lot of custom code is going to be needed here to do this stuff. So first, we can ask it questions like, what has James Clerk Maxwell, who's also the naming patron of this library, famous for having invented or discovered? And we get back this internal ID, but can easily resolve this, find out that that's a unified field theory. And we can get this information also in many different languages. Again, this is all just the built-in viewers, no custom visualization code at all, and it's already pretty useful. But yeah, putting this into a table can make things nicer, right? Or kind of grouping it by the inventor to find out that Albert Einstein has in wait, invented quite a few things, some of which you'll soon be able to explore with Sikkim Utils and Clerk. Let's look at another example visualizing geospatial data. So in this query, we're looking up all places in Germany ending in au or its, indicating that they're of Slavic origin. We're getting their latitude, longitude, and name. Then we're using a Vega viewer to visualize those on a map. This is what it looks like. Again, very little custom code. But we can also go a bit further. Here, we're querying for all 
swifts or hummingbirds and generating a custom table using the hiccup viewer showing their names their pictures and their home range for each one beautiful a last example and then we're done a network diagram so this is again using Clerk's HTML viewer that also understands SVG, combining this with Jack's heroic library to draw us a network graph of the origins or of all programming languages influenced by Lisp. And yeah, we get back this really huge graph. You can best explore this on your own, I think. And yeah, so we get Lisp at the root. Um, and we can find closure, I think, somewhere here on the right. Here it is. I hope this gives you a sense of what's possible with Clerk when we combine it with some of the amazing libraries we have in the Clojure ecosystem. Both of these notebooks were created without any changes to Clerk. I think this is a testament to the great power of the composability we have in the Clojure library ecosystem. To wrap things up, I'd like to show you how the static publishing works. And I should actually say that these notebooks you've seen, they are statically published. So yeah, I can't load these elisions here anymore, but these are actually static websites that you can easily put someplace on the web for others to read. And let's go back to my script here. So we have this clerks build static app command, right? That opens up this index HTML page, but I actually want to show you that we can easily open my finder, get this index page and drop this directory in here. Something went wrong, but I'm happy it's not in my software. Let's try this again. Cool. And now we have this website live. And yeah, you can see I can still load this notebook you've seen here. It has all the stuff in it, right, including this big SVG. And it's time to, for me to thank you. Thanks for listening. Thanks to everybody who contributed to Clerk. Special thanks to Jack, who's been mentoring me on this project. And yeah, his help has really been invaluable. If you like Clerk, please play with it and reach out to me on Twitter or next journal on the Clojure in Slack with feedback. Thank you. Wow, uh, Clerk looks amazing and, and lots of fun too. I'm excited to start experimenting with it. Thank you very much, Martin, that was great. Um, now we have a short break and we're gonna show some closure generative art while we get the next speaker ready. Um, just as a guide, there's a countdown timer in the to the next talk in the bottom right-hand corner uh, as we're showing the generative art. Enjoy.
Hello, I hope you enjoyed that generative art. And uh, we've just got a few more minutes actually before we uh, have the next speaker. The next speaker is scheduled for 10.30. Um, in case you're actually interested in who's behind this generative art, uh, let me uh, share my screen. Uh, it's the um, artist for a lot of these is uh, Jack Russia, uh, who is um, uh, quite a prolific artist. You can see some of his work on uh, Instagram, and uh, also he's got like the Jack Russia on Twitter as well, and uh, has a website as well where he does a whole bunch of uh, uh, very creative works and some of the. Uh, uh, some of the thinking behind those as well. So that's a very uh, interesting place to go and check out. And uh, if you, um, yeah, if you have any questions about that, I'm sure like if we have chat in the Discord somewhere, um, we can discuss more. Uh, talk about questions. If we, um, yeah, uh, we have questions. We have panels for speakers after, after we've had uh, two talks. So hopefully you've got tons of questions to ask uh, Martin about notebooks and you'll have questions when we come to uh, David as well. And so, uh, yeah, uh, just a reminder of how, how to ask questions. You can do that in a specific Discord channel. So there's a QA um, uh, Martin and David channel, which you can ask questions specifically about these two speakers and we will ask the questions for you. Or if you uh, prefer, you can also ask those questions live uh, by Zoom. Uh, and we'd like you to obviously raise your hand first so we know that everybody isn't speaking all at once. And uh, we'll kind of get, get you to unmute and, uh, and then you can ask your questions. Also for better visualization of the slides during the, um, the presentations, uh, we want to suggest you use the standard view in Zoom. So there is like uh, at least in my Zoom uh, on the upper right corner, you can select different kinds of views. They are side by side, um, side by side in a gallery speaker and so on. And if you pick the standard view, you will have the best experience because um, it won't distract you with, uh, you know, um, maybe still images of people without a camera on and stuff like that on the side. So that's the preferred view, standard view, standard in Zoom. Okay, so we're nearly at time. So let's uh, let's introduce David. So we're continuing with this story theme and David is gonna show us how to create closure script components and build uh, engaging user interfaces. Um, all the while, um, while building uh, like a story using this popular storybook tool. This gives a uh, fast feedback of rendering components as well as visual interaction uh, with those components. Uh, David himself is very active in the community and has shared his passion for agile development and closure at numerous conferences as well. So I'm looking forward to a really good talk from David. Over to you. Okay, let's begin. Welcome to this session about component-driven closure script with Storybook. My name is David and I'm a developer and, and I live and work in Stockholm, Sweden. And today I want to talk about Storybook, give a quick overview and also how we can use Storybook with Closure Script, writing stories and documentation. And I want to highlight some issues or some things that can pop up when we work with tools from the JavaScript ecosystem. But I want to begin with Composed, sorry, component driven. What is that? Well, in short, it's about grouping relevant code into a component and combi combining components into features. And there's even a website for it, componentdriven.org. And here you can read, read about component driven user interfaces and about creating components, combining components into features combining features into pages or views and combining views into a full-blown web app. So component-driven is about front-ends and user interfaces. And Storybook is a tool that can help us work component-driven. So you, we write storage, stories which are 
isolated UIs where we can render, our com render and test our components. And Storybook is an open source tool, it's browser based and it's all about JavaScript. And that means that we can use it in ClojureScript too. And here's Storybook in action. To the left we have a bunch of stories and in the center there is a canvas with a component. I have borrowed this component from Material UI. And with Storybook I can experiment and try out how a component behaves by, by using uh, uh, the component, sorry, the Storybook toolbar, like scaling up, scaling down. And this is my favorite. I can try out different viewports to see how a component behaves in different kinds of devices. And there's also a documentation section. I'll come back to that uh, shortly. But there are more good stuff in the uh, toolbar. There's a grid. And there's also uh, a feature where you can measure your individual components. And you can also outline the different things within a component, different elements uh, and things like that. So I'm going to try to write my, one myself. And I think a good place to start is to browse the storybook documentation. So I'm going to navigate to, to writing stories. And here we can find, read about the, the building blocks of a storybook story. And it's basically made of two parts, a default export and the story itself. And the default is um, information about the story, metadata. And the story is where we actual, actually render the component that we want to build a story for. So I'm going to try to write this in Clojure script. So I'm going to begin with the default, adding a title. That. And this one uh, needs to be exported, so it, vis so it will be visible in, in Storybook. Next up is the story, and that is a function. Like that, and that one also needs to be exported. So if we see, uh, look, take, have a look in Storybook, boom. I guess I forgot one important thing, and that is uh, some JavaScript interrupts. So I have to convert my map into a JavaScript object. So now I have my hello world story, but it's empty because I don't have anything in my story function. So I'm thinking, I want to add, uh, I want to build a component. And I think I'm going to do that in line, in this file. In the real world, I would have uh, created a component in a separate namespace in the source folder and things like that. But for now, I'm, for now I'm going to settle with this. So I'm going to do something simplistic, a string, maybe a header, like that. And the next thing is to actually add that component to my story function. And I'm using reagent, I'm building React component using reagent. And one important thing to think about is that the uh, reagent component need to be wrapped in the as element function of reagent. And there's my hello world component, like that. I think I forgot one thing uh, in the metadata component, and I believe that is optional, but I also think that some third party tools rely on uh, that, that uh, key being set. So I'm, I better do that. And one thing to think about here is that you have to wrap this one in a Reactify component from the Reagent library. But this is start, starting to get some a bit too verbose. So I'm thinking about, I have actually created a helper function that will take care of all, of all that boilerplate because I don't want to have to repeat myself each time I'm going to read a, write a story. So I'm going to remove all these wrappers and let my, my helper take care of that. Let's have a quick look at the helper. So basically uh, the helper takes the map and selects keys to, to, to run that reagent function on. 
So I'm going to continue with my component to make it a little bit more interesting. I'm thinking about passing in a message instead of, instead of hard coding uh, th that text like that. So I'm going to where I consume this component, I'm adding some text. Great. And I'm thinking about using a, a, a nice feature of Storybook called arguments. And arguments is something that will pop up in this Storybook UI. You can define defaults uh, to an argument like that. And Storybook will also send arguments to your stories so you can work with them programmatically. And the args uh, param is a JavaScript object. So we have to convert that one into a JavaScript, uh, sorry, closure script map. So now I can extract the message key from my closure script params uh, uh, map. And if we have a look at, at the UI, something should pop up right there. Great. So I have a text box now, and that is uh, uh, my, my defined argument. So this means that I can experiment and try out components uh, in the Storybook UI. So I can experiment with different uh, amounts of uh, text to see how compo uh, my component behaves, like that. Great. You might have noticed the Actions tab, and Actions are similar to Controls, but, uh, so, uh, but there's one difference. Because with Actions you can handle events. So what I want to do is to continue working with my component. I'm thinking about adding a button to it. Like that, and some text to it. And what I want to do, I want to at, uh, attach an on click event handler, and I'm thinking about passing it into to the uh, component just like with a message. Something like that. And I think that this time I'm going to expect a map. And I'm going to destruct the keys like that. Great. So next up, to, to make this uh, working in, in Storybook, I'm going to use a feature called archetypes. And that is how you, we define actions. So I give it a name. And what Storybook will, will do, it will create an action. And an action is a function. It's a higher order function that will wrap our events and uh, the actions will also be passed in as arguments so what i'm going to do now i'm going to pass in the entire params uh, map like that and and now we can see in the controls that that i have an on click and if i i think i'm going to scale up the text a bit like that and if we switch to the actions tab and click you see that uh, I have a register click event and it's currently the entire event uh, displayed. But I'm going to do something more, a little bit more real world like and send some data through this event handler. I'm going to settle with the message. So let's click again. There. So that's my, my data passed in. I'm going to change the text to make sure that Storybook actually grabs the uh, current, uh, currently written text like that. Fantastic. Great. So that's actions. So let's continue with documentation. Um, I know that uh, quite a few use a Storybook for documenting components. And there's, uh, the current view is quite sparse, so I'm thinking about customizing it a bit. And that can be done, done by adding data to, to the default text park. So I'm going to define parameters and docs. And what I want to do next is to add a description to, to this component. So that text pops up in the UI. 
And it turns out that this property is actually, does actually support Markdown. So there's a couple of more properties that we can set, and that is the subtitle. Great. You might have noticed the show code um, uh, button. Currently that doesn't look too well because I think this is the one thing that doesn't work that well in the ClojureScript JavaScript interop. But it is possible to customize this uh, part too. So I'm going to like write a, a, a uh, add a string there instead. So it pops, turns out there. And what I have noticed is, is that if the string has a format that reminds of, uh, that looks like JSX or JavaScript, like that, Storybook will actually render it uh, nicely. But I'm going to do some, some something more closure-y, like that. Works pretty well too. I want to show you one thing more. I think yeah, that it's a good idea to put the like code examples a little bit, little bit closer to, to where we have our uh, implementation. So as an alternative, we can actually grab the metadata from a component like this. And documentation is a feature that I personally doesn't, don't use that much. I'm just going to remove this. But while I'm at it, I'm going to take this even further because I did some digging, digging in the uh, storybook uh, source code and I found out about the add-ons um, doc, uh, docs feature. So I'm going to import it and grab a bunch of components and by doing that I can, I can customize the entire view, documentation view. I guess I had a typo there, right? So, but, and this, that can be done by defining by writing a custom documentation component using these these uh, storybook react components so i'm going to add a title subtitle basically this the similar thing that we see here but i'm going to customize it a bit i'll come back to primary stories what what these are but i want to add a title first and perhaps a subtitle too. And a short description. And to be able to display this, I'm going to add a property to the default export. So it's the parameters, key, docs, and a page. And I'm going to set my custom uh, component like that. So, so now, now the view renders my custom component. And primary in stories is about the stories itself. So I'm going to add a variation of my, my story and it will list all existing stories. And I can also customize the title of, of, of the stories part two, like, like that. So this is a way to, to use uh, Storybook as a documentation. I'm going to reset all of this like that. Great. And I want to, yeah, I forgot one thing. There's uh, some documentation that you can read about, of course, in the Storybook doc documentation. And there's also one thing called MDX. Uh, and that is something that I haven't tried yet. But if you do, please let me know how it goes and if it's useful for us uh, as Closure Script developers. So now I'm going to leave this uh, technical part a bit and reflect a bit on the actual usage of, of uh, Storybook. So I have uh, created a component, user card, with a text box and a button and an, an avatar. And I can experiment how the different parts behaves. I'm getting a bit formal there if I change the text. What if I would have a really long name? You know Pippi Longstocking? Uh, her, this is her Swedish, full Swedish name. And Longstrup. That's a really long name. So with this I can see how a component behaves with unexpected uh, texts. But when I think about it and 
press the outline, uh, I can s clearly see that this component is made of several parts. And it, perhaps it should be several components too. So what I have done, I have extracted the avatar part. So I can still, so I can experiment with the avatar features in isolation. What would happen if my gravi gravatar link would be broken? Like that. It turns out that the material UI defaults are pretty good. If I'm going back to the user, the user card, there's a text box and I think there's some magical button appearing and disappearing too. So I'm going, I have actually extracted that one too into a component. So I can work with that one in isolation. And it turns out that this component has CSS that will right align the entire component. So that's why it appears to the right in this, in, also in Storybook. And that uh, strange uh, save button, I've ex actually extracted that one too, so I can experiment with the, with the fading in and fading out, the visual appearance of this uh, button. So coming back to my original component, that is now a combination of several components. I can reflect on the actual usability. And it, even if it uh, was a good idea when I started developing, developing it, I realize now that making that button disappear when I lose focus on the text box is a bad idea. It's a really bad idea. So I'm thinking about this, uh, I can fix this. So I'm going to go to my new button component that I have extracted. Let's scale that text a bit, yeah. So I'm doing some CSS magic styling with the visibility. So I'm thinking about just deleting it like that. And you know, deleting code is my favorite part of software development. Usually less code is less problems. So while I'm here, I'm going to keep continue experiment with, with the, the UI of this button. What would happen if I increase the size? to a medium, maybe even large. Great. And I cannot really remember what that variant uh, property is, is doing. So I think I'm going to delete it because I have to read, read, read up on the material UI a bit. Well, I guess maybe I should uh, undo that. And I think I can actually write contained to get a full background like that. Great. I think I want to size down the button to medium perhaps. Great. I'm happy. And let's make our linter CLJ condo happy too by doing that. Great. So how does all of this work? Well, I'm going to fire up my, my tree view so you can see the source code. So I have my components in a component folder in the, in the main, in a main folder, and I have my stories in a stories folder. And I'm using shadow CLJS, and I have an alias for my app and an alias for my stories. So what differs them are the targets. So the store, uh, story target is an MPN module. I've also defined a reg regex to be able to find uh, which parts of the co code is actually a story, like that. And I've in this case, I've put all my stories in the public folder. Perhaps in the real world, maybe uh, these, uh, th this code should be uh, somewhere else. So with this, uh, closure script is done. So it's time to hand it over to Storybook and Storybook uses Webpack and that is what I have been have running uh, been running all the time. So Webpack listens to code changes and will recompile things. So there's also a Storybook folder with some configuration. And here I tell Storybook where to find the, the compiled stories and also how to customize uh, Storybook's Webpack configuration because I use Material UI and AWS Amplify and there, between them there are some JavaScript quirks to, to, that needs to be taken care of. So that can be done in uh, the Webpack configuration. 
And this file is very important because Storybook uses Babel. But uh, we don't need Babel because Closure Script has only, already taken care of all, all that for us. So I'm telling Storybook to just ignore uh, Babel. We can also set uh, different uh, uh, backgrounds in the Storybook UI itself, like that. And if we have like global CSS or maybe even scripts, it's possible to inject them, inject them into the stories by adding it to, to the preview. And here I can customize the behavior of the Storybook, maybe how the documentation is rendered and what kind of viewports are displayed and things like that. Well, that's it. So I've been covering Storybook, how we can use it in Closure Script, and how we can handle uh, quirks from the uh, JavaScript tooling ecosystem. Thank you for listening. Uh, I hope that you have learned something uh, useful. And don't hesitate to contact me online, on, maybe on Twitter, on uh, GitHub, or, or maybe even on uh, the Closure and Slack. Thank you again for listening. Bye. Well, thank you, David. That was wonderful introduction into Storybook uh, with ClojureScript. It seems a very valuable tool for building UI components. Uh, so next up, we have the panel. So you get an opportunity to ask all those burning questions. I see some are coming through already in the uh, QA Martin and David channel in Discord. Uh, and you, also the opportunity, if you want to raise your hand in Zoom, you can ask a question live. Uh, and also add, ask something in the chat, in the Zoom chat, we'll try and catch that as well. Yeah. So, okay, while we um, <clears throat> are waiting for a few more questions to accumulate, um, I wanted to just introduce a little bit of the format of the panel again. Um, so we are going to uh, make questions that are maybe somewhat unrelated, sometimes overlapping, depending. That's the fun of the panel with uh, two speakers, where the talks are not necessarily strictly connected. But uh, uh, we thought it's going to be like uh, making it a little bit more fun to uh, juggle between the two and have a little bit of uh, uh, like a different perspectives. Maybe the two, the two uh, panelists uh, or the, the speakers can also reply to each other if they feel so. Um, but before we go into that, I want to make sure that we have uh, uh, Martin ready to receive questions. Martin, are you there? See if he can unmute himself and Can you try again? We can see you, Martin, but we can't really hear you. Still, let's see if we can. And David? Uh, so David is unmuted. See if we can hear him. We don't hear at the moment. We have a couple of minutes, so don't don't be worried about the time. And this is this time is exactly to uh, coordinate the panel. But let's uh, let's see if we can get over all the technical problems. So I can see Martin online. Uh, yes, Martin and David are there. I wonder if we could unmute them ourselves as organizers. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm clicking on ask to unmute. 
I don't know if I can completely unmute them. Wouldn't be too nice, right? To just uh, open mm -hmm. up the microphone to somebody or their camera. <laughs> All right, yeah, I think microphone. after restart, you can hear me now, right? Yes, I can hear you, Martin. <laughs> what happened? Sorry about that. I don't know, just the typical problems we're always yeah. running into, right? Of course, of course. Well, no problem. Uh, but we are waiting for to hear from David as well. So, um, like, I'm not sure. So, uh, unfortunately, my gallery view here doesn't let me know if you have the camera on or not, Martin. Can you tell me? Okay. I do, yes. Okay, fantastic. So I'll change, let me change my view. Maybe I can see you. Yes, I can see you now. So, all right, fantastic. So uh, we wanted to start with an icebreaker question uh, for all our, all our panelists, which is the same as the last year. So since we have this opportunity to peek inside your either your working environment, maybe your home environment, or maybe both, we don't know. We wanted to see if there is anything interesting surrounding you that you can share. And you have a green screen, that's already something. What do you do with those green screens? Uh, I'm actually like, yeah, at a, at a client this week. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm just in this in this tiny box here right now, right? In this phone booth. <laughs> okay. So yeah. it's uh, like you're slowly cooking inside there? Is, is it like a decent temperature? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, I just got here in a minute ago. So yeah, it's still fine, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, but the audio outside just, is terrible, so yeah. And if you have anything else, which is on the green uh, the green screen, but I think in the small little booth, there's nothing really that you can share. Um, let me check with David uh, if David we can we can have him for the panel. David, are you there? I think David is restarting. I don't think he, I haven't seen him come back in yet. Okay, so in that case, we'll... Uh, oh, he's just we'll come back in. He's just popped back okay. in, but he's still unmuted. Oh, there we go. Should so, David, hear me. Yay! Yes. Oh, a classic uh, restart solves most uh, issues. <laughs> wow. Okay. Yeah, fantastic, David. Welcome to uh, the panel. John, Thanks. take it away. Uh, yes, I think this is, uh, yeah, it's a great panel. Uh, oh, we're actually even on time as well, so that's cool. Um, yeah, so a question for David, uh, same same one we have with Martin. What kind of things uh, are in your surroundings that uh, are interesting, you'd like to share, or quirky, or anything that you're comfortable sharing with? Well, I was uh, thinking about it and came up with uh, uh, that the, the I started practicing to drive get a driver's license the same the same uh, uh, actually the same month as i started to learn closure which was uh, not uh, not yet but almost two years ago so and i'm 47 so uh, my message is it's not too late to learn things both like practical practical and theoretical things which do you think is easier learning to drive or learning closure learning closure was actually actually easier, even though at the beginning it was really difficult. But you know, switching gears and keeping con track of all all people in the streets is, is so much more difficult. <laughs> it's a very complex system. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so going back to Martin for the first question, and um, I have the first question. I wanted just to ask the the other organizers in if they see a raised hand, maybe to. Give me a ping because I'm not sure I can see it. So um, this is the first question for Martin. Uh, do Clerk and Next Journal share a common experience in that code from Clerk can be used in Next Journal, or are they meant to solve different challenges? So yeah, to us, kind of Clerk is is kind of a, a restart to try some of the same ideas we had in Next Journal, kind of in a in a simpler form. Um, so as it stands, they they don't share code, but we're planning to reintegrate um, yeah, a lot of the clerk viewers and kind of use that, them as a new foundation for next journal features. And I guess also down the road kind of integrate, yeah, make it easier to, to share notebooks on clerk notebooks on next journal. And um, yeah, so an integration, better integration is something that we'll work on in the future. And this is like a side question. 
I know that you collected the notebooks from the talk uh, and many others in a, in a project that you wanted to share. Is, is this a good time to do that? Uh, sure. I'll just, uh, yeah, I'll put in a link, I guess, um, into the Discord. And which channel should I put it in? Uh, you can put it in your, your talk, channel. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's something. Yeah. This contains all the notebooks from my talk. Um, and yeah, there's a, the GitHub repo, so folks can play with this, um, clone it, and yeah, start playing with Clerk. Fantastic, thank you. And uh, first question for David. Um, so we're curious about what kind of impacts are on your workflow that Storyboard uh, Storybook has had. Uh, we know that David Nolan said like dev cards and Storyboard uh, were a very important change to UI development uh, for React. So I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Well, the impact for me has been, uh, I think, um, uh, the mostly a quicker, faster feedback loop. Uh, some somewhat similar similar to to the to the REPL experience, and also uh, 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 easier to like from from early on start thinking about the viewports or different devices. So so I can quickly see how a component behaves in a in a mobile device or or an on desktop uh, just by using using the uh, the storybook UI. So for me that has been uh, uh, really good. Good. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we do have uh, somebody with a hand up. Do we want to take that question next, Renzo? Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we, we maybe ask Andrew to unmute himself and uh, ask the question. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Renzo. Um, this is a question for David. David, I mostly do closure, not closure scripts. Occasionally, I do closure script. Um, the setup to storyboard. Obviously, the results were wonderful, but the setup for someone from my background looks a little tricky. I wondered if there were any uh, automated tools or documentation or any way you'd recommend of getting into that. Uh, well, I haven't seen any automation yet for, for closure script, um, uh, but my, my myself, that's why I made an example re uh, repository that is on my GitHub yes. to, to to help to help uh, like closure script developers. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, eventually, you will probably end up in some JavaScript issues. Uh, at least if you use different JavaScript libraries that uh, relies on like build systems and things like that. So with the from closure script to JavaScript, there there isn't that much uh, issues that I have noticed, but when I like added, uh, uh, I think it was uh, Ray, sorry, Material UI, uh, or was it? No, sorry, um, uh, it was AWS Amplify that also relied on Webpack, but but a different version uh, than than Storybook used. So that's when I ran into some issues, but the, and and solved them by modifying the Storybook uh, uh, configuration. But that's that's something. I guess uh, that is uh, that need to be uh, that requires a some googling and uh, stack overflowing. I guess. I see. Sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for your question, and thank you, David, for answering. Um, another one for uh, Martin now uh, from Discord. We have Sam asking if you can apply a custom viewer just locally to some particular data, rather than applying them globally. Yes, that's that's possible. Like we have kind of um, two functions for this, kind of a with viewer and with viewers function that yeah just applies to the following form. And the difference being like one is um, for just um, a viewer for a particular result, um, and kind of also like the clerk table stuff and clerk Vega Lite that also just applies to the to the single form right. Um, and um, with with viewers, you could also like for a, re a tree structure, kind of modify the viewers further down the tree, not just the top level. So yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. Nice. And question for David. I think this is a very um, specific question. Uh, so in Storyboard, can we actually get the closure script source code to appear when clicking on source. I, I 
thing is that for the on click thing that you showed or is that something else uh, could it be the uh, show uh, there's a button called show source yes. in the documentation yeah uh, i haven't managed yet managed but to, to uh, do that but i i think it should be possible i guess grabbing some doc, docs or metadata from closures it, itself right. and uh, stringify it uh, and put it in uh, in that custom uh, per, uh, uh, sorry, default export uh, map. I guess it should work, but I, I haven't really tried that, that, that one out yet. Okay, something for the weekend to experiment with. Thank you very much. Definitely. <laughs> and here's another one for Martin from Discord Fahrenheit. Uh, can you hide the utility functions in Clerk? Uh, yes, this is a feature that's currently possible in the latest main, not yet on Clojars. We'll, yeah, we'll come there next week. And yeah, you have the ability to, like for each code cell, to completely hide it, uh, to fold it, so viewers can still expand it um, and do this on a kind of per document for the whole, if you set it on the namespace form or per form, per individual form, as well as hiding the result if you choose to. Perfect. Nice. So another question for David. Um, this on Discord, Silifin is asking, how do you approach using global state uh, stores with Storybook? Is that something you've used yourself? Ooh, uh, unfortunately, not. A global state would that be state in, in the browser, like in the window object or something? Uh, that's a good question. So, I mean, when I thought global state, yeah, then I obviously thought of atoms and things like that in oh. Clojure. But um, yeah, there's also like the the browser state, the cache. Maybe the um, the person will expand on that in the comments, and uh, you can kind of catch up on that later on in the yeah. channel. It isn't something that I have actually can think of that I have actually done, but it, uh, I think it should be possible. It's just uh, JavaScript and browsers, yeah. you can do anything with it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, um, next, a double question for Martin from Alex on Discord. The first one, are there plans to enable code editing within the notebook, not just in Emacs? And the second, how does Clerk compare to other Clojure Notebooks possibilities, VS Code Notebook or the API uh, with the Clojure Jupyter library? Um, so, yeah, first the code editing within the notebook, yeah, Clerk, Clerk's kind of main idea is to, yeah, to keep using your editor, right? We we consider that to be a big perk. And I mean, we've spent yeah quite a bit of time also making a good closure editing experience within the browser um, with Next Journal closure mode. And that's what you what you have on our platform, nextjournal.com. And um, yeah. Currently, no plans to kind of yeah bring bring in browser editing to Clerk. Um, there are some ideas definitely about around um, bringing direct manipulation for some things to Clerk. Um, like yeah, some things are just faster with direct manipulation. Um, like when you have sliders to control values and then kind of write them back to the closure source code. Um, but that's kind of more the direction we're exploring. And yeah, if you want to edit. The stuff in the browser, then yeah, next journal is the place I'd I point you at. And, and the second, the second question, question was yeah. uh, uh, how a clerk compares to other closure no notebook possibilities. There are a couple of examples here, but in general, also, like a VS yeah, code I must say or... I, I haven't used the VS Code notebook stuff, um, so can't really tell. Um, as to Clojure, Jupyter, um, yeah, so. Clerk is trying to be a kind of more minimal integration, right? Just as a as a closure library, so that comes with the yeah pros and cons that that follow from this. So yeah, it's it's not a polyglot system, right? Like like Jupyter, and um, yeah, I think Clerk will definitely stay this way. Um, yeah, but we we're also like working on other stuff that's that's more polyglot. Yeah. Thank you, Martin. 
And more questions for David. That's starting to come through a bit faster now. So um, one of the questions is, how does Storybook compare to other solutions uh, in that space? Obviously, there's quite a few options like dev cards, but there's also other libraries. Uh, I'm curious if it's if it's kind of, it seems to be more just React focused. So I'm not sure if ROM and RUM are kind of, oh, I'm not sure if like things in RUM, like RUM and uh, libraries like that really kind of fit in. And also like, um, is it useful for developing components like with, around CSS frameworks like Bulma or Bootstrap? Yeah, so the first question, how does, does it compare to other tools? I have um, dev cards, I haven't, I have on, only uh, uh, like read about and uh, saw a presentation and there's another tool, I think it's called Workspace for uh, developed for, for Clojure, Clojure script. Uh, I think it's very similar uh, and probably uh, as a feature, as many features as Storybook. Uh, what caught my attention is that I have a, like a, a background from JavaScript and was interested in if it could be, if, if it would be uh, possible and realistic to use a tool like Storybook in ClojureScript. So, so that was my motivation to dig, dig a little bit deeper in Storybook. And it's also like very actively developed and like has a lot of third-party uh, add-ons and things like that, which I think is very useful. And the second question, uh, like experimenting with CSS frameworks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I uh, haven't that, that much uh, experience other than developing component, components using CSS. Uh, uh, for Storybook, I have like uh, been very isolated in Material UI itself, and that is very code centric. So you can you do most of the things in code. Uh, you can uh, in ClojureScript you do like uh, maps uh, to define the CSS, and and that will be uh, recompiled each on each change. But there's also an option to add like global CSS to, to previews in Storybook. And I can I haven't really tried out what happens if we change that CSS, if Storybook will pick that up. I, I would be surprised if it if it doesn't, but um, I cannot uh, say uh, I haven't tried that what, that scenario out yet. Yeah, I'm quite keen to try, try it with um, CSS. I use Bulma quite a lot because it is just a pure um, CSS framework. There's no JavaScript in there, so it should be mm. pretty easy to do. I mean, you just attach classes to your, um, like your hiccup code. Uh, so that should be quite nice. Yeah, I think one of the things that seems different between Storybook and dev cards is, well, you don't really need to install anything with dev cards. So somebody mentioned it was quite challenging to get Storybook up and running. <laughs> um, so with dev cards, it, it's just part, it's just the website that's rendered from your closure code. So a uh, closure script code. So in that sense, it's it's far easier, but it doesn't have a lot of the features that Storybook has, which like um, resizing stuff, you'd have to kind of do that more manually yourself. There's some browser tools, I think, to do that uh, with dev cards. So you use the actual browser dev tools that gives you that feature. Uh, but yeah, I think that's probably the biggest kind of noticeable difference. But yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. And we have another uh, question for Martin um, uh, Discord. Uh, do you plan to expose Vega itself or is it going to stay VL for some time? I'm not sure about the meaning of VL, maybe if you know. Um, Vega Lite, I think it's Vega versus Vega Lite. And yeah, we're actually using um, Vega embed behind the scenes and that does support both. So, yeah, thinking about a uh, yeah naming change of the of our Vega Lite function to to make that more clear. Yeah, but it's possible Fantastic. today. And back to David. So there is a question here uh, asking. Um, um, why has Amplify been used? Is it different to DevCards? I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, Amplify, I assume that's the AWS Amplify yeah, library, is that yeah. right? Yeah. What does that bring us? Uh, well, it doesn't really have much to do with the storybook. It's uh, another JavaScript ecosystem tool that I was really eager to try out how well it works with the closure script. And it's, it's uh, I think the phrase popular phrase is called no ops uh, and that is that you can have a, like uh, uh, a browser and like a bunch of server backend cloud stuff without uh, 
managing your own your own infrastructure. It's uh, a CLI two way can uh, bootstrap uh, a lot of good things. So it's not really related to to Storybook, but I decided to inject it in my example repo ju just because. <laughs> so it's more part of the deployment side of things. Is that right? So do you, getting the site up and running somewhere. Yeah, if yeah, if you want like the persistent data storage or lambdas, and you can uh, you can define them quite easily in using uh, using uh, an, the Amplify CLI, and it will and AW that tool will uh, uh, create uh, everything you need uh, for it, like S3 buckets and things like that too. Excellent stuff. Yes, yeah, so I've, I've used Amplify briefly just to uh, publish some static sites. And it's, um, it's quite simple. You just pointed at something and off you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we don't have um, uh, other questions for Marty coming through. So inviting people that uh, still wanted to ask any questions to, there's still time to do that. But in, in the meanwhile, I can ask Martin if uh, he has anything else that he wanted to add that maybe he wasn't able to explain at the talk. Um, yeah, maybe it makes sense to speak a bit kind of to the future plans in Clerk. Um, of course. And yeah, so there's like three things I think um, I'm I'm looking forward to. It. So Clerk has this caching mechanism behind the scenes, right? Um, and this is how it makes it um, like keeps the feedback loop fast and doesn't have to rerun your whole document from top to bottom every time. And yeah, so exploring with kind of using that caching mechanism and distributing it within a team to make, yeah, like long running computations appear uh, a lot faster without everybody having to rerun it. Um, that's, that's one of the things we'd like to explore. Um, yeah, then we want to make sharing easier, um, like with a small service, which, yeah, like you've seen, you can do the static build stuff, right, and put it into a bucket yourself, but kind of have a small community page where people can can share their clerk notebooks and, yeah, make that really easy. And, and lastly, definitely exploring a lot of the stuff like the Smalltalk community has been doing with this yeah kind of moldable development idea like making it really easy to to customize a view to your specific problem at hand and yeah kind of going going further than this than kind of the what what i've shown in the talk um i think rule 30 the example kind of hints at this but yeah i think there's there's a lot more to explore in that direction nice multiple views it is um <laughs> yeah any other question for David? Uh, yes, we have one. It's uh, possibly a bit of an open-ended one. Um, so just wondering what kind of projects you've built or what kind of projects you'd like to build using Storybrook and, and uh, ClojureScript. Any ideas on that? Uh, what kind of projects? Uh, well, uh, the, the one that I've been working on mainly, it's, uh, fortunately, it's not uh, no, uh, anything open source, <laughs> but, but it is... Uh, uh, it is a um, quite component heavy tool uh, and, 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 uh, and it's a browser based app that it should work uh, both on the mobile and desktop and, and, and things like that. So I think for that case, uh, Storybook is uh, very useful because I can zoom in to, to like a button, how it works and zoom zoom out a bit and start building components and start to think about features and how to combine them like like, like Lego basically uh, and finally hopefully there's a full-blown uh, web app somewhere released <laughs> Excellent stuff. <laughs> and, and is there a kind of like any obvious kind of challenges that you found um, that you're not even sure how to start solving or did you do did you manage to do most of the things you wanted to do uh, there was uh, at first it was uh, some issues with the, the different JavaScript uh, like tooling uh, tooling support and like different uh, versions of uh, web mainly webpack that kind of uh, caused some uh, trouble for me and but then also uh, there were some features that were wasn't existing when I started with Storybook it existed in um, Shadow CLJS, but uh, 
thankfully Thomas Heller uh, uh, actually added some really, really useful features for, for, for this scenario specific, like that regex support for stories and, and a lot of good stuff. So I would recommend to, to use the latest version of, of Shadow CLJS if you, if you, if you use that C, uh, setup, uh, then everything will work uh, very smoothly from the closure script uh, side. Excellent. Yes, that sounds all um, wonderful. I've, yes, I want to leave the conference and try that right now, actually, but uh, I've got duties to do. Um, thank you very much. I think we have another question for, um, for Martin, actually. Yeah, um, Pavel uh, is asking if, uh, given that our keynote speaker today is uh, Stephen Wolfram, um, we feel justified in asking, is there anything interesting in the Mathematica uh, space that you find interesting, possibly inspiring for Clerk? Um, yeah, I think kind of the, the ease of use and like that Mathematica has, um, yeah, is definitely an, an inspiration. Like I've used it as a as a physics student um, a little bit. And yeah, I think it's it's really exciting that like, yeah, we can take sick immutals that, yeah, can do some of the stuff that Mathematica can do. Obviously, like, yeah, since it's not a 20-year a running effort or... Um, or Mathematica is even older, I think we're not quite there yet. Um, but um, no, it's definitely like, yeah, looking forward to, um, yeah, explore this a bit more and um, think it's quite exciting what's possible with this library today already. Nice. I do have a cheeky little question for uh, David. Uh, I'm just curious uh, to know if um, if the Swedish version of Poppy Longstocking is the, the longest person's name you've heard in Swedish. It it, it has to be. I, I haven't. Uh, I can't imagine anyone having a longer name. Perhaps you know. Do you know? Remember, remember the movie The Fifth Element? Oh yes. From yeah, you know um, Lilu. Yes. She, she had she had her real name was really really long. Oh, she yes. might have. A, <laughs> she might have uh, had a longer longer name than Pippi Longstocker, but I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd better th find that out. <laughs> that's something to Google, Swedish yeah. version of uh, Lilu's full name. Yes, yeah. excellent. Thank you. You may want to ask a similar question to Martin, but not in names, but the longest word in, word in Germany would be probably beating the longest word in Swedish. I'm not sure, but <laughs> it's a cheeky question again. <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. sure it does, but yeah. Also can't yeah uh, come can't pick a specific one from the long list of German long words. <laughs> I like the I like the German name for um, kitchen because um, it's like it's like cooking pot place or something like that, as it translates. Mm. Which very... I would normally say which yeah isn't that long so. Um. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's very um, it's very descriptive of the of the of the the actual thing. It's it's kind of conveying I think. I think that's what I got from the uh, the actual name, but yes. Um, I did speak a little bit of Dutch uh, many years ago, and it was, yeah, there's a tendency to just join like lots of words together to just form one big, big word. Uh, that was quite interesting to learn. Yeah, we definitely have that as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so we are approaching the... Um, like uh, the final, like the, the the last minute of the panel, um, so we are gonna have we are gonna have a, a quick, um, no sorry, not a quick break. We're gonna have a longer break, I think. Oh well, I'm I'm now. Yes, we're, uh, we've got a thirty minute break next. Yes, um, exactly. So it's it's just to, um, yeah, to decompress a little bit from the couple of talks and the awesome answers that we got from the panel. Um, thank you very much for like our speakers, both uh, Martin and David, to like put their effort and bring us some very interesting topics. And uh, yeah, we'll I guess we'll see you all in uh, thirty minutes and enjoy some visual art.
and welcome back everyone to the conference um i hope we had a nice break um if you watched the visual art or uh, maybe you went out for a walk or a quick uh, uh, a fresh breathe of air or you got a coffee maybe or uh, depending on your time zone of course uh, what time of the day is it is uh, there so um we are entering the second block uh, for the day uh, we are going to have another two talks um uh, specifically, we're going to have Alex Olu and Joanna Antonelli now, and that will take us to the second panel of the day and all the way up to 1.30 p.m. where we're going to have another uh, big break, big, big break in the sense 30 minutes break, bigger break. So let me uh, give you a quick, quick, quick introduction to uh, Alex. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you to uh, Alex Olu is it's been simply amazing. So he's one of the first speaker on the podcast. He uh, accepted also the challenge of a change of topic in his talk. And he's just a super nice person to talk with. So please join us after at the panel. Alex is an engineer uh, by trade and designer by necessity. As in one of his uh, time passion is to dig into some interesting nighttime passions is to dig into some interesting problems using closure. And this is the story of one of these projects, Firetomic. Take it away, Alex. Hey, folks. Um, thank you for coming to my talk. I'm super excited to be at Reclosure. I'm glad to be here with all of you, um, be it virtually though this year. And uh, I hope wherever you are watching from, you are well and safe. and. Uh, and happy. Um, today I'll be talking, talking to you about the labor of love by Atomic. It's taken the last two or so years of my life and I'm super excited to share it with you. So maybe quickly about me. Um, my name is Alex Balu. I work as head of design at Absa Bank, I'm a bank headquartered in South Africa with operations across all of, um, a number of countries in Africa. Great place to work. There I look after a team of about 160 people. Um, design, UX UI designers, process engineers, service designers, an ops team. Um, great bunch of people. I really enjoy working with them, challenge me every day. Um, but doesn't really have anything to do with why we're here today. Turns out after that job, when I get home and the full moon's out, the devel developer in me returns. And that developer really enjoys closure. And uh, um, yeah, you could call me a way developer. Um, and this is kind of how my, my closure journey started, started, you know, one job in there at the time it was lecturing and then writing code in, in the evening. But if we go back to how we got to this point, you know, I must say thought of the JavaScript, you know, and, uh, Jeff, Jeff, uh, Atwood's, uh, code always, uh, <laughs> makes me chuckle. You know, any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. And that's too true, you know. I, I saw it to my own eyes. You know, in my JavaScript obs obsessed days, I I stumbled across OSJS, which is a Unix type browser um, OS that runs in the browser, written in purely in JavaScript. Um, on OSJS, you can play Wolfenstein, um, also written in JavaScript. And at the time, you know, there was a single um, computer board called the Tesla which, you know, similar to your Raspberry Pi type boards, but was entirely written in, or you write, you, you interface it through JavaScript, which is also cool. I think, unfortunately, it's been discontinued. Um, but that was pretty neat. And maybe a more uh, familiar one to the folks, folks watching, um, an NBB, basically closure slash Babashka, that runs in, in JavaScript. You know, so JavaScript really did, did take over the world for being honest, right? Uh, and at least for me, it was, I lived and breathed it, all the things in my stack, the front end, the back end, and my build tools, all, all JavaScript. The one part that was not JavaScript and was quite awful, to be honest, was actually interfacing the database. It was always a mission and you always had to find this library and it didn't work and this edge case and this bug. I just didn't like it. Um, I was liberated one day though by Sales.js, a really cool framework. Um, 
and I've created a nice wrapper that allows you to interact with the various databases in a idiomatic JavaScript fashion. And for a long time, I actually used that. Um, but when it took away my pain of working with databases, the general pain of working in, in, in JavaScript remained. And that really is the fragility. And maybe it's just the way I write code. Um, I mean, my front-end code is fine. That that I've been doing, and I really don't write, enjoy writing JavaScript with front-end. But the node piece always felt flaky. It always felt like if you just looked at it the wrong way, your backend would come cr crashing down. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I probably ended up in Clojure. But on the way to Clojure, I discovered a new database that really reduced the complexity and meant I didn't have to use a framework, you know, to interact with my backend. And that was Firebase and Pass. And uh, they're both great startups at the time, going head to head, split the community, which one was best. Um, and I remember in my mind almost seeing this vision, you know, two, part, two roads diverged in the wood. And I, I took the one that's traveled by. And that has made all the difference. Um, I mean, not given that we're talking about Atomic, I mean, I'm sure you can guess it was Firebase that I chose. Um, and, you know, at the time, you know, it was, I had my own preference, but it was luck as well. Because Google bought Firebase and really took them to the next level without them losing their spirit. Um, whereas Pause was bought by Facebook and taken out back. Um, and so, so I really enjoyed this time, you know, when I just discovered Firebase and life was easier and I could remove sales and make my my um, code much simpler without the framework. Um, but it was still JavaScript, you know. On more than one occasion, I overwrote the entire root of my my um, Firebase DB because, you know, Firebase is basically a JSON structure. And if you write to the root, you can overwrite everything and you lose all your data. It happened a number of times. And it reminded me that I was still living in the land of, of JavaScript. But soon after I discovered Clojure, and it was glorious. You know, it just felt robust, felt solid, no flakiness at all. Um, and, you know, the immutability at first really um, confused me, like, how do I program that where all the data is unchanging? Um, but eventually I, the penny dropped, um, and when the penny dropped, then Datomic just seemed like the obvious choice. You know, uh, I watched all the articles, read the blogs and the podcasts and looked at the tutorials and um, I was obsessed. And eventually, you know, I was like, you know what? Let me try out this uh, Datomic thing. And then I saw the price. As low as one dollar a day. Look, look. Before I got involved in the tech startup scene, um, I was a marketing intern for a babysitting company. And I can tell you, as low as is marketing speak for, you will never pay this price. It will always be higher. So I was like, nope. And you know what was really the final blow was I saw it run in AWS. And look, folks, I'm not the smartest guy, but I do know, know, know my way around numbers. You know, and that AWS pricing calculator, I mean, Surely you need a PhD to use that thing. I was like, this is a surefire way to rack up a bill and just get hits with hundreds of dollars at the end of the month. I was like, nope, not on my watch. And so I said, play well to the Atomic and carried on using Clojure. It was robust, it was stable. And I mean, I mean, let's be fair. Clojure's libraries for interacting with the various databases, you know, Postgres, um, Mongo, um, Redis, actually pretty, pretty decent. So, you know, at least there was the stability of Clojure, you know, all the way through. Um, but then something inter interesting happened. It was about, you know, two years ago, and just before COVID. Um, I went to Clojure D, gave a talk there about my journey, about being becoming a Clojure developer. And it was amazing, you know, to be in a conference in person um, in Berlin for the first time, speaking to people passionate about closure, and you know, it just fired me up. I was ready to get stuck in, you know. And then COVID came, and the lockdowns came, 
and you know what it was glorious so i'm heavily introverted so being fired up from closure from closure d the lockdown and people not, legally not being allowed to visit me i mean great i could just write code day in day out and obviously i mean still went to well still worked you know um, and spent some time with my wife but really all the extra time apart from those things went into to writing uh writing which are good and that's where you know this journey started um you know the idea of 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 being able to have a free and open source the atomic never never left me you know it was still something that was in my mind and um when i came across data script it really felt like you know this was the thing you know i could find a way to make this like data you know there are no bad ideas if you have the guts and the time you can do it and so when i was reading through the documentation i found this listen function and basically it um was fired every time a transaction hits data script and you could do something with this transaction um and I figured transactions come in, I serialize them, store them, and I want to re rebuild, rebuild my, my state. I just read from them in reverse chronological, in chronological order. And, um, and there we go. To the back. Sounds like, I mean, it's pretty much datomic. You know? I mean, as time goes, the initialization time probably just goes through the roof, but, you know. Very simple solution to enter another machine, right? Um, and so I figured, you know, this kind of sequential stream of data sounded exactly like a job for Kafka. Now, here's the thing, folks. You know, the Atomic looked like it could be expensive and AWS might be expensive, but for sure, Kafka was expensive. So I thought what any reasonable developer would do any logical thing the only logical thing i rebuilt kafka on firebase so i built firestream basically a um a library that's modeled after the kafka wrapper uh, pyre um, in enclosure basically same kind of interface same kind of uh, paradigm except it ran on firebase and serialized stuff on firebase I figured, there we go. So I hooked it up to the data script and transaction come in. I'll send it up, send them out, send them up, send them up. And then when I want to rebuild my state, I would just initialize and it would read them back. And there we go. I'd find a way to persistently store my data script DB. <laughs> Great. You know, but I want to stress this, stress this thing, you know. Don't want to go out there and tell people, try this thing out and then it just... Uh, comes crashing down. So you no know, do what anyone would do. Build, you know, uh, a map, you know, stored about you know one hundred megs of data and run it ten times, send it to the to Firebase and uh, see how it performed, right? It wasn't too bad to be honest. Um I did keep on seeing like a a, a bottleneck, you know, at, at around I think it was two megabytes a second. Yes. I need to get some more power out of that. So I kept on trying many alternatives, you know, do short bursts of writes, long writes. Um, but I was easy, easily writing gigs, you know, just going and going and going and going. Um, and then my laptop got really, really hot. Turns out, continuously writing gigs of data, um, you know, with your transaction, transaction listener, probably isn't the best thing from a performance perspective. My laptop was hot, hit my wallet really hard. Turns out the freeness of Firebase is free within reason. Um, so that really hurt my wallet, um, probably more so than the Atomic ever would. Um, but it was a lesson I learned, so you don't have to. Um, then it got me thinking, you know what, there's no need for me to, you know, start from the bottom. I should really stand on the shoulders of giants. And that's what I did. You know, I stumbled across Data Hike, um, you know, built by the folks at Lambda Forge. Um, and Data Hike basically is is the data log database. It starts with data with data script as well, um, and it's really it's really underpinned by the Hitchhiker tree, right? Um, the Hitchhiker tree is um, 
an exotic data structure, as is the obstacle of it. Um, and, and it's basically what I was looking for, right? Basically an open source free, free version of, of Datomic. Um, and so the journey began. You know, clone the repo and start going to the source code. Um, because I mean, I quickly learned that social community. If you want to know something about a database or about a library, just read the code. It's definitely more to the point than the documentation, if there is documentation. Anyway, in that, two things stood out Bootstrap, because I mean, any front end dev surely knows the name Bootstrap. Um, but that wasn't relevant at this point. And then I saw this file store thing. I was like, interesting. So if this thing can store to a file, surely it can store to, to, to file, right? And so I looked at this conserve namespace. And that took me to another repository by the same folks. Um, and basically it was a key value store that could run on any kind of backend. Um, and I went to the readme line by line, like we all do. Um, and I found this single line right? That it could connect to CouchDB. Now, in my childhood days, I traveled a lot of databases, right? And I e immediately remembered CouchDB was JSON store, similar vibe to Firebase. I'm sure we could use that to get to get on to Firebase. And so, luckily, I'd already written a, a library that connected send data to Firebase, you know, for Firestream. And uh, I figured, let's try it out. And so I built a I built a, a library that really is a conserved library that writes this key value store or creates a key value store out of Firebase. Um, and uh, the cool thing is in, in doing so, I could now connect data hike to Firebase. You know, the only thing that was bugging me was, you know, Firebase has this limit that the value has to be at least 10, at most 10 megs. So I quickly found a way to split the, to split the data if it came more and you see the P0, there'll be P1, P2, and so forth. And so there we were, good to go. Um, we'll conserve, ready, I uh, could connect to data hike, and data would flow in theory from data hike into conserve, into my Firebase adapter for conserve, and into Firebase. It was the perfect plan. And you know what? It worked out. So let's have a quick look see. Like Jamie Oliver has prepared something. So I can show you what this looks like. Uh, so let's just spin up a REPL. Over here on the browser, you can see that's the Firebase suit on database. Um, at the moment, you can see there's nothing in, in this point. Um, but let's first, first as first, as per usual, we include. Uh, See data hike, and then we include um, data hike Firebase, and now those are included. And then, um, now, so let me talk you through the config quickly. So basically, um, all data hike configs are similar, right? So you specify the store, which is this piece here, and the store has different properties. Um, so the back end here is Firebase, and then these properties here are basically the ones that come from the Firebase um, implementation, right? So the end key basically tells um, data Firebase which environment variable to go look, which environment variable contains the um, service account credentials. This allows you to read and write into, into Firebase. So in this case, it's called Fire, and we'll be writing to, to um, Firebase with the root data high reclosure, right? As you can see, that's where we are here. Awesome, right? So that's the config. Now, if we try and connect to that config, what will we get? We should get um, an exception because as you can see, the database doesn't exist, it's now. But now we can create the database and bada bing, bada boom, bada ba. There we go. You can see the data has been stored. It's been stored in that same format from conserve because remember underneath data hike, conserve is doing the the, the writing into the store. In this case, the store is Firebase, but you could actually have a conserved store that that writes to Postgres, which I also worked on. There's one that writes to Redis. Um, 
and so forth. I think that's the really cool thing about Contour because it basically means you could build a data hype or datomic like um, database on any kind of of um, acid um, database, which is really neat, right? Um, okay, back to our our back to our repo. Right, so we've created our, our database. Now we can connect, right? And let's keep our connection. And then as is the custom, once you've once you've created, you know, a data data log DB, the first thing is to add your add your schema. Now that's usually your first transaction. And uh, we write it there. So name and age are basically the two identities um or the new or the properties that you have in there. Um, oh, and see that yellow here means that it's updated. I mean, you'll notice there's almost still no, no data, so nothing more is up. There's very little data, so you'll see that, you know, basically we'll just see this for the most part. I mean, this is just a super long string because Firebase currently doesn't support um, binary data. So this is a base 64 representation of our closure structure. Anyway, now we want to transact. We're going to add Alice, Bob, Charlie, and some unknown human who is 15 years old. We pop those elements in there and see what number of datums have been created. Again, we saw the update over here. And now um, we can create that data, right? Let's see. State log, right? And so there we go. You know, we're looking for entities. Um, the same entity, we're looking for the name and the age. And showing them, so you'll notice the nameless 15 year old is not shown because um, the constraint of having a name is not met, so that one is left out. So we only see Bob, Charlie, and Alice. But let's say we wanted all the entities and their ages, we could run another query. And there we go, right? So that's really, that's really, you know, simple as that. I mean, it looks like, feels like, smells like Datomic. Um, no drama there at all. And um, as well, you can, you can delete the database. So if we delete the database, let me see, and bloop, disappears from Firebase. And now what happens if we try and connect? Let us see. If we connect, wah, 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 doesn't exist, right? So you can see it really is uh, simple to use, very, very um, straightforward. And I mean, with, with Firebase, um, just a dream. So um, we now have Pytonic, right? Um, the thing I really enjoy about this is that it makes prototyping really easy because it means you can prototype um, many different businesses on the same same Firebase instance, you know, just separate databases or even just separate routes. Um, so that I can actually now use Datomic a lot more, not Datomic, Pytonic a lot more often. Um, I don't really have to think about the cost, at least not yet. Maybe someday if I build a business that's as a terabyte of data, Pythonic won't suffice, but that's a problem for another day. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. Okay, so, you know, I showed, I, I took you through that. Um, and so this is, you know, basically where we are, you know, so I had the idea of with Kafka and Firebase, I have the Atomic and Firebase. Um, and some friends are actually building a startup around 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 this and using both of these in production. Um, so far, so so good. Collected payments, got data in there, got paying customers. It's really great. Um, which is also really cool because you know when you do open source stuff, sometimes you think this idea is not something you'd bet your money on. In this case, you know I bet my money on it and it's working out. Um, so that's that's really really fulfilling. You know the the last two years haven't been a waste. Um. So you may ask, okay, what's next? Well, uh, the folks at, uh, you know, Lambda Forge are working on Data Hack Server. Um, so at the moment, you know, Data Hack Atomic sit within my application. So Data Hack Server, you can actually have an external server similar, similar to Postgres or, or um, you know, Mongo or whatever. Um, separate running is on a server on its own um, as an instance. And then you, your application actually connects to that. So, um, so, you know, that's really what, that will be the true fire atomic, right? So um, over the next while, maybe not right now, um, so finishing some work on another project I'm working on. And once that's done, so maybe February next year, I'm going to really look on Data server and how I can connect that to Firebase. So 
because once we have that, you know, we can really have a deploy to digital ocean and there you have atomic running and you can connect um, all the applications there, no drama. So, so that's been my, my journey with Phytomic. Um, it's been one hell of a ride. I think, you know, in having this really audacious idea to to build, um, you know, Kafka on Firebase and the Atomic on Firebase. You know, I've learned a lot about, about, about closure, to be honest, and reliability and writing tests. And I think if it weren't for these things, I probably would be a much worse um, developer than I am. Um, so if you have any crazy ideas, folks, you know what, let out the crazy and and try them out. You'll learn a lot in the journey. I'd get burnt a few times, but you know, that's life. Um, so yeah, so I mean, here's some 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 links that I think might be useful. You know, the data hack repo. Hit up the folks uh, on on Discord. Very cool bunch of folks. Um, very welcoming, very supportive. Really helped me on my journey. Um, you can check out Conserve as well if you want to see a bit more about what happens closer to the actual store. Um, and then some really cool videos. Um, one of them about today's vlog in general by PTLS. That's a really great video. I've watched a number of times. That really helped me understand um, data log databases. And then um, the video on Hitchhiker Trees. That one is, I mean, it's kind of about my pay grade and really not like a computer science type, but uh, amazing video and really explains it well. Um, and Hitchhiker Trees are just phenomenal. So give that a watch. And then um, also stop by the Lambda Forge website. Folks, they're doing really cool things in terms of data databases and making it freely available to the community and improving it. I mean, they even got um, they got closures together funding, I think last year. So definitely a great bunch of folks that's, that are really driving the community forward. So I'll give them a visit. And, you know, if you see something interesting, you know, create a pull request, contribute. You know, the, the thing I really love about the, the closure community is that you know, everyone pulls their weight. Um, so, you know, looking at you to pull your weight too. Um, and if there's anything you take away from, from this talk, it's this. Any application that can be written on Firebase will eventually be written on Firebase. So, why resist? Start now. Uh, that's all from me. Um, thank you, Reclosure, for having me. It's been great. Um, and... Uh, I'll catch you online. Cheers, folks. Thanks very much, Alex, for your talk. Um, that was really interesting. So um, while we prepare for our next speaker at 12.30, um, Johanna, um, we are going to have a quick break. Um, and we're going to be back soon. Enjoy some visual art. Thank you. 
Oh wow, that was really relaxing five minutes at least here, like in full screen, nice visual art, classical music in the background. Was really enjoying that. Well, hope you're enjoying it too. So, um, I'm sorry for the post there. So um, uh, we are going now to hear about an interesting project that our friends at Juxt have been developing. For full, di full disclosure, I'm a Juxt myself, and so he's Johanna, our next speaker. Johanna is a software engineer who has also been involved in training and mentoring, for example, creating the XTDB Space Adventure tutorial series that you might have seen. But without further ado, here is Johanna. Hello Reclosure, my name is Joanna Antonelli. I'm here to talk to you about schema-driven development with GraphQL and Site. Thank you for having me. In this talk, I will give a brief overview on what GraphQL is for those that aren't familiar. I'll introduce you to Site, and then together we can build a Pets app on top of Site using only three things, a GraphQL schema, a configuration file, and GraphQL's graphical interface, GraphIQL. Let's start with GraphQL. What is it? GraphQL is a query language for clients to interact with a server. A common misconception is that GraphQL is a database query language. Despite its name, it's not. As well as the client-side element, GraphQL is used to handle query fulfillment on the server. Initially developed internally to Facebook for two years, GraphQL was open sourced in 2015 and has grown with the help of the community. It has a healthy number of tools, including GraphIQL, the browser IDE to GraphQL, Gatsby, an open source framework that uses React, Azure, a GraphQL engine using Postgres. And for Clojure, we have libraries like Lacinia for the server handling and Regraph, which I've used a lot in reframe projects. At Jerks, we're developing Site and Grab, which I'll go into more detail on in just a moment. Finally, there are a significant amount of companies using GraphQL, notably GitHub, whose GraphQL is publicly exposed, Twitter, PayPal, and of course, Facebook. Now, let me give you a brief introduction to Site. Site is a resource server built by Juxt on top of XTDB. XTDB gives Site the benefit of an immutable bitemporal content store. Site supports both GraphQL and OpenAPI, it works by simply putting resources, including your schema, into Site, and it serves the appropriate web pages. Let me show you a short video that I've pre recorded of Site doing just that. I want to put a picture of my dog Cooper into Site, and then I want to go and view it in the browser. First, I need to get a token so that I have permission to do so. Then I use Site's put asset to put Cooper into site. We head on over to the browser where before that image was not found, refresh the page and there's Cooper. Say hello Cooper. So for the GraphQL, site uses Grab. It's a small Juxt library implementing the full GraphQL specification. Lastly, there is no backend code required to write simple CRUD apps in Sight. Now we know a little bit about GraphQL and Site. Let's see just how quickly we can put together a Pets app for us Juxters built on top of Site. First, I will quickly show you the configuration file needed for Site. Then I'll give a brief introduction to Site at the REPL. And finally, we will write a Pets schema that we can put into Site and then use GraphIQL to perform queries. This is an Eden file that we're going to put into Site along with our schema. We need this so that Site knows how to handle the upsert of the schema and what to do when we're posting GraphQL queries. 
it gets stored in site and dynamically loaded every time it's required. Let's head over to the terminal and put this resource into site. Before we do, I need to get an access token. I can do this using the site command get token. I have the password stored for the admin user in pass, the password manager. Now I can use post resources to post my GraphQL Eden file into site. As I showed you earlier, we can put assets into site. Let me show you how it looks to put a picture of Buffy into site. We use put asset with the file name and we tell site it is a image JPEG type. And then we provide the path at which we want site to serve the asset. We're also marking this as internal. Now we can head on over to the browser and visit that path. And we get a wonderful picture of Buffy. Let me now take you over to the site REPL. I've actually got site running locally. Usually I would develop against prod site, but I'm a little bit worried that I might share some internal juxt secrets with you all. I've seeded it with a small amount of data, so we've got something to play with for our pets app. I can use put to put a document into site. And remember, site uses XTDB. So here's a valid XTDB document. It has an XTID and some more information about the pet. This one here is Buffy. If we evaluate that, we see we get a XT response. We can take the XD ID for Buffy and ask site to show us the entity with E. That will just return the document of Buffy the cockapoo. In site, we can also run XT queries. Here, I have a query to return all the pets that satisfy the juxt site type pet and the juxt home juxt code Alex. If we evaluate it, we get Buffy back again. So site has got a concept of document type. We'll see later when we write our schema that this is linked to the type in the schema. Earlier, we added a type to the pet. I also know that we have the type person in site, which is used for our HR app. Now, if I run ls type on person, that will return all of the IDs for the documents containing the type person. Now, if I take a look at just one of those entities, we can see the shape of the person data. We're going to use this in our pets app because we'd like to display a small amount of data on our pets owners. Let's just stop and think about this for a moment because it really is a killer feature of site. We can build several different apps on top of the site server, but there is a single source of data. In this case, we already have people stored in site and instead of adding or duplicating a lot of those entries when we come to add owners, we can just reuse them. That means that there is a single point of update so our data doesn't get out of sync. Likewise, if another app wanted to use our pets data, it could. Now that we've done our housekeeping, all that's left to do is write a GraphQL schema. The schema is really going to be the core of our pets app. From here, we're going to be able to shape the way the data is viewed and dictate the actions that are made within the app. I've outlined the elements that our schema is going to need already. So let's start by defining our schema. We're going to have both queries and mutations. Now we can define our types. First, we'll define a type pet. On that, We'll need an ID. This will be used as the XT ID, and we'll give this a type of ID. ID is one of the few scalar types that GraphQL comes with out of the box. The others are integers, floats, strings, and booleans. Using an ID signifies that it's not intended to be human readable, and it should also be unique. Next, for our pet, we would like a name, a breed, and a species. These can all be strings. We can also have a list of strings for our likes and dislikes. And we need a string for our image URL. 
Finally, we need to say who the pet belongs to. That's going to be a string too. But if you remember from our pets data we added to site, this is a namespaced key. GraphQL doesn't have a concept of namespaced keys, but that's not a problem because we can tell site what key the data is under by using a directive. In this case, we use the attribute directive and we give it the namespaced key as a string. Now let's define our owner. Our owner has a type ID, a code with a directive and a name. We also want to see what pets belong to an owner. The data we have for owners doesn't know anything about their pets, but that's not a problem because we can provide site with a query directive. That query will find all pets where the juxt code matches the juxt code on this object. The object in this case is the owner entity. Next, let's define an input. It's going to be useful to be able to have some search terms when we're querying our pets. Our search term input can simply have a key and a value. We're now ready to start defining some queries. It's going to be useful to see all pets. For this first query, I can simply return a list of pets. As I said earlier, site knows about types and because the pets have a juxt site type value of pets and we're returning the type pets, without a directive, site will default to get all of the documents with that pets type. We've also provided an argument to this query so that we can use our search term input. Now we can add a query for a single pet. If we give it an ID as an argument, site will match that ID to the XT ID and return the entity. Next, we want to return all the owners. And finally, for our queries, let's add a count. We can use an aggregate directive to count the type pet. This returns an integer. And with that, we have enough of our schema to put into site. Let's go and take a look at how it's shaping up. To put the schema into site, I can use the put GraphQL command with the file and the destination path as arguments. Now, if I head over to that URL, we can see our GraphQL file. We can also use Graph IQL to start looking at our pets. Let's take a look at all pets. There you go. We can see all of our pets here in the results. Let's see what happens if we add some search terms. We can search for the breed Collie, and that returns all the breeds that contain the word Collie. We can also control the number of fields that we return, so we only get the values that we're interested in. Now let's take a look at all owners. Oh no, that's not returning anything. Not to worry, let's go and fix that in a minute. Now let's take a look at our single pet. We can give it the ID and return just the name. That works great too. And for our pet count, we can see that we've got nine pets. We can also add some search terms to our count. We can see that we have six dogs. Let's go and fix our owners query. For the owners, site is looking for a type owner to return. But because we're using the people data, we don't have the type owner in site. All we need to do to fix this is add a query directive onto all owners so that we can find them. I'm confident that will work. So let's re-put our schema into site and we can run exactly the same query again without refreshing. And this time we can see all of the owners and their pets. We can limit to just the name and that looks brilliant. But I think we can make this look even better. We already returned the owner code as part of the pet response, but what's stopping us from returning the whole owner object? Nothing, that's what. Let's modify the pet type and add a field for owners. Again, the pet's entity doesn't know any more about the owner than their juxt code, but we can add a query site directive to look them up. This query returns the owner where the type is person and the juxt code matches the juxt code on the object. 
This time, the object is the pet. Let's post our schema again and take a look. Refreshing the browser, we can run our all pets query again with a name and a species on the pet. And let's return the name of the owner. And that works. We can see that this cat belongs to Malcolm. We can also go one step further and we can return the name and species of the pets belonging to the owner of the pet. So we can see that the owner of Kaya, Malcolm, actually has two cats, Kaya and Aria. I think that's pretty cool. Now the final thing we need to do to complete our pets app is add some mutations. With our mutations, we would like to be able to add, update, and delete pets. For our add pet, we'll return the type pet, and we need an ID. For the ID, we can give site a directive to generate the ID if it's not provided. We also need an image, a name, breed, species, likes, dislikes, and an owner code. On the owner code, we can give another directive to tell site to store it under the key juxt home juxcode. For our update pet mutation, it looks much the same as our add pet, except this time our ID is a required field. We also have a directive telling site that the mutation is an update. And finally, our delete pet has a required ID and a directive to tell site that this mutation is a delete. Let's put that into site and head on back to the browser. Now let's use our mutations to add Cooper into site. We filled in all of the fields apart from image, just so that we've got something to update. I can choose to return some fields so I can return his name and we'll return the ID so we can use that for the update. That looks like it's worked. So now let's test our update. We can update with the ID that site generated for us and add the URL to the image. We want to just make sure that it is updating and not overwriting. So let's return a few of these fields that we filled in before. Excellent. Let's go over to our pets count and just make sure that we have the right number of pets now. There we are, we've got 10 pets. We can look up Cooper by his ID and double check that I'm still his owner. I am, so that's good. Now let's test out our delete. I don't really want to delete any pets that are already in there. So let's imagine we've accidentally added Cooper twice. So we can just run this mutation again. Because we haven't provided an ID, and site doesn't have the directive on add pet that this is an update we now have a duplicated entity of cooper so when i run my pet count query again we can see we've got 11 pets so let's search for the id we want to remove we'll go for all pets and we want to find cooper without the image and we can get the name there we go Let's grab that ID and test out our delete pet. Looks like it's worked. So we can go back to this query, search for Cooper and the pet count. We see we're back to 10 pets and we've only got one Cooper in there. So let me take you back to the REPL. So I can show you how Site, by using XTDB, can keep a track of an entity's history. Let's require XT. And we can get the entity history with our XT node. Using Cooper's ID, we sort descending and we'll show the docs. If we look at the results, we can see that there is a record of all of the updates we made onto this entity. The most recent one, we've got Cooper's image. And the previous one, or the original one, we don't. So because Site uses XTDB, 
it gives us the power to go back in time and have a look at what the entity looked like at a given point in history. And this will be useful for auditing. Let's recap what we've done. We've made a fully functioning pets app in about a quarter of an hour, put a document into site telling it about our app and write a GraphQL schema. This schema dictated how our pets app could be used. Imagine doing the same thing in REST. We've saved ourselves writing multiple endpoints to handle the same actions. A GraphQL is a powerful tool. The schema that we wrote today only scratches the surface. GraphQL also offers fragments, which are reusable units of schema, so we can save on duplication. Interfaces and unions, which allow you to return one of several different types of object. On screen now is an example of a schema we're using with site on one of our projects. It shows that we can limit and offset searches in site. It also shows a union and an example of using meta fields with type name so that with our results, we can see the type that's returned. Another one of the benefits of GraphQL is that you can submit queries such that you only get the data that your app requires. You can also combine queries into one request so that you never have to overfetch or underfetch again. This means that your APIs can be cleaner and easier to manage. There's a really comprehensive tutorial on GraphQL's website that I can strongly recommend. Also there, you'll find the spec, which is really well documented if you're interested in reading further. With Sight, you can use GraphQL to build powerful apps with minimal effort. If we wanted to, we can now make our own shiny UI and put that into Sight instead of using GraphIQL. Site makes it possible for organizations to build multiple apps that can share data. We could use the people data that was already in Site to serve as information for our owners. For our own Site server inside Juxt, we also use that people data for HR related tasks, like assigning laptops or holiday and timesheet reports. To make this possible, we keep our documents small with only the information needed for a task. We can then build relationships between them using our XTDB queries. Lastly, I wanted to point out that Site supports REST alongside GraphQL, because there are some tasks, like serving images, that are best suited to REST. If you wanted to continue the journey with Site and GraphQL, here are a few links for you to follow. Let me give a quick disclaimer though, that while both Grab and XTDB are production ready and stable, Site is still in an experimental phase. If you're interested in that though, head over to the Juxt YouTube, where Malcolm and a few of us post regular videos of building Site. And that concludes my talk. Thanks for your attention and thank you Reclosure for putting on another brilliant conference. I'm going to be available in the Q&A panel after the talk to answer any questions you'd like to ask. Say goodbye to Cooper. And bye-bye, Cooper. And welcome back uh, for our um, second panel of the day with uh, Johanna and Alex. So first of all, like before, we are going to get our speakers ready. Okay, um, let me check if Alex is with us. Alex, can you unmute yourself and see if you can connect? I can see you there in the list. Johanna, are you here? Can you hear me? Yes, I cool. can hear you. Beautiful. Let's see if we can also get Alex in the call. Hey, Malcolm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. 
Johanna, your, your video is blinking a little bit. I don't know if there's um, some okay, cable can you can wiggle. push. Okay, it's um, making strange uh, twitchings. Might be less distracting if I just turned it off, um, but I don't know. It's going for a VCR. <laughs> we still don't have Alex on the call. Alex, are you able to connect? You have to maybe, you know, other speakers had to restart. I think mm -hmm. restart the laptop. I'm, I'm not sure if they restarted um, only Zoom. No, we still can't get Alex on the call. So if we don't, um, if we don't get him, we'll get started with uh, the first questions for Johanna. Let's wait another minute. Oh, I can see Alex, perhaps. Oh, yeah, he's unmuted. There we go. Still don't hear him. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can now. There we go. Cool. Hi, there Alex. He is. Woo. <laughs> Hi. Hello. OK, so Alex, I'm going to ask um, I'm going to ask you the same questions we asked to other speakers. Is there anything around you, your surroundings that is worth sharing? Or if not, well, you can share anything that like is uh, controversial about yourself. Pick well, I one of the two. I want a skipping rope on my desk. When okay. I'm in a boring meeting, I just hop outside and do, you know, a few of Anandas just to uh, keep the COVID five away. <laughs> So you're doing that during the meeting? Like is it... I put on my headphones and I just step out then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a nice suggestion for our next boring meeting. <laughs> okay, John, if you want. Uh, yes, yeah, so que same question for Johanna. Um, is there anything interesting about your surroundings or anything you'd like to share that's quirky or strange or normal? Apart from my camera flickering, um... That's a pretty cool effect. <laughs> Which is something I've, I've planned um, and put on especially for you guys. Uh, no, I'm, I'm in the juxta office, which is pretty cool. I've got Alex and Malcolm just out of shot, keeping an eye on me um, because I'm moving house today. Well, I'm not, I moved house yesterday. So I'm, I'm I guess, interesting. Nice. I bet that's fun moving. Uh, your video reminds me a bit of uh, Max Headroom, kind of like the, the jerky cartoon character. The, uh, graphic character they made that basically just overlaid some graphics over somebody and he was kind of like jerking around just to make him like <laughs> seem more artificial. You can turn it off if it's distracting, but uh, I mean, well, the whole video, but otherwise I'll stay. Oh, it's fine. It's fine, it's fine. because the voice is coming through crystal cool. yeah. clear. So that's important. Okay. So um, let me grab the first question for Alex that came through Discord. This is Mark Jensen. Um, thanks for the talk, Alex. And uh, could you please post the links that you add at the end of the talk somewhere uh, about modeling with data log and so on, if that's possible, maybe yes, the I Discord post, channel? Yes, I posted them in, um, in Discord, but let me also post them in the chat. And everyone has them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, yeah, so for Joanna, we have uh, quite a few questions. Um, the first question is, how does Grab differ from La Senia? So, so Grab was, is more modern than La Senia. La Senia has been around for a while. Uh, Grab was written after the, um, I forget the name of it, SDL, Schema Definition Language, was standardised, um, but it is a bit more stripped back than the senior. Uh, I think there might be some information on the Grab README on that. Nice. Thank you very much. And another question for Alex. Uh, I'm unable to pronounce the name, but it's coming from Zoom. Um, one of the reasons I like Firebase for MVPs, 
minimum, minimum viable products is to eliminate the need to spin up an application server. So my browser, JavaScript and, or ClojureScript can talk directly to Firestore, including authentication and so on, permissions, and using the JavaScript APIs of Firebase. So is there any plans to integrate Firetomic with ClojureScript? Um, in a way, so ClojureScript is still above my pay grade, um, but the folks at Data Hike are building um, a conserve um, interface in CLJS. So once that lands, um, I can do the Firebase bit, and then we can connect. And then it'll be similar to DataScript that you can just run in your browser and connect straight into Firebase. But um, I think the Data Hike server will come first, and then, then that piece will come a bit later. So it's kind of thank in you. the place. All right, thank you. Uh, Joanna, how does site deal with resolvers that need to fetch data from other data sources? Uh, so site is intended to be built on one database, which is XT, but you can put custom resolvers into site and you can also load closure namespaces into site. So if you really need to, you can do it yourself. So would you do that? So you do that in site, not, um, yeah. So, cause you, you can have a, like a GraphQL engine be uh, a view of a multiple databases. So is that, is that what site is doing? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the resolver would give you the data that the GraphQL is asking for. Okay, great. Thanks. Here it comes another uh, question for Alex. So see you are a PostgreSQL user. And uh, I was wondering, are there particular reasons why you would favor that data hike, so data log over PostgreSQL, and why, what, and what might be the use case for data hike data log over PostgreSQL? Okay, so I'm not super familiar with them. Um, uh, well, I, I do use Postgres, but not a lot. Um, what I generally find, I mean, it may have changed now, but when I started writing Clojure, was that you often had to write the, the SQL queries in. Uh, you know, a DSL or in text and then import it into your code. Um, and that for me always seems a bit touch and go, um, especially because you can make mistakes there that you don't pick up because, you know, there's no syntax highlight highlighting, it's not really compiled. So um, the ben benefit for me there is that basically writing closure all the way through in your queries. Um, and also with, with, I find, you know, with data log databases, you can, you can, as you go, change your schema and, um, you know, without it being complete chaos, whereas if you're working in like Postgres, you know, you have to do migration, um, which can be, uh, let's say, dangerous. In the data log, you dump all your datums and then you write in your schema and you import them and you're good to go. So that's kind of my preference for, for using data log, especially because I do a lot of prototyping first. So as a result, you know, I always know I'm going to throw away a lot of stuff. So um, data log helps me throw away and uh, restart without losing the data. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Thank you, Alex. And another for Joanna. Uh, so, have the Jux team been able to implement uh, streaming queries, so like subscriptions, uh, in GraphQL using Grab or Andor Site? Uh, no, but because Site is still in an experimental stage, it's something that we're definitely look into playing with and trying out, but we haven't looked at that yet. And are you taking pull requests for that feature? Are we taking pull requests? <laughs> yeah, we definitely are taking pull requests. <laughs> there we go, excellent. Uh, another one for Alex, uh, from me. And I I think I, I'm, I heard you mentioned in your bio that this is nighttime work for you or like, um, like side projects. So um, I guess you're not using currently any of the Fire Atomic or even Clojure in your production environment or a current role. So if, if that is correct, is there any plan for you to like introduce that um, in like in your role somehow or change your role? Okay. Um, yeah. So I do use it in production. Production just gets attended to after six p.m. So I work um, in a design team. So UX, UI, and process engineering. So we don't actually do much good. Um, 
So I think I, I actually write the code and do closure and open source to keep the, the creator in me alive. In, in my day job, I mean, I'm a manager of managers. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm actually quite happy that to do it that way because then I can explore fully. You know, whereas when you're introducing new technology into a bank, you know, it's not just like closure. You know, it's like three years and then closure. So, so yeah, so no plans to change that at the moment. Um, but I still have, a, I mean, especially now with the, all the lockdowns, I have a lot of time to write code. So no complaints on my part. Okay. So in a sense, it's a positive that you can play with it, but it's a negative. You cannot spread the word. So I hope one day you can, you can do that. Thank you. Yeah. And the next question for Johanna is, um, can Grab act as the endpoint to federated GraphQL services? I'll actually divert that question to Malcolm. I think he's responding on Discord. Is that? Oh, yes. Right, Malcolm, because that's more a grab related thing. And I want to do it justice. Oh, there he is. Oh, Malcolm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Grab, mm. grab is really just a, a really super small library. It's only four namespaces. And it's really just a sort of a library to use if you were building a bigger GraphQL system and you just wanted a, a parser and something to execute the GraphQL according to the rules of the spec. So it's really just a, a faithful implementation of the current, well, you know, the previous, uh, the, 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 um, the June 2018 version of GraphQL, which is quite modern and includes native support for uh, the schema definition language, as, as Joanna said. Um, and so far as a, a federated system, I mean, it's not, you could, you, you could use Grab if you wanted to create your own little proxy, but the use of Grab Insight is really to um, give XTDB a kind of GraphQL schema, you know, entry entry point into the database. Um, so you can, you know, define shapes. Um, it's really the schema, a schema layer on top of XTDB because XTDB is a schema-less database. And so it doesn't have a, a an inbuilt schema. So you kind of have to bring one along. And if you like GraphQL schema, then, then, then Site provides that. Um, but you could, you could, if you were going to create a big federated system of GraphQL, you might want to use Site as a sort of microservice or a node or a leaf node in that federated system if you wanted to provide uh, a GraphQL interface to a bunch of data that you wanted to um, stand up quickly and then um, stitch up with other GraphQL services to create a, a bigger graph. Excellent. Thank you very much, Malcolm. I enjoy it. So we um, currently don't have any more questions for Alex. So if um, I, I have some more, to... yeah, I have some more okay. questions for okay. not for uh, ahead, not please. for um, yeah, not for Alex, but for Johanna again. Um, so I'm quite curious. Um, GraphQL is is kind of relatively new for a lot of developers, um, even though it's becoming very popular quite quickly. Um, was there a lot of learning up front, and did you kind of? get a sense of how different designing a GraphQL API would be compared to something like REST? I, I think there's barely any learning up front. Um, once you get your head around the schema language, which isn't that difficult to pick up, the very basics to build um, a simple API using GraphQL compared to REST is very straightforward. Um, there's obviously an increase that you need to know if you want to start doing clever things. Um, but GraphQL also has really good tutorials and really good resources for learning. So it makes it that much easier. But anything you want to do, you can just look up. Yeah, and it looks like there's some quite nice tooling around there as well. I've been using the Apollo Studio, which seems to be quite a popular user interface. Uh, and you can do it on the web as well. And it kind of helps you like experiment um with that i guess um did you did you find like the actual design like deciding what goes into the graphql was um was kind of an interesting challenge as with everything i think it is i think your, your first draft is always something that you go back and think <laughs> well that won't actually work in reality um but but no more difficult than than rest yeah sure so you've got lots of options um i just need to decide which options you actually want yeah mm. cool so while we're waiting to see if there are any more questions for Alex as well, Alex, is is there anything else you wanted to add that you couldn't get into the talk? 
Um, not particularly. Uh, I think I said what I wanted to say. Um, but I guess just to give a shout out to the folks at Data Hype, um, they really helped me understand a lot of the stuff and walk me through the papers and whatnot. So that was just pretty neat. All right. Um, I have another question for Johanna. Um, is that how you pronounce your name, Johanna? Is it so Johanna? I'll take anything, but I, I say Joanna. Joanna, okay. <laughs> Nice. Um, can, uh, what was I going to ask? Oh, yeah, Sites uh, a relatively new project. Um, so you might not have what answers that. But uh, uh, what kind of projects have you built with or are like looking to build with or are the kind of examples of what people have done with Site already? Yeah, yeah. So we're using Site in one of our client projects. We're also using Site for our internal uh, HR network, just the whole internal juxt. App. And we're hoping that all of the Jux developers and even less technical people will eventually be able to easily put in a schema, create their own applications at the top, um, and grow from there. We really like the idea of developers being in control of the systems we use. Excellent stuff. And are there tutorials for that already, or is that still a bit early days yet? There's, um, there's obviously all of uh, Malcolm's building site series, but that's more building site. And then there'll be offshoots posted regularly to the same YouTube channel of short tutorials uh, we're planning to do as we build them ourselves on how to actually build on top of site. So there's the building site and then there's also how to build on site. There will be. Cool, excellent stuff. Is there um, any question that the speakers wants to do to themselves? Mm. That's a difficult one. Not really, huh? but you need to be prepared for that, I think. <laughs> that is putting people on the spot a little bit, yes. Right. Um, I, do, I, I do have a quick one for um, jo Joanna. Um, do you know what the name of the Emacs theme you're using? I'm sure some people are cur curious. I do know the name of it, and it's called Joanna Has Decided Over the Course of However Many Years that this is the background colour to use, and this is the font colour to use. And maybe for reclosure, I'll make this one a bit bolder so it's clearer, so that it's just evolved over. I customised my faces, and I think I started with the um, closure for the Brave and True setup, and then from there, I was, I, I've just in incremented it. Into my ah, own. yes. Nice. Excellent. Could do a uh, good being control of things sometimes. Yeah, my my first boss tried to, well, my first dev boss tried to convince me to use Emacs. <laughs> um, he's still trying. <laughs> there are other editors. <laughs> okay, still waiting for questions for Alex, but if there are no more. Uh, is yeah, there anything yeah. else more for, for Johanna? Um, There's a um, question, um, Discord here. Are there any features in Datomic missing from Data Hike that you miss? Same question with the on prem and cloud versions of Datomic. So it's confession time. Um, I once tried to run Datomic like five years ago, and it asked me for a license. So then I closed that and moved on with my life. So um, all the, my atomic knowledge is really from reading all the docs and watching all the videos, not actually using it. So, yeah. And thanks for like uh, asking the question and also answering the question. That was good. <laughs> Any more for Johanna? <laughs> Um, I have one question, but it might be a bit too open-ended. Um, I was just curious what it's like working at Juxt. Sorry, Malcolm. No, it's great. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that. No, it, it's great. It's a great environment to work at. Um, yeah, I can't complain. I couldn't if I wanted to, but I can't complain. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, the, we've been talking. Well, you've been talking about uh, XTDB in your uh, in your presentation today. Just wanted to remind people that there was a, an XTDB workshop yesterday by Jeremy, 
Um, it's very detailed, went into a lot of the kind of theory, but also a lot of the kind of practical use of XTTB. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, there are some workshops around using that specifically as well, aren't there, for, for, from Juxt? Yeah, that, yeah, there's some tutorials online and uh, workshops all available on xtdb.com. Com, yeah, com. Excellent. Thank you. And also remembering our audience that uh, tomorrow, um, Paula Giron, um, I hope I pronounced her last name correctly, um, is going to talk about data log, um, like in a, in a more um, like a, a brand free flavor. So going to the root of data log and understand what does it mean to talk about data log without talking about datomic necessarily or XTDB necessarily. So <clears throat> I think there are a few connections for the other talks um, in the conference regarding data log and uh, yeah, databases in general. There is one more okay. question in the uh, Discord um, to both. Uh, oh, um, it's saying this might be an unfair question, but how to choose between data hike and XTDB? Oh, that is a so bit I'd, more. I'd be interested to know what Alex thinks because he's obviously done a lot of research into these databases. I, I think XTDB all the time, every time. Um, but if Alex has looked at XTDB and has any answers, then I'd like to hear. Um, so, I mean, I haven't used XTDB. I mean, I've read about it and I followed it since it was Crux. Um, and if you want to look, there's a, I can't remember the link, but I'll post it later that shows the differences between the two, the, well, the three and the atomic. But for me, I, what I like about DataHack is the fact that it's open source and easy for me to understand. Look, um, for me, a big selection criteria and things I pick is, is it easy for me to understand and is it easy for me to teach? Um, and at the moment, data hike is the top of that list. So I would choose data hike um, every time. So <laughs> We'll have to put out some more XT tutorials then. Okay. And I'll also get to writing then. Huh? <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you both. Okay. So let's just check if we are out of question. And I think we are. So if we are out of question, then um, we are gonna just thanks once again, Johanna and Alex for the excellent talks and be here at the panel and their effort in putting together these talks. Uh, very appreciated and contributing to the conference. And we are gonna take our break. It was supposed to be like in 12 or so minutes, but uh, there's no problem. It's lunchtime in uh, UTC, so I'm going to probably use that <laughs> in this case. And uh, we are going to see you all, let's say, uh, five minutes to two, just to be sure that you connect correctly and everything is working fine. So but we're going to start at 2 p.m. with the next talk by Artem. All right. Thank you very much. Enjoy some visual art.
¿Qué tal? Buen día. Estaba muteado. Para variar. Bien, todo bien. ¿Y tú? Hola.
Hello, everyone. Before um, we got we get back to regular programming, and uh, Renzo and John are back from their lunch break. You can check out the list of artists that are featured in the generative art showcase. Uh, if you look into um, general channel on Discord, and um, if you're enjoying this, please let them know. I'm sure they're gonna appreciate it. Um, we should be back with with the conference shortly. So that's that. Hello, everyone. We seem to be back already. There we go. How's everybody doing? I hope you're all enjoying the generative art. Excellent stuff. We seem to have a picture of one of our participants on there. <clears throat> So officially the talks start again at 2 p.m. And we will have a couple of uh, exciting talks. Um, one I'm kind of very interested to see the details from um, is uh, from Artem, who uh, spent a lot of time trying to find out why people aren't using Clojure so much. Uh, so that'll be uh, really interesting to see the results of that. And also, Closure as well. That's going to be a really cool talk. Um, if nobody's, if you haven't checked out that tool yet, uh, you will be doing by the end of this talk. It's it's a really really nice interactive experience. <clears throat> While we are waiting, I think uh, the organisers will be. Uh, curious to hear if you're having any issues with the conference. There is the organizers channel you can reach out to and ask us questions uh, if you're having problems. Obviously, if you're having problems with Discord, then that might be a challenge itself. But if you're really having problems, you can ask, also ask in the Zoom chat as well. I'm going to have a scroll through the participants list to see if there's people I recognize their names from. There's a few there I haven't seen for a while. Uh, Chris Jenkins, I haven't seen you for a while. Givilla. Jakob. Uh, Jakob does some really interesting stuff with uh, Fulcro, uh, which is another thing on my to-do list.
It's Renzo. Did you have a nice lunch, Renzo? What was what was Renzo's lunch? I'm not sure if you can hear me yet. Hello, John. Hey, it's Jordan. The U.S. party has joined, so it looks like I think we should get started at eight fifty-five. Is what some Discord four minutes time? Yes, yes. I think um, we did wrap up the pa last panel a little bit early, so the uh, our excellent generated graphics uh, had finished a little bit early, and uh, yes, so we are just making sure everybody's back uh after the the nice long break how are you jordan well, i'm happy to be here happy to do this reclosure happy to yuck it up and uh glad to have an excuse to cosplay steve jobs this turtleneck i've been saving it in my closet for like a year without an occasion because when is there an occasion to wear a mesh turtleneck <laughs> I struggle to find those occasions myself. Yes. <laughs> Reclosure, uh, that's the occasion. Excellent. Nice. If I'd only known, what have I got? Oh, I've got a jump run because I'm cold. Oh, I don't, oh look, oh, a bit of branding oh. there. There we go. Oh, oh, how do we get a Practicality t shirt? Um, Probably Practicality website. Sponsor me. <laughs> sponsor me. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've only made a few of them, but uh, yes, they are. Uh, I, I, I used to wear them during my uh, weekend broadcasts, um, just to remember I was supposed to be doing one. Uh, but yes. Um, but yeah, it's great to have you on board, uh, Jordan. So uh, for our audience, uh, Jordan will be taking over some of the hosting work uh, uh, along with us to give Renzo uh, a bit more of a break. Uh, it's quite a lot of work. And Renzo and the other organizers have done a huge amount of work already to get this done. I've just yeah. been watching them Everybody. do all the magic stuff. Yes. Everybody did a great job, uh, not just me. But yes, it's, it's, it's great to have uh, like other presenters this year. That's fantastic. And, and Jordan will certainly keep everybody entertained uh, during the rest of the day. Yeah, I have no problem being a ham at all. Like, <laughs> like, would you like me to sing or dance? How about both? Want to see my cat? I'll grab my cat. <laughs> we have had a dog already. So, yes, I think in terms of balance, uh, uh, we should have a few more cats in there as well. Oh, was that That's not in the notes? It's required that everybody brings their animals to this situation. I've got like, my, I thought that uh, was a hard, a hard ask, a hard requirement. Yeah. I've, got my, I've got my faux cat with me because my other cats, one's, one's in a box and the other one's hiding underneath the table at the moment. So. so Jordan will be joining us for the panel uh, next and be sharing the questions and then introducing some of the talks after that as well. And she's now co-host, so she has the power. I have the power. So it's almost 2 p.m., so maybe we should just get into the next talk. Indeed, and that is my turn to do another talk. Yes, another introduction. So welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a nice break. Hope you're inspired by the graphics that we were showing as well. Uh, so now we have a talk from Artem, who's the co-founder of Fresh Code. And Freshcode have been looking at the challenge of closure adoption, which we do talk about quite a lot uh, in Slack and other circles as well. And you may have taken part in the survey that they did uh, earlier this year. And um, Artem is going to walk us through the approach they took to that survey, what they were looking for, um, what the, like, the closure adoption blockers really were, were, and shares with us their findings as well, which I think is going to be really invaluable for us to help us if we want to encourage other people to come and try closure and get involved in the closure community as well. And Artem has been gathering people around closure um, for since uh, since 2012 and helping create an environment where closure, closure enthusiasts can succeed. So over to you, Artem. Hello, my name is Artem Barman, and I want to tell you a story about how we decided to do something useful for closure community, how we change it, our mindset of finding the ideas, uh, how we took a lot of marketing and product management instruments and applied it to the 
Clejure popularity problem. But now I want to tell you a bit about myself. I started my journey as a developer and uh, I was a Java developer for three years. Then I moved to the Clojure production development and made several projects uh, in Clojure. And then we, together with my friends, decided to create a startup and ended up uh, in a company that doing service uh, and uh, augmenting teams for the external companies. So I like a lot also uh, marketing and product management. And basically already for five years, I'm not a software developer already. Uh, that's why I decided to use my newly acquired skills for doing something useful for closure community and not to go from the technical side, but to go more from, uh, you know, business side and uh, watch uh, on the problems from other perspective. Uh, also, one of my biggest uh, happiness in life is applying different mental models in a different domain so try to transfer them from one domain to the other domain and see how it performs i want to mention our team without these people uh, it wouldn't be possible to do everything that we've done already so i work as just a presenter and maybe one of the guys that uh, manage the vision and ideas but uh, most of the job is done by inna vladimir ilshad and gleb uh, vladimir is uh, so a closure developer one of our projects ilshad is also gleb is responsible for creating the platform that i will show you a bit later and in uh, she's a product uh, manager and project manager of this uh, whole process so let me tell you about the idea and how we found uh, what useful can be done for the closure community initially we started with the idea about the library or some open source solution that can be used in the closure projects or not closure projects and to go in this area but then we recalled that uh, the better uh, to ask people what do they need. That's why we use techniques from the product management, applied it to the community conversation and extract some pain points and friction points uh, that community have with closure, closure itself. So everything was done by Inna and Vladimir. They uh, do this marketing and product management job. And uh, let me tell you a bit more about the process. So initially we conducted a survey among the closure community. We gathered 52 responses uh, that highlighted that uh, one of the main reasons of closure and popularity the people answered this, they, they, they shared their ideas, is that uh, too many libraries and uh, too many tooling is existing for the closure. And that make uh, onboarding process for the newcomers much more harder than in other languages that, ha that have usually one or two solutions uh, that are used common in the whole industry and also it had a lot of other consequences a bit later about them the second step was in-depth interview with the closure developers so we formulated a hypothesis about the problem of choosing libraries and making decisions and searching and benchmarking that's why we came with this hypothesis to, to the people and uh, made a set of 14 interviews uh, each one hour long about the process, how they actually do this job, how they actually perform in the library selection, how they navigate in the ecosystem. And uh, 10 of 14 of these interviews uh, have actually proved that uh, this idea uh, and this problem is exist in a community. The very important part of this problem is that to become closure more popular, to start and uh, improve the external marketing for the people that are not familiar with closure, we initially need to do something, in some internal improvements. So when they get to know the closure, when they try to start a project, they need to be able to start it without any friction points as much as possible. So all tooling, libraries, ecosystems should be 
perfect. And that's, that's one of the first steps to make a closure more popular. Okay, so let me tell about the found idea. Uh, and that's actually marketing for a closure and removing all friction points on the way of a developer inside the language. If you would just spread the word about the closure on different con conferences, you know, creating content and try to make it, try to make people aware of it without paying attention to internal friction points. A lot of people can try closure, uh, but they would break on the later stages and they will lost for us. And in the worst scenario, uh, they will become a negative referral and it make negative viral effect for the closure. So people that are not satisfied, they will go out and they will tell that closure is have rather bad uh, library support or it's hard to navigate in the language itself. That's why we decided to go with a customer journey for developer inside the language and find some friction points. So let me apply a first mental model from product management is 3A, 3R funnel. And I want to apply it to the language adoption and language choosing as a developer. And uh, basically it consists of uh, six steps. Uh, first one is awareness. Uh, when someone is get to know the closure, uh, hear about it on some conference, and we need here the very wide spreading of the information about the closure. Second step is acquisition. So how many people will hear about closure and will go to closure org or will try to find some uh, tutorials or courses that uh, can help them. Third one is an activation. So activation is when someone spend some time on course and get to know the syntax and try to do something in closure maybe pet project or small production task and uh, this part uh, from my point of view and what we've discussed is one of the most important parts in a closure because uh, newcomers have a lot of troubles when they meet the closure ecosystem they meet the lisp course and they understand that too many libraries is, is exist for each problem and that's uh, make language onboarding and language activation is much harder for newcomers the third one uh, the fourth one is a revenue when how many people will start production project in their in their jobs retention how many people will do the second production project or serious pet project and referral when developer became a closure advocate and that's the latest step of a closure and with last three steps i think there is no big problems and from my point of view and from what we've discovered during the polls and surveys and interviews is an acquisition and activation steps so goal of our talk is to put attention on the activation uh, and help newcomers to figure out the ecosystem much faster interestingly that found problem even have its own name in a Lisp and it's called a Lisp curse. Uh, it was described in a famous article about 10 years ago and um, it's a very good description of a state for the almost any Lisp implementation. And it has uh, very bad cons consequences for the closure because it makes much harder to do marketing among the decision makers and to to force them to use this language for the new project for the startups because of uh, because of very strange state of the ecosystem so let me tell you a bit more about the lisp curse so um, it's uh, initially caused by uh, technical excellence of uh, Lisp language itself and the closure as a, one of the Lisp implementation. And uh, there is no requirements for this social collaboration to do some hard tasks for, because uh, almost every developer can do uh, some hard uh, technical task by its own and no need to collaboration. And that's 
create a lot of concurrent implementations for the same problem. And that make it harder to navigate an ecosystem and onboard the newcomers. So figure out what languages, what approaches is the best practices, uh, how they used. And that makes developers harder to replace. And uh, a lot of closure projects uh, have their own library set and their own stacks. And that makes managers and decision, maker, decision makers harder to choose the closure for starting the projects. That's, that's the problem. So with his, we see this solution that uh, we can gently encourage in collaboration and we can gently building up the habit of scoping out the existing libraries and work before starting the new work. You probably want to say that uh, creating a new standard of closure observability or closure ecosystem will not solve the issue. And I agree with you here. And we understand that creating a new standard uh, among existing one will just increase number of standards and it will not solve everything. But the goal of the talk is to analyze this problem in details, uh, to start a discussion inside the community and uh, to suggest some social-based uh, solutions like marketing and product management. Okay, so let's move to the jobs to be done that should be covered by the system. And here we, two, we found out the two segments of the people that uh, will be first users of a system the first one is a newcomers that wants to find out what libraries, what trends, uh, what approaches uh, in the closure exists. And the other one, the experienced people that work on a closure project, but they are not following the ecosystem, they're not following the old news or libraries or mailing lists, but they still want to get to know the uh modern trends in the ecosystem because they change in a lot and such dynamic language as a closure so the big job for these guys is to find out the best practices and libraries in a trend actually there is a set of small jobs that's a required task that should be done to solve the big job uh, to find out the library so right now this is slack reading this is asking uh, advises in the chats, reading the Twitter, following a lot of influencers, uh, researching the GitHub, following the mailing lists, and asking the guys, the experienced guys, uh, what they, what did they use in their projects. And there is a huge amount of activity need to be done to just uh, to keep uh, ecosystem in the mind. There is no such place. Uh, that cover the whole ecosystem. So let's move to the point A. To move somewhere, we first need to understand where we are now. And we described the how this problem is solved right now by developers in Clojure. And I already mentioned it uh, because that's reading the Slack, reading a lot of social information, reading discussion, following discussions, and following the large threads and finding out the mentions of a library, following the GitHub. So that's the point A. And uh, uh, I want to emphasize on similarities among the listed sources of information. And all of them is uh, all of them are stream based. So the information came in from experienced guys in the discussions and it quickly became not accessible because stream is just moving. There is no structure in the streams. It's uh, rather hard to navigate currently in this information. The, the, good, the good side that this information is, exists. The bad side that it's not uh, quickly accessible by newcomers. And if you want to find something in the Slack discussions, you need to know precisely what do you want to find. So it's harder to just ask the question to the system. Uh, please show me the libraries that was discussed a lot and that uh, supported a lot in, in a community. And the idea actually is to move from the stream-based information to some uh, knowledge gathering in some place. 
that should be accessible anytime by device guy and it should be well structured much less well structured than current feeds of information from twitter slack github reddit anything okay so we discussed the point a and now we can discuss the point b this is the probable idea of what should to be done and where we want to go in a system that will be helpful for the closure ecosystem navigation uh, i will tell in general about the points and i will tell in the details about each point separately so first one is a social uh, citation index it's taken from the academic papers and academic research the second one is a focal point this is an idea from the game theory that's the point where everyone goes without any pre information the third one is accumulation and transparency so the knowledge should be gathering in some database that should be accessible by everyone and it should be structured and uh, probably there is a lot of unknown components of the system that should be created and uh, extracted from the community mind using the product management techniques like deep interviews and polls and anything else so let me tell a bit more details uh, about each part of the system accumulation uh should work as uh, some place that gather all information about closure ecosystem from a github twitter reddit project clgs uh from the real production projects and maybe some other sources interesting to mention that modern B2C marketing systems have uh, this integration with Twitter and social signals, and it's quite easy for them to analyze the mentions of the brand in the whole network. And uh, we want to introduce something similar to the closure and because it looks like it's a very important way of library decision making. And it should be uh, accessible and it should gather and not uh, disappearing after the some time so it should not be a streaming based approach but rather structured data-based approach the second one is a citation index and uh, i already mentioned it and we figured out during the interviews that uh, developers use a lot of social signals to make a decision on libraries and just to look at it and uh, we want to automate automate this job and we want to create some uh, linked database to make it easier to find out the social signals about each library for example was it used in a production project or was it mentioned in a slack in some discussion in one context was it mentioned and in general in ideal world where we should get something like page rank algorithm for google but for library the third part of a solution uh, is not a technical one uh, but it's social one it's focal point it's the concept from the game theory and that means that everybody will go to the system to this place uh, without any prior information and uh, and unconditionally and this is more a marketing task how to promote this platform and how to pro promote this way of searching and navigating the ecosystem and uh, here we have several instruments from a marketing and product management that can be used another important part of a system is a transparency ecosystem should become much more transparent than now so every library every announcement everything should be gathered in one place and should be easily navigatable and observable and uh, the interesting consequence of this uh, transparency is that we can add some metrics to the system and there is a, a interesting psychological effect when we introduce some kpi or metric and we start to watching it uh, this metric became to change and uh, usually it became to improve uh, i've seen this many times in my business work and uh, 
you know, transparency and, and observability of ecosystem allow us to add some interesting metrics like uh, I can suggest uh, closure ecosystem entropy score. Uh, it's uh, some integral metric that describe the uh, relation between problem and amount of solutions for this problem. And uh, in general, this should uh, be much less than current situation. That's about the point A and point B. And the third part of a talk is uh, uh, what instruments do we have and uh, what, we can, what can be used to go from point A to point B. One of the useful instruments is a systematic marketing. Uh, it's interesting to emphasize that in closure world, uh, most of marketing is viral. So if someone is creating library uh, for library for library to become popular, it need to be so well done and so greatly fit the problem. So everyone will talk about it and will refer uh, it and will become advocate of this library. And in this case, it became very popular and spread among the whole ecosystem. But another ability is to do a systematic marketing. Um, it doesn't mean that the idea is not very useful. It only means that we have much more control about saying and uh, about uh, educating people about the existing solution. And uh, I like a lot the example of vaccination uh, against COVID. Uh, because it's not a very popular thing, uh, but it's clearly well, very useful. And in some uh, countries, uh, governments even use marketing platforms to, to encourage people to do vaccination. So useful doesn't mean that it's go viral. Another instrument is a product management that can help us to build a new habit because uh, a uh, solution for the list course is actually building a new habit for for developers. So not to create something, but to have a habit to go some place to look for the things that already created, look for the problems, maybe make adjustments in the library, maybe uh, maybe improve the documentation for the library, but uh, try tend not to create something really new that solve the same problem, just maybe in a bit different way of a different API. That's the usual thing in Clojure. Another instrument that can help us is the CGM. Uh, it's a instrument from the product management and uh, it's a customer journey map. So if we treat our developers as a customers or newcomers as a customers and we treat closure as a product, not just an only language, but the whole ecosystem, tooling and everything. And uh, we can systematically improve and remove friction points in a language adoption way. So that's also not about the luck. It's more about the system and continuous improvements. And here we can use a lot of uh, things like uh, deep interviews, like measuring metrics, uh, like analyzing the the flow, uh, how people is proceeding, the, their studying and closure, and we can systematically improve it. What we have now, uh, we've started with a technical platform just to make something valuable that can be promoted and then can be a starting point for the for the discussion. And right now it's a closure based system located on a GitHub. It's an open source and we're going to transfer ownership to, to the community. And uh, right now it's a GitHub data extractor with automatic updates. Uh, all data is stored as uh, in a Postgres database system and uh, Metabase is used as a user interface, as an MVP for user interface. It's already deployed uh, on a Closure Garden uh, URL. You can see the link on the slide. So what we are going to do next? Uh, first of all, we of course have a roadmap for 
developing the system further and uh, the next big chunk and next big milestone is a gathering the social context and social signals and first attempts to build a lead rank uh, ranking system based on the social mentions and discussion uh, the second one we're going to uh, be, uh, make a public roadmap for the system and we encourage you as a part of a community to share your ideas and uh, to make a contribution into this project uh, from the vision side, from the understanding how it should be, or from the code side, every help would be great. And uh, we're waiting for your feedbacks uh, regarding the talk, the system and everything on the email that you can see on a slide. And the next great, great, great part that we want to uh, spend our budgets, time and all our forces is the marketing of this solution inside the Clojure community. Uh, this is going to be the collaboration with uh, different courses, influencers, and uh, we will try to find uh, the points of collaboration and how we can uh, make it popular and make it the focal point for the search in the library. The summary of this talk is that only by removing friction points in a developer CGM, we can make Clojure more popular. And that's the first step and many steps to come. Thank you. And thank you, Artem. That was fascinating. Certainly a lot of uh, ideas there that I want to go through and help shape the work I've been doing as well. Uh, I hope you uh, have the time over the next few weeks to go and delve into that uh, really valuable resource for our community as well, yourself. Um, now we have a short break, just a few minutes, uh, and we'll be back for our next talk. Uh, don't forget to ask questions in the QA, Artem and Ella channel, and on the uh, Zoom chat as well. Thank you very much.
Well, that was another excellent uh, view of some amazing art that certainly inspired me. And we are up next with our talk by Ella, who is going to show you new ways of writing closure script. I absolutely love uh, Lozure as a tool. I think it really encapsulates and epitomizes the very essence of Clojure. Uh, it's simple, it's elegant, it's fun visual interface for writing Clojure script and also understanding its structure as well. Uh, so Ella is the creator of Flojure and has a keen interest in intel artificial intelligence and creating new ways for people to interact with computational systems. Over to you, Ella. I'm Ella Hepner, and today I'm going to be talking about Vlogger. Uh, Vlogger is a web app that I've been developing for the past couple of months, and it's essentially a visual interface for programming Closure Script. And what that means is that uh, Vlogger gives you a kind of drag and drop interface for viewing and editing Closure Script code um, rather than a more traditional text based uh, interface. Um, so, the core feature of Vlogger is a, a new strategy for visualizing EDN expressions that relies on a kind of nested circular structure rather than using text. Um, in addition to this visualization tool, Lozure also acts as a drag and drop tool for uh, editing these visualized EDN expressions. So Lozure's basic strategy for visualizing EDN relies on treating lists as circles and the elements of those lists as smaller circles with inside an enclosing circle. So here I have a couple of different lists as examples. Um, here we have an empty list, and in Vlogger, that just gets represented as an empty circle. Here we have a list of one element, and in Vlogger, that looks like a circle with a smaller circle inside. And here we have a list of three elements, and when there are multiple elements, uh, the first goes at the top of the enclosing circle, and the remainder get organized in a counterclockwise uh, pattern. Now, the reason I went with a counterclockwise pattern rather than a clockwise pattern is that the, clockwise, or the counterclockwise pattern produces really nice and intuitive results, when you're um, writing out a function call with uh, just a couple of arguments. Um, here we have some function calls uh, as an example. Here we have uh, increment being called on x, and you can see that the increment symbol uh, ends up at the top half of the enclosing circle and the arguments down in the bottom. Um, here we have a function call of two arguments, and you can see that, as always, the function call will be at top, um, and there, the uh, two arguments are down here in the bottom half of the circle. And the nice thing is that you can read them left to right. Um, if these were organized in a clockwise pattern instead, then this x would be on the right and this y would be on the left, so you'd have to read it right to left, which would be really confusing. Um, here's an, uh, a function call of three arguments, and you can still kind of see that it's uh, a bit left to right, um, but as the, the number of uh, arguments to a function call increases, it becomes kind of less and less obviously, uh, less and less obviously left to right. Like here, it's not even strictly left to right anymore. Um, you know, it kind of goes right to left uh, for the first couple of arguments. So you have to keep in mind that things are organized in a counterclockwise way. Um, now, one of the great things about Clojure is that uh, it supplements the normal Lisp syntax with uh, some new uh, types of forms that represent different built-in data structures. Um, for instance, we have vectors, which are represented by square brackets normally. And uh, in Clojure, those get represented as octagons. Um, whereas, you know, parentheses um, get translated into kind of smooth circles. Um, these pointy square brackets get translated into like a pointy octagon. Um, uh, Clojure also has maps, um, which are represented with curly braces. And in Clojure, uh, maps are represented as circles with little spikes coming out of each side, um, reminiscent of the spikes on the sides of the curly braces. Um, here we have function literals, which are not technically their own data type, but they do have special syntax in Clojure. And so in Clojure, that's uh, reflected by having a circle with little lines coming out, uh, out of each side. And uh, finally, we have sets, which syntactically are kind of like a combination between maps and function literals. And so in Vlogger, these get represented as a circle that has both the, the spikes from the map and the lines from the uh, function literal. And uh, just like lists, uh, all the elements inside these structures um, get represented with the first element up top and the remainder in a counterclockwise order. Um, the real power of Lozier comes in that you can nest these shapes together inside one another, and by doing this, you can represent any EDN expression that you might want to, including Clojure script code. Um, so here we have a, a little function definition, a function of one argument that takes, uh, or that takes in one argument and multiplies it by itself. Um, and in uh, Lozier, that would end up looking like this. We have the fn up here declaring that this is a function, our uh, argument vector here, and finally the function body 
where the argument gets multiplied by itself. Um, here we have another example of a closure script expression uh, calling the map v function on two arguments. Um, and here's what it looks like in closure. And you can see the, the function literal syntax um, fits in very nicely just to circle with these uh, lines came out of the side. And then you just use the, um, the normal percentage sign symbol inside to reference the, the argument. So at this point, I'm actually going to switch over to the app itself so you can see how it works. Um, here I have that expression that was uh, in that last slide, um, but there's a bunch of other stuff on the screen that I'll also explain. So one of the most important things on the screen is this uh, bottom right hand corner right here, um, which is called the eval zone. And the idea of the eval zone is that it's basically like a REPL. Um, any form that you see on the screen here, you can click and drag into the eval zone and it will evaluate it. I just clicked and dragged six, which obviously just evaluates to six. If I grab this vector here and evaluate it, then that will just evaluate to, you know, itself. Um, and if I grab this whole expression here with the map V in this function, um, then that will evaluate to the result of applying this function to these arguments, um, just like you'd expect. Um, you can also uh, edit programs by dragging things around in here. You know, if I wanted to uh, uh, like add a new uh, vector to, um, to this uh, map V call, I could click and drag this and it would get duplicated um, here. I can also change the order of things um, by clicking and dragging and then uh, dragging the thing that I don't want anymore to the discard corner, which is down here. Um, this is how you discard things in Blogger. Um And you can also drag things back out of the discard corner or out of the uh, eval zone. Um, anyways, that's it for the, disc uh, the discard corner and the eval zone. Um, up on the right hand uh, side of the screen, this might be obscured by my camera, but trust me, it's there. Um, there is a text button, and when you click on that, you will uh, see a page that has all of the code um, that you writ wrote on the previous screen um, displayed uh, in a text form like normal. So if you write something in Vlogger um, and you, you're done with it and you want to pull it out and use it in some other, you know, Clojure script project, you can go in here to copy your code out. Um, on the sides of the screen, you'll see these form bars. Um, and form bars are basically just a place where you can store forms um, in a more long-term way um, that you might find useful in the future. So here I've got a bunch of different, um, you know, arithmetic uh, and function stuff here. I um, mean, I can drag any of these uh, out anywhere into my program uh, to use them whenever I feel like. Um, and these are completely dynamic, uh, meaning that any, uh, any form you have in your code, you can just drag into the form bar and it'll stay there until you uh, d drag it to the discard corner to get rid of it. Um, so these form bars act as kind of like a combination of like a normal toolbar with some, uh, you know, tools on it that you can use to do stuff. Um, and also uh, like a clipboard, you know, you can use this as kind of a way to copy and paste stuff um, by, by dragging something onto the Discord or, or and onto a form bar, going to elsewhere in your program and then dragging it back out. Um, so now uh, I'll talk about these uh, tools that are up on the uh, top half of the screen or, and, and the bottom side. Um, we have the undo and redo tools, which, you know, are kind of self-explanatory. Um, here we have a tool that when you drag it onto a form, it encapsulates that form in a surrounding circle. And this is really useful if you want to, you know, surround something with a, a another function call. And that's uh, a great tool for that. And we have other tools here. Um, here's a tool that um, kind of takes something that uh, takes a form that you drag it onto and surrounds it in like a function definition. Um, so that's really useful, too. Um, now let's go ahead and take a look at Vlogger's uh, settings. To get to the settings page, you just click on this little icon up here. Um, here on the main page of the settings, we have the project selector. Um, you can see all the different projects that you have in Vlogger. I just have this one right now. Um, you can make a new one by clicking this button. You can duplicate an existing one with this button. Um, you can delete programs with this button, and you can rename them with uh, this button. Um, over on the right side of the, uh, of the main page, we have some various visual settings. You can change the, the size of, of kind of like the zoom level of your forms. Um, as you can see, uh, you can change the size of the form bars on the sides of the screen, um, including the tools. Um, and you can also change the camera speed, the speed at which you, know, you kind of jump around when clicking on stuff. Um, and then over here, there's also a couple of different uh, color schemes that you can choose from. But we'll stick with the default. Um, here we have the saved form bars page. And the idea of this is that, um, like I mentioned uh, earlier, these form bars on the side of the page are, are uh, very dynamic um, and that you can kind of, uh, constantly kind of remove and add stuff to them, but that makes them kind of transient. 
Um, and so the saved form bars page is a way to kind of store a form bar uh, that you like that you think you might want to use in the future in a more long term way. Um, like, say, if I really like all the features that I have on this form bar, I can drag that in here. And then at any time in the future, I can come back and that form bar will be saved right here. And this works like cross projects, too. So you can kind of transfer um, different form bars between different uh, projects. Um, here we have the tools page. And this is where all of these tools that I was showing off before live. Um, there's all the ones that I showed and some uh, some more. Here's one that encloses a form in a vector, uh, one that encloses a form in a let expression, etc. Um, and then additionally, uh, I'd like to show you that you can um, edit the positions of all of these form bars on the settings page. Um, if I grab one of these and drag it, then it will snap to uh, wherever I, I place it. Um, you can also create entirely new forms or more new form bars by clicking on these uh, circles. Um, these start out empty, but then if you go out uh, into the main program and start dragging stuff onto them, then you can fill them up with whatever you like. Um, you can also delete uh, form bars that you've created by dragging them into the uh, bottom left-hand corner. Um, and so all, uh, all of your, what you're seeing on the sides of the screen here is completely configurable. This isn't like fixed. Um, you can move these around, have whatever tools and whatever form bars you want. Um, so with that out of the way, I'm going to go ahead and uh, kind of write a little program in Clojure, or in Clojure so that you can see how it works in practice. And in particular, I'm going to write a little expression for determining whether some given number is uh, a prime number. So to start out, um, let me just create uh, an empty let expression, which I have in my form bar here, and I'll delete this, uh, this map call that we had earlier. So in this let expression, let's go ahead and define a binding uh, in, and that will be kind of the number that we're checking for primality. Let's set it to six, I guess. Um, and oh, one thing I didn't mention is that um, you, you're not just stuck at kind of this level of zoom. If you're kind of getting too deep to, to see things at this level, you can click on any form and zoom in to get more detail. Um, so here I'll click on this. And the way we're going to check for primality is by just checking every number less than n and seeing if it's divisible uh, or if n is divisible by it. So we're going to use the sum function to do that. Um, I'll use a function literal inside here. Um, and uh, what we're going to be checking is a, oops. Uh, we're going to be using the range function to get all the numbers between uh, two and n. We're starting at two because one doesn't really count when it comes to uh, prime numbers. And so inside this literal function here, we're going to check uh, if this um, if n is divisible by the current number. And so we'll do that by checking if uh, the mod of n with respect to the argument is uh, 0. And as you can see, uh, if there's some literal and you want to change uh, what it says, you can just click on it and uh, edit it at will. Um, so there is a little bit of kind of text editing involved in Blogger, but much, much less than any normal Clojure script workflow. Um, so I think this should work. Let's go ahead and uh, run this expression. Oh, got an error there. Not sure what I did wrong. Mod in. Oh, there we go. That was supposed to be inside. All right. Now if I run this, um, then you'll see that it's telling me true for six. Um, it's actually giving the opposite uh, me the opposite answer of what I want here. It's checking whether this is not prime, not checking whether it is prime. Uh, so to fix that, I'll just wrap this form here in a not call. And then this, should, uh, this expression should be working. So here we have n of 6, and it tells us that 6 is not prime. If I change this to 7, then it will should tell us that it is. Yep, if we go to, say, another number, 14, uh, seems to be working. Yep. Um, and so if we wanted to change this into a function rather than just a let expression, we can just uh, get rid of that and change this to a function. And so now this is a function that takes in a number and determines whether or not it's prime. And you can see that that uh, you know evaluates to uh, kind of the function result that you'd expect. Um, we can also make this a named function just by kind of changing this and giving it a name. We can call it prime question mark, um, and that will also evaluate just fine. And then to prove that this works. Let me go ahead and try to invoke this prime function and see what we get. So there's prime ten should be false. Yep. Or prime twenty nine should be true. And it seems to be working. Um, so that's uh, the basic. Uh, that's a basic overview of what editing a program in Glozier looks like. Um, now at this point, I'm actually going to switch over to a local server um, rather than the production server because I'd like to show you a feature that isn't available on production yet that I'm still working on, um, and this feature is called Quill Mode. 
Um, so in uh, if, if you're not familiar with Quill, it is a cross-platform uh, graphics library for Clojure and ClojureScript um, that leverages processing and P5.js for the JVM and JavaScript specifically. Um, and essentially, it just gives you a very nice, uh, simple, um, straightforward graphics library that you can use to draw animations in Clojure or ClojureScript. Um, and in this case, obviously, we're going to be using the, uh, the P5.js version that runs uh, in a browser. So to activate Quill mode in this development branch, you uh, open up the settings. And on the uh, main project page, you'll see that there's this new uh, Quill mode button. When you click on that, it will move uh, Lozure off to just one side of the screen and create a new canvas here that uh, Quill can use to draw on. Um, so when you're in Quill mode, there is a special function, uh, Start Sketch, that gets exposed by Vlozure. Um And Start Sketch basically takes in a, a draw function and then draws uh, whatever that draw function says to draw on this canvas. And so we'll go ahead and run it to give you an example. Um, here we have just a black background with a red ellipse in the center. Um, and to see how this, uh, this animation is defined, we can zoom into this function here. Um, it's a function of two arguments, uh, W and H, representing the width and height of the canvas. Um, and all functions that uh, you pass to start sketch should take these, these two uh, arguments. Um, so the first thing that this function does is it calls q slash background. And this q namespace is actually the quill.core namespace, by the way, um, just something that, that uh, Vlozure automatically provides when you're in quill mode. Um, so here we have a q slash background uh, called with zero. And that basically just tells quill to set the, the whole uh, canvas here to black. Um, here we have q slash no stroke. Um, which basically tells it that we don't want any outline on this shape that we're about to draw. Here we have Q slash fill, uh, which we're using to tell it that the inside of the shape should be red. And then finally here we have the call to Q slash ellipse that um, actually draws the ellipse. Um, the first two arguments that it takes are um, an X and Y coordinate for the center of the, lip, uh, of the ellipse. Um, and we're getting those uh, X and Y coordinate by multiplying the width and height um, that we're getting as an argument um, by 0 0.5 which places it in the center of the canvas. And then the remaining two arguments are um, the width and height, respectively. Um, so if I were to change any of this and then rerun this uh, start sketch expression, then it will um, update as you'd expect. Um, now, Quill is not just meant for drawing uh, static shapes. Um, it's meant primarily for animations. Um, but right now, you know, our draw, our draw function does the same thing every time it's called. So this animation doesn't have any movement to it. Um, but if we want to introduce some state, then uh, we can uh, go ahead and uh, make this change over time. And to introduce some state, I'm going to use an atom uh, that will uh, change inside this uh, function call each time. And to do that, I'm going to use this tool here, which wraps a form in a let expression. I'll drag this onto Vlozure. And here you can see that uh, what was previously um, there is now in this uh, kind of body of the let expression. And we have a space to add bindings here. Um, so to, to uh, give our uh, image some animation, I'm going to define an atom called T. Um, and this atom uh, is going to just start out with a value of 0. Um, and one thing that I want to show off here is that when you're typing in a, in a literal uh, or in a symbol in uh, Vlozure, you can actually just write out full EDN expressions. And once you click out of that circle, uh, Vlozure will kind of translate it into the sub-hierarchy um, visual thing um, automatically. So, you know, rather than uh, dragging like a form for, for typing atom and stuff, or dragging in a circle and putting a, a smaller atom circle inside, I can just write out atom zero. Um, and once I click out of that, it'll automatically get translated to this. Um, so Vlozure kind of allows for kind of a mix of sort of text-based and uh, visual programming styles. Um, so here we have T being initialized to uh, zero. Um, and inside this uh, function, um, we now need to uh, increment T uh, each time this function is called. And to do that, we will call the swap uh, function on t. And we will call it with uh, the increment function. So now, uh, each time this uh, draw call is made, t will go up by one. And to actually make uh, t do something, or to make our animation respond to t, we will use um, t in the definition of this ellipse here. Um, so for instance, we can make it so the, the width of the ellipse um, is equal to t. Um, and to do that, I can just write out at t. Um, in Vlozure, um, d references get represented as these little um, circles, this kind of little circle of circles. 
Um, so this circled circles around T just re -re uh, reads as like at T, dereferencing -re -re T. Um, and so with that, I think that we can go ahead and run this sketch again. And we should see that the uh, ellipse increases in size uh, as, as that runs, as you'd expect. Um, and so if you're familiar with Quill or any other graphics library, then I'm sure that you can see that with the tools uh, here, you could uh, create some very interesting and complex uh, animations. Um, but this uh, is enough to kind of give you an overview for the purposes of this talk. Um, so at this point, I'd like to switch back to my presentation. Um, and I'd like to go ahead and address the question of why somebody would ever be interested in using Blozier over an existing ClojureScript workflow. Now, one of the big benefits of Lozier is that it natively encourages, and in fact, kind of requires structural editing. Um, so structural editing is kind of this idea of editing Clojure or ClojureScript code, or really Lisp code in general, in a way that kind of pays attention to its tree-based nature. You know, Lisp programs are really best thought of as these kind of nested tree structures rather than as pieces of text. Um, and when you're using a text-based editor, and you want to do structural editing, you need all kinds of, you know, uh, text editor plugins and stuff to get your text editor to kind of pretend that you're editing a tree rather than editing text. Um, but in Vlozier, um, this is sort of a tree first interface from the ground up. Um, so like, uh, like I was showing before, you interact with the program by just dragging whole forms around, you know, you're, you're never going to have a hanging parentheses or anything because, uh, the, the structure that Vlozier gives you is just a direct representation of the the tree structure of your program. Um, another benefit of Lozier is that it's meant uh, to be optimized for touch screens. So right now, I'm mainly working on Lozier for uh, for web browsers, um, and there's no uh, like official mobile app or anything yet. Um, you can try the web uh, the web browser version on your phone, and it kind of works. But there are some significant uh, UX issues that I haven't uh, managed to solve yet. I'm kind of trying to work on getting the, the the basic like web browser version working before worrying about. Um, mobile compatibility, but from the very start, I've been designing Vlozier with the idea of eventually uh, porting it to to mobile devices, um, because I think that this kind of drag and drop interface would be a, a really uh, powerful way to program on a on a mobile device that would be way more powerful than any kind of uh, text editor on a mobile device. Um, so that is one uh, potential big advantage of Vlozier. Um, another uh, big hope that I have for Vlozier is that it can be used as an educational tool for beginners. And I think that there are a couple of things that can potentially make Vlozier more approachable for beginners than um, just kind of a normal ClojureScript environment. Um, there are a lot of other uh, visual programming environments like Scratch that just kind of use their own sort of made up programming language. But one of the great things about Vlozier is that if you were to learn uh, programming through a visual interface like Vlozier, then it translates directly to a real programming language, ClojureScript. You know, if you learn programming through Scratch, then you eventually have to realize like, oh, this this language isn't uh, like, you know, something I can use to get a job or whatever. You know, this is this is just kind of a toy. So I'm going to have to give up this language and go learn something else. Um, but if you learn uh, programming via Vlozier, then you are just learning ClojureScript from the very start. You know, there's no point at which you have to say, OK, I'll have to give up on this language and go learn something new. Um, and so if you learned uh, ClojureScript th through Vlozier, um, I expect that you'll have a very easy time kind of transitioning over to a normal Clojure or ClojureScript workflow um, once you've learned with Clojure. Um, because once you kind of understand how to translate between the, the text representation of stuff and the, the Vlozier representation, um, it's just completely the same language. Um, another uh, benefit for beginners is that, like I said, there's no way to have a hanging parentheses or anything. Um, Vlozier forces you to have valid syntax. There's no way to, uh, you know, um, produce a syntactically invalid program in Vlozier. Um, and additionally, uh, for people who are, uh, already know um, some programming languages, oftentimes when they look at lisps, they'll say, there are so many parentheses here, this looks so ugly. Um, and once you understand the syntax of lisp, you realize that that kind of simplicity of just having uh, parentheses and stuff um, gives you a lot of power um, in that it makes uh, the, the program so kind of easily uh, amenable to like analysis, which allows for things like uh, like structural editing and, uh, and metaprogramming in the form of macros. Um, and so uh, an interface like Vlozier can allow you to enjoy all those benefits of lists, but without seeing any parentheses at all, right? There were very few parentheses listed during this talk, even though I was just programming in ClojureScript, right? The, the parentheses just get translated to circles. And so somebody can look at a, a, a bit of Lisp code and not even uh, have to worry about uh, all the parentheses. So that won't scare people off anymore if you're using Vlozier. Um, there's also some significant limitations with Vlozier as it exists right now. 
And one of the biggest uh, limitations uh, in principle is the information density of uh, the code that you're seeing. Um, so one thing that's great about text-based uh, uh, interfaces is that uh, you can see a lot of text on a screen at once uh, if you have you know, a reasonable zoom level. Um, in Flozure, it's hard to see more than like three layers deep into a hierarchy without the text becoming so small that it's like impossible to read. Now, thankfully, Flozure makes it very easy to kind of jump around in the hierarchy and zoom to different levels. Um, and so if you're, if you're like actively clicking around or, or tapping around, um, then the, the information uh, density problem is solved to some extent. But if you're just looking at like a static screen, then you can't see as much code at once with Flozure as you could with a text-based interface. Um, another limitation with Flozure right now is that it doesn't really do much in the way of uh, handling errors. Um, when an error happens in your Flozure script code, oftentimes it'll just crash the, the Flozure web app itself. Um, and even when that doesn't happen, you know, it might just fail silently and not really give you uh, any kind of useful information. Um, eventually, I do plan to fix this. I plan to add some more tools for kind of exploring uh, closure uh, errors in a visual way. Um, but right now, um, Lozure doesn't really have any way to do that. The only way to, to see what's gone wrong when you know, your, your code crashes is to look at the, the development console. And even then, um, the, the results that it produces can be kind of hard to understand given that it's operating in a bootstrapped environment. Um, and another big limitation of Lozure is that right now, there's not really any way to use it on an existing code base. You know, Lozure just lives as a web app and if you want to uh, you know, edit something in Blozure, you'd have to copy all your code into this web app and then copy it back out when you're done, which obviously isn't very practical. Um, I'd like to also address this limitation, um, usage on existing code bases, by eventually making a, um, a, a port of um, Blozure that works as kind of like an in-REPL plugin. Um, and there's a project called Gorilla REPL that I'm uh, aiming to base this off of that uses a, or that creates kind of a web, uh, a web browser-based interface um, as a uh, kind of REPL for um, a running like JVM uh, closure project. And so in, in the future, I'd like to eventually develop something like that for Vlozure as well. Um, so anyways, that's my talk. Thank you for listening. Um, here's my contact information if you'd like to get in touch with me. And I hope that you find Vlozure useful or at least interesting. Thank you. That was wonderful. I hope you really enjoyed watching that as much as I did. I think that design and the interaction with that tool is fascinating. Um, so we're going to go to the panel now, and hopefully my co-organizer, which is not Renzo this time, but it's going to be Jordan, is going mm -hmm. to join me. Hey, there we go. And uh, obviously, we need our panelists as well. So hopefully, Ella is around and Artem is around. Give them a moment to see if they can switch their um, videos and audio on. And the the most optimized way to uh, view this. We figured out if you go up to the upper right hand corner and do view and do speaker view, then um, it'll be a great watching experience for any of our audience members. I can see Ella in the list. Oh, and Artem is there as well. Um, they're still on mute. Do we need to ask them to unmute? Let's try that. Oh, Ella's there. Is Ella, are you with us, Ella? We did have some technical problems earlier. Hello. Uh... Hey, we got yeah, yeah. I also have uh, another developer that will help. Uh, uh, Vladimir, can you can you put him? Vladimir, yes. On, sure. on. Vlad, uh, is is he Vlad? Uh, no. Yeah. Oh, is Vladimir. it Vladimir? Uh, mm. Yeah, my full name. Uh, oh. oh, he's there. There we go. Yeah. Hello, Vlad and Artem and John. Can you all hear me? Yes. Cool. All right. I will go in with this icebreaker question for Artem. Um, it's been super great to hear you doing awesome work to try and spread the joy of closure across so many different domains. 
personally, who do you think has been the greatest influence to you as far as sparking your interest in lists and sparking your interest in closure? Was there a talk or a person or a friend um, that kind of inspired you? Mm, I think that's the guy from one of uh, Russian forums, Linux or Gru. And uh, he was, uh, you know, ca- kind of advocate of Lisp. Uh, and uh, it, it, he was a bit, bit toxic guy because he was against uh, this C++ developers and uh, all other developers. But uh, it was fun to read. And uh, I was really um, encouraged by him to learn the functional programming in general and Lisps, uh, uh, common Lisp, eLisp, and then Clojure. Yeah, and how long ago was that? Oh, it was 2008, I think. Uh, it's uh, 13 years ago. Wow, cool. I think we're still having... Oh, Ella, is she there? Looks like she's there. Are you with us, Ella? Oh, we can't hear you, Ella. We have lots of questions for you, Ella. Oh, I've got the camera. Allegedly, but no. Let's turn mute. Let's see if that works. Uh, would you like to ask another question to Artem while we wait? Okay, sure. Um, so recently, uh, kind of big news, the Clojurian Slack has been gifted a sponsorship for a pro membership. Um, you speak a little bit about um, points of contact and accessibility into the community. Uh, do you see this pro membership for the Slack Clojurians being of any of any influence? Um, good, bad? Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that since you've clearly thought about it a lot. <laughs> uh, can you elaborate a bit about this pro membership? Because uh, I'm not familiar with it. Well, the um, the Clojurian Slack channel has, we mm-hmm. were on the free tier previously, and it caused a lot of issues because the uh, uh, chats weren't saved and you couldn't do video, see, you, know, see, yeah. you know, and it just uh, limited. And so it pushed a lot of people to Zulip. It pushed, mm-hmm. kind of divided the community. Um, and you speak how we're not really on Stack Overflow and what a problem that is. Mm-hmm. I see. I see. Uh Personally, I don't think this will um, be. Um, this will increase the ease uh, ease of adoption and of closure for newcomers because it's still the streaming information. This web, this chats, uh, yeah, they can be accessible by searching for some specific items, but they are still hard hard to navigate, and that's why for newcomers, I don't think it will change anything. From my point of view, do you think there is anything we could do to help get that, help connect them with that information? Uh, yeah, as I said in my talk, I think the the most important here is you know to structure the streams of information and to keep them in some place that can be accessible. So this shouldn't be just a stream of messages where you need to navigate and search for something, and you need to find. Uh, specific libraries to find the context of discussion, but maybe adds more structure uh, in in different perspectives like Wikipedia or something like this. Mm. I think this can help for newcomers to navigate in in ecosystem and the whole information. Sure, sure. Um, Let's do a check-in on John and Ella. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, it seems that Ella is still having a few uh, problems, or we're having problems getting Ella. Oh, can oh, we can hear oh, a voice there hear from far away. Oh, uh, let me move my mic closer. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, excellent. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, we're really glad to have us have you here. We've got quite a few questions here. I think you've kind of asked some, you've answered some of the questions initially that we had in your presentation, but let's just quickly recap them. So like those questions around who's the intended users for Vlosier, is it kind of suitable for education kind of thing? And, and also there was a query about whether you've kind of got experience in education and where that kind of, because it's a really, it seems like a really good tool for that. So just wondering where the kind of inspiration for that came from. 
Yeah, so I, I personally don't have much experience in education, um, but I, I am very much uh, hopeful that Lojo can be used as an educational tool. Um, so in addition to be used, uh, to be uh, being used by beginners as an educational tool, um, I also think that Lojer um, will be useful for, for people like me who like who uh, really want to have some convenient way to program on their phone. You know, I, I'd often find myself having like an idea for like a, a generative art piece or something and, you know, being away from my computer and wishing that I could just like pull out my phone and, and sketch something out real quick. Um, so I think that uh, hopefully Lojer as it matures will become a, a pretty powerful way to program from a mobile device. Yeah, I, I think that would be great because I've, I've used Replete and it's a really nice um, mobile app. But then I have to. Re I realize I have to then use a keyboard uh, on my mobile foot device, and it, it's it kind of kills the experience. So I've I've kind of wired up a physical keyboard just so I could use it, and then I think, well, I may as well just be on my computer. Uh, but yeah, that sounds like it's a lot of promise as well. And was was Flojure Script something that was new to you? Did you learn Flojure by using Flojure and developing Flojure, or did you already kind of know Flojure Script? Um, I, I was uh, familiar with uh, Closure before I um, before I started making Closure. Um, I just started kind of learning about lists when the idea of um, of something like Closure came to me. At the same time, I was I was learning Closure Script, and it seemed like a, a perfect um, kind of match for for the idea that I had. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we go back to Jordan? All right. Um, so the the GitHub link has been posted in the relevant channel, um, but I just want to reiterate that Hubert. Um, asked that he'd love to know where the best place to go, who the best person to talk to is. So I'd like to point the audience members, if you'd like to contribute to that, go ahead and check out the links in the GitHub or you can email Artem. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Renzo here who has some better context to ask some of these questions. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to ask Artem about like a couple of tools that you already have in the community and understand if there is a comparison to do or maybe something that you want to grab inspiration from. Um, what I was thinking of is the uh, the Jax Raider. Uh, I don't know if you heard of, of yeah, that. It's, yeah, sure. It's, yeah. Kind of, it's kind of a useful tool um, as the original ThoughtWorks Raider uh, was mm -hmm. for like a more general spectrum of technologies and the Closure Toolbox, uh, which yeah. I'm not sure if it's you know up to date anymore, so you know that might be a problem right there already. Um, so I was thinking, how will this kind of tools integrate in your vision? Uh, um, I was a big fan of Closure Toolbox uh, when I used to be a Closure developer, but uh, uh, it's easy to notice that some of the libraries is outdated. There is a lot of libraries that's not actively maintained on the Closure Toolbox, and it has around uh, 900 libraries compared to 17,000 libraries that we found on GitHub. So ecosystem is much uh, you know larger, I think. And the Trader is a great example of created content. Uh, so. Uh, but um, I can see, you know, um, the place uh, of these tools is an integration. So we can gather all raw information like discussions, like new libraries on a GitHub, like announces. And uh, this raw information can be used later for creating some main lists or adding some, you know, information of, on top of this information. Uh, and create some extra value. So not to spend time on uh, searching the ecosystem and gather the, all this in one place and uh, use it uh, basically as a content creation platform. So content will be gathered by one subsystem and everyone else can add some editorial content on top of this. So that's the vision kind of. <sighs> Thank you. All right on that. Um, so uh, we've uh, been using pretty much uh, the Closure Toolbox site and also uh, searching for GitHub uh, URLs, uh, which is basically the site uh, uh, containing the most uh, information about libraries, not only Closure ones. Um, so uh, to be honest, the Closure Toolbox, uh, personally for me, seems like the huge database with the raw data, as Artem said. Uh, so um, the main goal, I believe, for the closure garden is uh, 
two things basically. Uh, the first one is collect information from uh, different resources, including Closure the Toolbox, GitHub URLs, uh, and other uh, sources, and uh, uh, provide. Uh, the second goal is to provide the ability and the API UI uh, to um, increase the levels uh, of search requests uh, for that library. For example, uh, if we don't want the library name in particular, we can search this library by tags, by uh, the downloads count, uh, by licenses at least. So uh, this, as Artem said, provides us more information, more like meta information of libraries. And this may make uh, customers, users, um, this facilitates uh, choosing between libraries because as this curse says, uh, there are more than one library which solves one problem. Thank you, Vladimir. <laughs> All righty, let's have another question for Ella. Um, so yeah, the question about using uh, Vlozier, um, when you're debugging issues in Vlozier, the, the prime algorithm you fixed was quite quick and simple, um, but I can imagine that a lot of problems are quite hard to spot. Um, is, is there any way to kind of like evolve, like to see the uh, errors or evolve the uh, evaluation exceptions? Yeah, so, so like I mentioned in the talk, that's one big weakness of Lojure right now. There's not really any good way to kind of see the details of an error. It'll kind of give you like a little uh, X in the in the corner, um, you know, if something goes wrong. Um, but uh, that's not very much. You know, that's not very much detail. Um, so that's something that um, I'm, I'm planning to improve on in Lojure. But right now, that it doesn't really have any uh, good debugging tools or way to give you information about errors that occur during runtime. OK, so something to look forward to. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Back to Jordan. Back to Renzo. Back to Renzo, oh, yes. OK, yeah, well, we were waiting for more questions for Artem, but I added a couple myself. So the next question is uh, trying to you know understand a little bit more about fresh code and, and in your project. So it sounds like you are mainly a consultancy, but I just want to double check on that with you. and. Uh, do you have uh, specific ideas on developing your own products? And is this uh, topic in the talk kind of uh, heading in that direction? Uh, yeah, we're a consultancy company and we are doing software development. So basically, uh, uh, like uh, team augmentation. Uh, we, we had an idea, a lot of ideas of building our own products. And as I said in talk, we decided just to go with the community to find out what is really painful. And uh, we figured out that there is no such, you know, maybe we haven't found it. Maybe it exists, but we haven't found it. So, uh, some product idea that can help the community because everyone told about marketing and about popularity of a closure and that's why our product is a bit more in other direction. This closure garden. Alrighty. Um, okay, thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, another question for Ella. I've got one here. Um, yeah, so King was uh, saying that like, drag and drop was not that uh, ergonomic for them uh, so wondering if there was keyboard shortcuts is that something that's in the the roadmap as i as we call it would that be enable somebody to kind of interact differently or is it or is the focus mostly on getting getting the mobile side of things working yeah so so my focus uh so far has mainly been on kind of developing this in like a, a cross-platform way so i'm trying to develop it um, in such a way that uh you know, it'll be just as usable with like a touch screen where you don't have the, the opportunity for keyboard shortcuts. Um, but in the future, you know, there's no reason to not have keyboard shortcuts for the, the desktop version. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm definitely planning uh, on, you know, once I have some uh, other things on, on the roadmap out of the way, I'm adding keyboard shortcuts version. Okay, so keyboard shortcuts uh, on the roadmap mobile obviously is something that I'm looking forward to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We, no, we, nobody will ever hold you to a, a roadmap, uh, not in open source world anyway. Um, yeah, so it'd be great to see it on mobile and yeah, it'd be keyboard shortcuts would be handy. I mean, I, personally, I'd love to see Vim keyboard shortcuts, but I'm Vim keyboard shortcut mad. So uh, yeah, 
Uh, I'm sure there'll be something in there in the future. Thank you very much. Um, we did have a dropout. I hope everybody's still with us uh, in uh, in the conference. But um, uh, I've got a few more questions for Ella. Is there any more questions for um, uh, Artem and team? I mean, I could ask questions, but I do think that there was a lot of interest in Ella's tool. And so maybe we give Artem and Vlad um, a last opportunity to share any more thoughts they have, any any uh, last parting words if they're here. Okay, I guess they're not here. All right. Um, there is another one for uh, Artem in Artem, Discord, okay, um, but if he's not here, I'll ask one to. Oh, Ella. okay. Hey, Edward. I know Edward. Hey. Uh, oh, yeah. There's, so there's questions about trying to understand what the technical stack was. What did you actually use to put Velozia together, Ella? And um, yeah, and, and any kind of things you want to share about the actual workflow to develop Velozia would be quite interesting too. Sure. Okay. So, so uh, Clojure, or sort of Lozure is um, built primarily with Pixie.js, which is a JavaScript graphics library. Um, I also mentioned um, that, you know, it uses Quill for Quill yeah. mode, but for, for the default, you know, um, canvas that the, uh, that Lozure is drawn on, that's using Pixie.js. Um, Quill is great, but Pixie is kind of more fully featured, more, uh, you know, fine-tuned for like production um, quality apps, whereas Quill is more of like kind of a rapid prototyping generative art um, type of library. Um, and aside from that, I'm using um, Shadow CLJS um, for, for development, um, which is really convenient. And other than that, it's just kind of a straightforward um, closure script and Pixie JS app. And great, thank you. All right, we have one to... more question here for Artem. Artem, can you can you speak now? Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. <laughs> So um, Edward said that it occurs to him that while having an internal radar for closure projects, it would be useful in, cur in curating content and there should be a focus on showing up on radar tracks of other communities and domains. He was wondering if Artem had anything to say about the current approach in the closure data science community of a more domain driven approach to try and bring more people into the community by applying the product development tool set that you just described and how Clojure can provide better and more productive tools than currently exists in domains where Clojure isn't typically used? There's a lot in that question. <laughs> mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, uh, first of all, about internal radar of a community. So right now it exists in a different perspective. So there is a Slack announcement, mailing lists, uh, Clojure toolbox, uh, just radar and a lot of source of, of information. So, uh, and uh, the big issue, biggest issue from my point of view is that they're not updating um, um, automatically. So th that's a manual job and uh, manual work of gathering it all together and putting it in place. And regarding the data science, I know there is a lot of efforts uh, that was put some of some guys in the community into this area. They, for popularization, the data science and closure in this domain. But uh, I would say that I would talk to the end users of these platforms, so the, to the real data scientists. And we need to understand the transition costs from the old solution like Python and uh, all infrastructure that already exists to closure. And we need to understand the pain points and if it's possible uh, to find these pain points, maybe uh, there is no way to transfer them from the Python because everybody's using, there's a lot of tutorials and everything, everything, everything. And that's why domain driven, domain specific is interesting, but need to, to go deeper and talk to end users of these solutions. Yeah, that was great. Um, I think we have another question for Ella then. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm quite curious about this myself as well. So what kind of inspired you to create the particular UI design? Was there any kind of prior art that you kind of did that or was it mainly just kind of evolving through uh, your own experimentation? I mean, it, it feels like a very intuitive design. Was this just like really easy and obvious or did it take lots of iterations to do? 
Yeah, well, well, like you said, like I, I think once you once you have that core idea of, of representing um, like lists as circles with smaller circles inside, the rest of Lozier just kind of like writes itself. You know, it, it, that's, that's kind of the, the core idea of Lozier. Um, I think what um, the primary thing that inspired me was actually um, these representations of list programs that were in um, John Koza's book about genetic programming, um, which kind of shows you um, very explicitly the, the kind of tree structure of of list programs, you know, with uh, kind of like a node up top representing your outermost function, and uh, you know, kind of branches down for the the arguments to that function, and um, seeing those diagrams really uh, kind of like made me realize how how simple and elegant list programs are, um, and how amenable they are to to different kinds of like uh, you know visual representations because of the the kind of uh, very simple structure that lists impose on their programs. Um, so I think that was probably one of the main motivations in coming up with the visual style that uh, Lozier uses. Yeah, that's great. I mean, I, I, it just kind of feels like just these nice little touches that just kind of just seem to kind of make sense. It's it's, it's really great. Thank you. Um, okay, we have um, Holy Jack on Discord who asks Artem something like product hunt for closure libs. I think that was a um, add on to his previous answer. Uh, would you like to elaborate on that, Artem? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, it's very similar. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll pick one more question in here. We have a, we have a raised hand, uh, Jordan. Sebastian oh. would like to ask a question live. Well, Sebastian, take it away. Yeah, this is a question for Hello, Ella. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I thought that was a fantastic talk, Ella. And I, I'd be interested to know if you've considered adding support for other lisps, as they all <laughs> share that tree-based structure. Could we do Scheme in, in the web browser with that kind of interface? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, the interface um, that Clojure uses, there's a couple things about it that are sort of specific to, to Clojure, you know, the, the different, you know, octagons for, for vectors and whatnot. But the basic idea could be applied to absolutely any list. Um, and in fact, when I was first um, kind of developing the initial prototype for, for Clojure, I almost um, fell into uh, kind of the trap that uh, Artem mentioned earlier of just sort of building everything from scratch. I almost went with just sort of designing my own uh, kind of like visual lisp, um, but I, I kind of snapped out of it and realized this is going to be way more useful if it's tied to an existing ecosystem. Um, so I chose uh, closure scripts, but uh, the idea of closure could be applied to any other lisp. And I encourage other people to, to make ports uh, to, to whatever other lisp they prefer if they want to. Thank Thanks. you, that's brilliant. Thank you, Sebastian. That was a good question. Yeah. Uh, I think we've got another question for um, or Artem. For Artem. So uh, Ray1729 asks, um, asks Artem, how are you dealing with changes in popularity of libraries over time? For example, a GitHub project might have lots of stars, but no recent usage. Now we haven't thought about uh, we, we thought about this problem, but we don't deal with it. I think a kind of uh, temporal database will solve this. So we can track all the changes and make some uh, uh, understand, make some insights from this data. For, for now, there is no analysis. <laughs> uh, but good question. Yeah, yeah, and I can add that uh, as uh, we use MetaBase, which is pretty fine uh, in terms of visualizing, visualizing data uh, and uh, working with it. Uh, so uh, there are lots of questions which might be in place uh, for different users. For example, one user can ask uh, if this library is um, eligible for him. Uh, other user might use his or her own ranks for library. So that's why actually we use MetaBase in order to provide the experience of asking questions directly to the MetaBase. So that means that uh, we can execute any query uh, in order to extract the uh, most accurate library for each, each specific user. So as per now, um, this question is open for sure, but um, uh, the current state of the project uh, actually allows uh, users to ask such questions. Uh, in future, I believe there would be uh, thoughts uh, for um, like preparing uh, 
prepared questions uh, like that and providing some dashboards uh, as answers to that questions. Uh, there are, uh, there is a lot of work to do. Thank you. Thank you for that response. Um, I'm not sure if we have time to sneak in. I One think more question got, for Ella. Yeah, we've got another little, I think there was also a quick question for Artem about, uh, is there a website for discussing LibRank? I don't know if there's a quick answer for that, so if you can uh, share it. No, uh, it will it will be available on GitHub uh, uh, and the public ro project roadmap. So I will add the link to the Discord. So feel free to watch the rap and uh, contribute. Excellent stuff. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so there's uh, somebody was curious about the uh, so for Ella uh, one final question just before I ask that. Somebody was curious about the book that you mentioned. I wondered if you could share the link with us either in the. Slack uh, uh, in the Discord or the uh, Zoom chat. That would be great. Yeah, I'll, I'll find a link to that. That's um, Genetic Programming by John Koza, but I'll find a link and share it in the Discord yeah. channel. And uh, kind of my final question really is, um, you obviously have a, clear, uh, a flair for creating these engaging creative projects. Have you any thoughts on what you're going to do next or are you kind of mainly focusing on finishing off Lozier? Um, yeah, I'm planning to focus on uh, Blozier for a while. I've got a couple of other projects ongoing, but uh, nothing nothing to speak about publicly at this time. Uh, but yeah, I really want to uh, focus on Blozier and polish it up and get it into like a, a great like kind of web-based cross-platform uh, tool for, for programming in ClojureScript and for like making generative art using Quill Mode. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Now, yes, so uh, thank you everybody for their questions as well. Um, it kept the speakers on their toes, that was great. So we're off into a break, another 30 minute break. Um, so we'll be back just before uh, four o'clock. Actually, I won't be back, uh, but Jordan will be more than capable of taking over and uh, keeping you all motivated with all the speakers. So uh, we shall see you back then. And in the meantime, we'll play some more uh, generative art uh, again in, in silence so you can take a, a nice break to think about the things that we've been covering today thank you everybody
Okay, hopefully we are starting to roll back from the break. Hopefully y'all got some good hammock time in there. So our next guests going to be really fun. We are here to share with us a super special teamwork talk treat. Active members and organizers of the Cyclosh community, Ethan Miller and Sami Kalanen, have collaborated on this talk titled Closure's Emerging Data Ecosystem, where they will show us some of the inspiring ways to leverage different open source libraries while using the REPL to inspect and transform data. Let's check it out. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our talk, Closure's Emerging Data Ecosystem, an incomplete tour at the REPL. My name is Ethan, and I'm here with Sammy. Hi, Sammy. Hey, Ethan. So I'm a full stack developer. I currently work at primary.com, a company that makes uh, bright and simple clothing for children. Uh, I also, in the last few years, have been uh, involved in helping to organize the Cyclosh community, which is a community devoted to improving working with data with closure and um, also educating people about these tools and trying to be as inclusive as possible in terms of getting people involved. Uh, so that's a little bit about me. Sammy, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. So I'm currently also <clears throat> mostly a developer. I work with a company in Sweden called KP System. We develop tools for municipalities, kind of map, map based tools. It's all on closure. I'm also the founder of 8 Chief, which is a consultancy. We do all kinds of things around data. I, I have also been busy with Cyclosh for a couple of years now, helping organize stuff and, and, and things like that. Uh, Ethan, do you want to talk uh, a little bit about the, uh, what we actually want to do today, why we're here actually today? Yeah, our goal today is, is essentially to showcase some of the libraries and emerging data ecosystem for Clojure. Uh, we want to show what it's like to work with them, how they fit together, uh, and give you know a, a sense of what it's like to, to work with data in Clojure. We've called this an incomplete tour at, at the REPL because we aren't you know, by any means showcasing all of the libraries that are available. There's many wonderful libraries that we won't have a chance to work with, uh, but we've tried to select some that are commonly used and, and central to doing data science. Yeah, and, uh, and we're going to do it by actually working with some real data. We'll talk more about it in a second, what it actually entails. But yeah, trying to sit by the REPL, show some libraries and work with some real data. Should we get to it? Yeah, let's jump in. So, so we also already have a, a little bit of a start of a buffer here. I'll just start evaluating. Ethan, feel free to explain a little bit what we're seeing here now. Sure. So what we've got here already is uh, just some setup getting started. We are right off the bat requiring a few libraries. The library here is called NodeSpace. And NodeSpace allows us to work in the buffer, but also, as you can see on the left of the screen, get some sort of visual tools that allow us to look at the data more more conveniently. And uh, we're going to be working with this tool throughout the session today, so you'll become quite familiar with it. Right now, it's, I think you can maybe demonstrate simple form of what it looks like and how it works, right, Sammy? Yeah, so we just have this range then, and immediately after we, we have uh, evaluated it, it, it shows here in the last eval. And actually, when we go here and we save the file, the whole buffer, now we haven't gone through all of this yet, but everything that we have in this buffer here can be seen here now. This is sort of a notebook aspect of node space. Sure. And uh, yeah, so we preloaded the data into the computer here. I load it here. Ethan, you want to say a few words about what we're actually loading in? What is this data with this? Yeah, so this is data that uh, Sammy pulled from the Clojurians Zulip API. It's message data, conversations that uh, the Cyclosh community has had on the Zulip platform. And in its raw form, it's a, a sequence of maps. So we can actually take a look at one of those and look at what's, what, what's inside. You can start to see how the node space context is useful because we have a nice presentation on the left. And what you see there is a map with a bunch of different keywords, and, and this is the data. And we might want to pause here, right, just to talk a little bit about the connect the data to the, the actual UI that we use in Zulip, right? So many people may be familiar with Slack, and Zulip is, is similar, but it has one at least one important difference, which is that within a given channel or stream, as it's called in Zulip, conversations are broken down into middle tier category of topics within which messages occur. So within a stream, you have individual topics, and then the messages and the conversations happen within those topics. And if we look back at the data, we can sort of connect this. What we have here is a single message. This map represents a single message. It's within the stream data science. And the topic is called here a subject. 
you can see that right there. And in this case, this is a message occurring in the set, in the topic, hello. So that's you know that's kind of a, a rough description of the data we're working with here. Right? Sorry if I missed. Maybe you said it already, but the, the message lives here under the content. Key. Right, the message content is there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I did miss that actually. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I think what we want to do is start to explore our data a bit more, and um, yeah, before before we can do that, one thing we may want to do is is think about e extracting some ideas out of the the basic data we have. Uh, so a kind of uh, feature generation. How can we take you know some of the information like the timestamp uh, or, or the content and other pieces of data that we have already and define some other characteristics of each message? Uh, one place to start that's sort of um, straightforward is we have a timestamp, but maybe we can identify uh, other characteristics in terms of time of each message. For example, what hour did it occur? What year? What day? And so on. Uh, and we can use tablecloth to add additional columns to the data set we have already. I believe we can use a emerging library that I've worked on a little bit called Tablecloth Time, you know, which has some convenience functions for modifying dates and extracting components of the time. Uh, so that might be one place to start. And then we can think about other features to work on, like, you know, can we can we extract pieces of information about the content? For example, sentiment. Can we think about how the, the messages are related to each other? Is the next response a rapid response? Is each message part of an active conversation, or is the conversation sort of limping along? That's true, and that fits well in a kind of a larger scenario. Often in data science, you have a few few steps. You start with wrangling, what you were actually describing, the feature generation, wrangling. After that, you explore, you try to learn about the data, and then um, sometimes you continue with, with prediction. And we hope, of course, to show so at least something of all those. Before we do that, is it OK if we just look some very basic data about this data set that we have here now. We can see oh, some, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So tablecloth shape is a nice little utility that so show the um, size of 18, it. 18,000 messages. 18,000 messages and five five keys. Let's look at one of these, one of these, um, let's just look at the first message. Um, yeah, that might be nice if we're just taking the first one. We can, and we can use tablecloth rows to do that, but specify that we want a map instead of a data set row output for convenience. Like this. Now, here we can see the first message. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can parse HTML in our heads. Um, let's also quickly look at uh, what do we want to know? We, we know now that we have 18,000, you said, messages. Let's check the amount of people we have, right? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, how, how many side closure ends do we have? You can pull one of the columns just by using the key that the column is, uh, is, is named by. Then we put it into a set and we, we get a unique number of uh, users and then we count. Yeah, so that's, let's save that. So, we have that. so this is just very basic, basic stuff, of course. But OK, so we know we have 18,000 messages. We have uh, almost 250 users. Um, yeah, we don't know that much more currently, right? Right. Uh, to find out more, to do more exploration, we need to start creating more columns, right? Should we start doing that? Yeah, so uh, now we can maybe think about looking at what it would be like to start uh, adding additional columns to our data set in order, to, in order to build out additional features and characteristics of each message. So uh, one place to start might be to uh, extrapolate uh, some of the features of the time um, so let's let's try to add a column to our data set using tablecloth. And we'll, as you're writing here, we'll use a function called add column. Um, and what we'll, what we can do is let's add a um, uh, we'll, we have a timestamp. Well, let's convert. Let's add a column just for convenience that expresses the the local date time. So this function it takes a data set uh, as its first argument. And one of the nice things here is we can use the uh, the pipe expression. Uh, to, to transform our data set uh, in a series of steps. So, th so in this case, we're using the pipe. And our second argument is the name of the column, just whatever we want to call it. And now the last argument is a function, which will take the data set as an argument. And then what this function needs to do is generate the column data for this new column. So what we need to do here right, is convert our timestamps to local date time. So we can start with a pipe, another pipe inside this function, and we'll, we'll pipe the data set through. And now we want to select the timestamp column. And now uh, we can map over 
the values in this in this column that we've selected. We need to convert our timestamp to local date time. And for that, we can use a function that's in tablecloth time called milliseconds to any time. Do you want to write that out, Sammy? Yeah. In this function, it will work. It takes the time. So in this case, we use our special anonymous function argument value, the percent sign. And then we want to specify what we're converting it to. So let's specify that we're converting it to a local date time. And we can use the keywords to do that. So that, that should do it. Um, yes, but you can you can define these beautiful little tricks because you can define this metadata. And now we have a data set here, uh, if I can spell it. If we're lucky, we, we might see so. Yeah, we are. But we okay. were, we're not so lucky. I mean, 70s was a good uh, good uh, decade, but, <laughs> but it's not when Cyclos started, I'm afraid. Right, so something's wrong with our date time conversion. I think what happened is that our original data, our timestamp, is, is actually in seconds exactly. and not milliseconds. So we need to convert uh, our timestamp before we call the function milliseconds to any time. Multiply, multiply yeah, with uh, now. Now let's try a lock. OK, that looks better, right? Uh, there is something we could do, right? To, to Because one of the secret sources of tablecloth and uh, uh, the ML data set is that it's super efficient and fast, right? That's right. Underneath the hood, even underneath the ML data set, it's, we have a library called dtype next, which allows us to very efficiently operate on typed data. So because dtype next knows the type of things, uh, it can, it can um, operate very efficiently. And it gives us also some other functions that allow us to do things like mapping very well. So here we've used the regular closure function map, which works, uh, but we end up with a, a column that doesn't, we don't know the type of it. And so that you can get a performance hit. So what we'll use is a function called emap, which allows us to do mappings, but doing it in a way that stays within this world of typed entities. So what we'll do is um, specify here that we're working with an int, an int 64, that there. In our next step, we actually convert a number, an integer, to uh, a local date time, which is a type of entity. And so we'll specify that that's what we're going to get in this um, as a result of that. So that we're not going to see any results in the data, but this is the correct way and more efficient way uh, to process to you know to map over a column and to do column transformations. And you know, I have to say, I, I worked a lot with deep deep. Uh, deployer in R, and th there are some similarities to R. is a very sort of ergonomic language, especially the tidyverse uh, aspect of it, and and it has also a pipe, and it, it's it's very intuitive and easy to reason about. But I have to say, this is it's actually nicer and cleaner, and it, it's super nice to write, and it's well. What what do you think? Yeah, I agree. This is uh, really fundamental, as we know, the arrow macro is fundamental to the closure language, and here we just can take advantage of it to do the kind of very uh, readable transformations of data where you're kind of layering on more and more information uh, that's related in a way that continues to be extremely readable. Uh, so I, yeah, I really love it. Yeah. OK, so next what we'll do now, because this takes time, and, and even though we, we tried to get an even longer slot, the organizers <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't accept that. So we have to stay within 40 minutes. So a bit like in a cooking show, you know, no, most cooking shows, you don't have to look at the oven for, for an hour or one and a half hours to, to see how it. So we, we're going to spare you that part. But we're going to generate some more features. Yes, exactly. And voila, we are ready. So <laughs> <laughs> fast coders, huh? if you if you need to hire some fast coders, uh, you can find two here. Isna, do you want to sort of start um, describing a little bit more on a high level what, what all this is? Um, yes, this right. So a second ago, we created one single date time column, as you can see on the top. And then we started to derive other features, uh, partly from that, and then a whole bunch of other features, as you can see. Each of these calls is simply an add column call that is it's the same pipe. We're piping the data set through and just adding column after column. So it's a lot, but it's, it's actually really easy to understand. There's not you know sort of a lot of ins and outs. So we can look. Uh, we've, we've packed this new data set we've created with all these columns into a new variable called message with features. And we can look at what our column names are. And generally speaking, we have three. We added three types of features. One we already alluded to, which is we were, you know, creating we created a date time, and then we thought we could pull out additional time components that might be useful features to explore the data by. Another broad category that we've added are what you could describe as features that capture the flow of the conversation. So one of the things we're interested in is, you know, how active is a conversation. So we've added a bunch of different columns here. One of them, for example, is the next response time. So this is if I wrote a message, what was the 
time, how quickly did the person who wrote after, if somebody did, how, how, what is the time that it took them to respond? So it, it gives us a measure of how quickly people are responding to a given message. And from there, we've, and some other columns, we've defined a notion of activeness. Uh, so that's another broad category of features we added. And then finally, uh, Sammy generated some really lovely um, measures of sentiment based on the message content. So these are different types of sentiment, trust, surprise, joy, positivity, negativity, and so on. So yeah, we have a bunch of new features here that are all derived from our initial data that may um, be very interesting to explore and look into. And that's what we're going to do as we move forward. What do we do next? Next week, now we have a kind of, we've been, we've been wrangling and feature engineering, this kind of stuff. And next we want to start to explore this stuff. But uh, I might have to go and sleep in between. It's, it's late, right. late it's here. Right in. <laughs> but I do, I do it quickly. I promise I do it very, very quickly. Is that okay? That's fine. <laughs> okay. I'll, sleep, I'll, see you, I'll see you in the morning. Okay. So I'm back. I've slept. Uh, Good. I haven't yet. <laughs> no, this this is this is the fun of working in a community like this because now it's kind of a nice Sunday morning here. Um, I'm refreshed. I almost finished the whole pan of coffee. <laughs> but what <laughs> what is it there? You're in close to Seattle, right? Yeah, it's midnight. It's midnight. Oh, so I need to go to bed. But let's do a little bit now. Um, yes. And then we continue on your morning again and my evening, <laughs> right? Exactly. It's kind of a, yes. like a relay race. Now we want to do some exploration. Yeah, so we'll look at, we'll continue to use tablecloth and tablecloth time, which is a kind of extension uh, of the idea of tablecloth, would provide some additional utilities for thinking about time. Uh, and then this new library, VizCLJ, uh, by Shima Panjawani that gives us a very simple way of uh, generating plots. So, so this is a library, right? That uh, I'll, I'll require them now here first, so we can use them. So the stack is that we're we are actually utilizing Vega Vega Lite, and then there's this beautiful um, library called Hanami, which is a templating engine for Vega Lite in Enclosure, which is super powerful. And then this last library that you've been discussing is built on top of that. It just makes sort of quick uh, plotting. Uh, easy, right? That's kind of the value prop of that. Yeah, and you can see a similar pattern here to the uh, to tablecloth and, and all the things that are underneath it. So underneath tablecloth, we have TechML dataset, and underneath TechML dataset, we have dtype next. These things kind of uh, become lower and lower level as you go down, but at the top, there's this you know the simplest possible API, uh, and this is sort of the equivalent. It's like a, a similar stack, but for visualization. Yeah, and I, I just pasted in a very simple. Random random numbers data set nice. be generated here and, and just to show how it works. First we need to declare uh, if I can type one thing, Sammy, quickly, maybe we should increase the font. Oh. The first thing we need to do is we need to format the data so so this uh, CLJ uh, can deal with it. And then this is kind of the minimum uh, to get something vis visible if we're we're lucky here. And then the next thing we need to do is decide the plot right, the plot type. You can see here, that's why we got this. We required something from the Hanami also, because there's some nice templates, ready-made templates already. But let's just take a basic um, point chart is probably the most basic thing we can do here. So when we call the viz function here, it's going to generate the plot, actually. Yeah, if you're lucky. Yeah. If we're lucky, yeah. <laughs> let's do some real, let's start looking at the data, right? Um, oh, we did all this preparation work, but we haven't, we haven't, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Just little intervention here. Now it's like, what time is it there? One, almost 1 a.m. <laughs> you need to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, all right. But luckily, you don't sleep very long in, in Seattle either. So I'll see exactly. you in just a minute, right? OK, so welcome back, Ethan. Have you have you slept? Did you sleep? Yep, very well. Thank you. you. Very well. Good, good. Um, so you're refreshed. I'm, I'm not so much. Reasonably. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's good. We did quite some work, actually, there last uh, uh, this morning, last night for you. Yeah, we were not focused. So we decided we, we'll, we'll rewind a little bit back, right? And, and right. We, we do it again. What, what do we have in mind? What do we want to do next? Yeah, so maybe we could look at the, the message volume over time. Um, yeah, so what we'll do, one of the things, one of the concepts in tablecloth time, if you have a data set, you would set one of the columns as the index. So we'll set the date time column as an index. And then what we can do is modify the, the frequency of this and look at the results. So we can use a, a, a function called adjust frequency that allows us to modify the time series uh, by different sort of groupings. So we, we can start with, let's say, maybe even hours. 
So what we're doing here is we're saying, okay, we have a time series. Let's kind of summarize it on the hour interval step. And then we just want to do some sort of aggregation. And this and essentially what we're doing is just counting the number of messages at this frequency. Here we're using tablecots row count as our aggregation function. So you can see that these libraries uh, are designed to work with each other. Uh, and then, yeah, one final step here we have to do before we actually uh, use VisCLJ to visualize, we need to adjust our, so we can just use a simple operation statement to, to do that. We'll take the partial of um, a map and uh, that should allow us to convert the column. And then- Oh, I, 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 this needs to be a map, sorry about that. Yes, that's right. Now, yeah. There we go. So now we have our aggregations, yeah. Yeah, yeah and then we can plot this. This time we'll, we can use a line chart. So we'll specify that we want to use uh, the Hanami line chart template. And uh, and then we can uh, add some color. So we'll just call viz color and then specify that we want to use the year. Oh, and then we also need to specify what our X and Y are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So in this case, our X axis will be the time column, or the date time column, rather. Yes. Great. And with any luck, if we add the viz viz on the end there. No. What? Oh, no. <laughs> so. Oh, I, I think, think we need to specify that the daytime is a temporal yeah. value. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now. Right. Wow. So this is kind of interesting because uh, we don't see a lot of shape. We kind of get a sense of the volume. One, one thing that might help would be to kind of, you know, to look at things at a higher resolution of time. So we could increase our frequency to, say, uh, days. Oh, okay. so we're starting to see a little bit of a line there. Let's maybe even move out further. Weeks, yeah, we can do weeks, ends. Yeah. <laughs> and then feels maybe good. even one more. It does feel good. It feels like we're getting up. It's like things going from being out of focus to in focus. Okay. And now now we, yeah, that's cool. So there's kind of one a big peak per sort of year. On 2020, the peak was early in the year. Usually it's around this time. It's, it's actually a lot of work to format the data to get the plots to change the sort of resolution and everything. That's, that's super, super handy. What should we do next? A different plot where we just look at these lines. We can look at the, the, those lines superimposed on each other. And you know, we've kind of pre-prepared that plot here. Yeah, this is interesting. They Very similar. Pretty, pretty similar, yeah. This kind of highlights that, that peak in uh, March, April of 2020 is a little bit unusual because both the 2019 and 21 are sort of onto the decline after March yeah. into the summer month. So that's interesting. We did that year, of course, we had our first cyclos conference in Berlin, Energy, but also that was the start of COVID. So, and, and as I recall, there was some interest in, in talking about the data associated with COVID. That makes sense. It also looks like the summer months, there's always a kind of a slump there. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. that's good. Okay, what next? We were talking about how hopefully at the end we will have time to do some modeling. To do that, it's kind of good practice when you do analysis to split your data into groups. Yeah, so when you, in preparation for doing some sort of machine learning, you need to do a, a split often of your data into a, a testing set, or sorry, a training set, which you use to train your model, and then a test where you, uh, you know, you test whether or not your model is predicting the values in the test set very well. Yeah. So uh, split the data here, right? And how does it look? Next response time is the time until the next person responded. So it's a kind of measure of, of activity. Here, we're doing a histogram to show the distribution of those values. In the, and we can see that it's quite skewed. Probably we can get a better representation of the, of the actual distribution by normalizing these uh, next response times by taking the log. And that's what we'll do here, right? Yeah, let's 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 do that. But before we do, uh, let's just give a shout out to this. Uh, it's also Chris's library called TechViz. Uh, thank you. Um, that we're now using. It's also using Vega in this case to to build this histogram. But it's kind of nice. But now we're using this hiccup thing uh, Ethan was mentioning before and placing these next to each other. Yeah, it makes more sense now. It looks. It doesn't exactly look like a, like a Gaussian curve, but much closer. Next, we could do some more exploration of our, our uh, other features. Exactly. So, so we are interested in the. Let me zoom in a bit, little bit. So, what's going on here, actually? Okay, so we've got in our x column in this first plot and the, the feature that we're interested in looking at, and then we're plotting it against the median res next response time. Kind of some uh, aggregation that is showing us for the year of 2019 what was the average response to each message. Mm -hmm. And we can see there's quite a big difference uh, in, in the median response time, which is to say an increase in, in active dynamic conversation. Joy, what can we say about That's interesting. joy? We see a little bit of correlation between a more joyful sentiment and, the, and, a, and a quicker response. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, this one's interesting. <laughs> joy, joy is good, but 
positive with positivity. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. It's interesting. Don't don't be too positive. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of boring. You won't get a response. <laughs> yeah, you could imagine if somebody's very angry, you want to stay away. That that's intuitive. Yeah, yeah. yeah here we have the different streams. So yeah. there are yeah there are differences in the different discussion themes. But okay, if you summarize this, we, we try to look and find some patterns. It kind of looks, yeah, we, we, do, we do get some insights by this. And there is some connection. It looks like there are some relationships in, in the data, especially in relation to this notion of activeness. Maybe we have a chance of uh, modeling something successfully. That's yeah, right. so we, we were doing some more exploration and we found uh, a, a plot that, that looks really promising in terms of thinking about uh, how we might start modeling things. And it's based on what we, the plots we were looking at. Before. What we found here is uh, that if we look at the next response time as a relationship to the re response time of the message that we're, that, that, that initiates the, the following response time, in other words, if I write a message quickly in response to something else, how likely am I to get a quick response? It's kind of tilted to the right. And so we have a, a kind of linear, what looks like maybe a linear relationship. It's so the kind of thing that we could model with some sort of linear regression. Yeah. One curious thing to note on this graph is that odd line across the top where it looks like, you know, there's kind of a hat on the data. And that's actually what there is. We put a cap on the longer response times because they there are some outliers. They're relatively infrequent compared to the mass of the data. But this allows us, it's, it's like the log. It's a way for us to kind of remove some data point from consideration uh, in, in order to get a better result. The response time is an interesting variable. Let's, let's try this, um, look at the correlation between those two as well. So yeah, we, we see ahead. a relationship in the, in the graph, but we could also measure that uh, relationship with uh, statistically uh, using um, a library called FastMath, uh, which is um, also by the same author of Tablecloth. And here we're using a, a function called correlation that gives us what, what's also known as the R value, which is a value that has uh, this is sort of a range between negative one and one. And when it's negative one, it's a perfect non-negative correlation. Uh, and when it's positive one, it's a per perfect positive correlation. And and uh, and so if we run this statistical measure on the these two the, you know these two variables, we get a, a kind of you know some kind of uh, relationship. It's it's not a perfect one, and we wouldn't want that actually. Uh, but it's um, but it's, you know, it's 0.5. So it's, it, it, there's some, some correlation there. And, and this means that we may be able to, um, see a result if we try to model, um, uh, generate a model that can, uh, predict the next response time as a, as a, from the response time of the, um, the message, the current message. So let's go with the, um, linear regression because response time is, a it's a continuous variable. So then we'll, we'll, we'll do, we go with, um, linear regression for that. We're going to use a tool here called uh, Cycloge ML. Um, maybe you, uh, Ethan, want to talk about that? And I'll start typing one of these pipelines that you're going to explain how it works. But uh, there's this bit of typing there. So I start, I go ahead already and start some. But yeah, what is uh, Cycloge ML? Cycloge ML is a library by Karsten Baring, and it defines some useful concepts for running models uh, um, and defining kind of pipelines. And the pipeline here, so Sammy's defined a pipe called regression pipe, and then he's calling a function from CycloGML called pipeline. And this pipeline function is roughly analogous to the arrow macro in that within the pipeline, we can describe a series of transformations. Um, and, and the first transformation that Sammy's adding is we're not using the TC alias, uh, which was what we used when we were using tablecloth, but we're using MM, which is one of CycloGML's namespaces. And these functions have just been modified to essentially do the same thing. But instead of receiving a data set as their first argument, they receive what we call a context. And we'll explain what that is in a second. Uh, but for the moment, we can just think about this, as, you know, essentially the same kind of call that we saw before. Uh, we And so here we're adding two columns, then we're going to select these columns, uh, because that's the only data that we want to feed to our model, which is the end of this transformation. Okay, so now we've selected the columns that we're going to feed to our model, but we need to prepare the the data set so that the model can know what we think we're trying to predict. Um, so we set the inference target to the log next response time, which is what we're trying to predict. Now here we're adding a kind of special value and it looks like a map. And all we're doing here essentially is saying this keyword model is what we're going to use to look up our results later. And then in our final step, we declare what it is that, that we're going to model with. And we're going to model with the uh, ordinary least square model, which is a linear regression. And um, you should note that also these models that we're using 
come from Java. So one of the things CycloGML does, in addition to giving us the notion of a pipeline, is it allows us to use models that have been defined in this library Smile, uh, which offers a whole lot of different um, modeling tools. Now here, what Sammy's just pasted in is a really important step. OK, so now now that we are missing, oh, we need the percentage. I need to be awake. Uh, I'm. I'm focusing more on typing than thinking, but it doesn't help my typing apparently. Yeah, so that's what we did here is we actually we ran this transformation. But let's look a little bit quickly at what it is we actually did there. What we did was we, we def in our first step, we defined our pipe. In the second line, we defined a variable regression trained context one. We used our pipeline as a function and we provided it what, with what is called a context. And this context is just a map. It's a map that expects specific, some specific keys. And in this case, it expects, you can see, metamorph data. And that's how we give it our data set. And then we also specify the mode. We say that at this point, because we're training our model, we're trying to fit the data, the model to the data. When we call the pipe regression pipe this first time, we call it in the mode fit. So that's how we use a pipeline. And, um, We've evaluated it, and now we can use that model keyword that we specified in the pipeline to pull out the model from our trained context. And we can use this explain function to look at the coefficients of our linear, the resulting linear regression. You can see on the left in the node space that this is a, our model has a bias of 1.72 coefficients for the log response time of 0.47. So that looks like a linear regression. And so now we, what we want to do is examine how effective our model is in predicting. So we will now run our pipeline one more time, but this time we're gonna run run it with a different context. So if we look at our uh, what we've done there, we've called the same pipe on our, but this time we're providing it with a modified uh, context. We take the trained context from before, we overwrite the, the metamorph data, we overwrite the data set with our test data, and then we change the mode to transform, which is the predicting mode. And so when we run this, we end up with some predictions. And we can actually look at what those are. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. This is, uh, OK. Yeah, so here we can see the result of our, our transform run. So we have our a series of log response times and then the predicted value of the next response time. And now uh, we can, you know, we can, we can, because we have the actual values and the predicted, we can, we can score this. Uh, and, and uh, yeah, so now we have a big bunch of code that we've pre-written that will generate uh, scores, uh, uh, various measures for scoring the data. Like that. Wow, fantastic. <laughs> we got there. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So I don't know, Sammy, do you want to explain these different measures? The long and short of it is that this doesn't look very good. Um, so a right. good good model, if you look at the R, R squared uh, numbers, a good model should be close to one or sort of a, like a percentage of how, how big part of the variance is explained. OK, so here we have for the R squared for the logs, 0.28. It's still not uh, very which good. Which is not good. And then for the R squared of the actual values, when we're trying to actually predict the, the response time in seconds uh, with outside of the log, it's point negative point zero four two, so it's it's pretty bad. Yeah, uh, yeah. it looks like um, <laughs> fail. So this was a fail, but no, it's not a fail. We, we we learned something. We were seeing some possible correlations that, that we could use for prediction, but it didn't turn out. We would have to work more on it, but maybe we'll do. I mean, this was the process, but you can use this process for for. Mm, uh, more or less any any model um it's quite standardized so let, let's let's do that logistic one so now we now we have we talk about times length in seconds but we have already done the categorization of of the results as active or non-active and that's of course based on a heuristic that we decided uh, that a certain yeah. amount of seconds uh is 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 fast and and active and after that it's not but let's try that maybe we can get better results there because my intuition is that it, it the problem here is that the um, with the long response times it really breaks the linearity and the, the distribution that we need to be able to use. Um, is, is it okay if we jump to the classification part? And now I'm not going to bore people with typing everything. I'll just copy paste these models um, if that's okay. All right. So we're going to use more pipelines. We're going to define a different pipeline, and this time we'll define a, a classification pipeline. And the model we're going to use, as you can see at the bottom, is a is a logistic regression. So and, it, and then maybe the other interesting thing here is that instead of using the uh, next response time as our inference target, we're going to use this column called active that we defined. 
which labels each message as whether or not it's part of an active conversation. We've now trained and then run our test of our classification pipeline. Okay, so now we have a new we have a new function that allows us to to score the the uh, the classification pipeline. And here we're kind of interested in the accuracy. How often did the pipeline did the model you know correctly predict whether or not the conversation is active or not? And so this uh, this uh, this time and also. Previously, these these are just kind of convenience functions, so we we can get all the all the numbers of the measures into into one ni nice map like this. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's so here we have a confusion matrix showing where where we had to, you know the kind of relationship, and then our accuracy measure. Which uh, how would you evaluate that, Sammy? Let's just start by saying that this looks much better. Um, yeah. It's interesting. This uh, confusion matrix is also. Um, Interesting. So let's look at that a little bit. So the false, false, and the true, true are the ones that we uh, are correct ones. They are mm -hmm. the accurate ones. And then we have the um, false positive and false negatives there. And there's there a fair amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's still not. I mean, the accuracy. If we would have in the nineties, I would be um, very happy, blown away. <laughs> but uh, but especially considering that we didn't get much out of the linear regression. I'm pretty happy with this, uh, this yeah. current, considering we, that, that we didn't spend a lot of time on doing this, but what we would could do still, uh, if that's okay, Ethan, we, because now we're just using one, um, uh, variable, one column or feature to, to do the, to feed into the model. Um, so we're not using all the knowledge we have about the message messages to, right. to inform the, the model. So let's try that still. Now, instead of just the log response time, now we're adding a lot of these different features in the hope that that will increase it uh, into something more, more interesting. Maybe there's not so much. This is more or less the same. We're using a kind of a helper function here. One hot coding, that's dummy variables where you change categorical uh, var uh, variables into ones and zeros, but we don't need to go into that in this this presentation so much. But otherwise, it's pretty much the same, right, Ethan? Yeah, same basic structure. We've just added some additional columns and transformations that's necessary for them to be understood by the model. And now we do the training the training part, and I'll do mm -hmm. a little and bit more the test. test part. Uh, yeah, and now we want to see some uh, results. Yeah, so we can call the same helper function we have to score this model. Okay, so now we actually, yeah, is this okay? Because doesn't it look exactly the same? But okay, if they weren't the same, it. it Want to run that one again? Let me see. Yeah, I'll take them here. So I see that I'm. So we have the context one here. So that's 73. No, they're not exactly. No, it's not the same. They're just, they're, we're not seeing any oh, improvement. No, we're not seeing any improvement. Actually, it's, yeah, they're very close. So, uh, so our feature, our all hard, hard feature engineering work didn't help us much. It, it, so the result here is actually that we have one variable so far that actually predicts the activity in, or the, yeah, the active, active discussions. And it's the, how fast you, you reply. That's, that's the sort of domain level conclusion of this. Um, so far, um, I'm sure we would find much more if we would spend more time on it and dig deeper, and maybe we will. This is this is pretty interesting, and this tool is quite amazing, actually. If you if you look at how you can how elegantly the the, the pipeline is 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 built, and yeah. uh, how you can I like this a lot, actually. This is uh, this is super nice. Um, there are maybe it's not for this talk, but there are a lot of advantages which has to do with if you want to generate. Programmatically, a lot of models and compare these models and collecting statistics of these models and and using them, which when you when you start to do real heavy duty modeling, that's that's worth that's a lot. Right. Yeah, yeah. So um, this was it, and um, it was a nice, super nice journey. We should mention that um, uh, this material was prepared in cooperation with Daniel Slutsky, who also had a workshop. So if you're interested in going a bit more detail into uh, into most of the code that we use today as well, it's it's in that workshop. Um, yeah, and here's a list of the um, libraries that we used. Uh, please uh, research, have a look at them. They are fantastic and the people uh, behind them are fantastic and we're very thankful for all the effort they did. They made this journey that we presented today possible. I should add that what is 
worth stressing here is the simplicity of this approach and the functional op- approach, uh, which matters a lot here. There were some details that we skipped in the, during the, the baking phase when the, we had the code in the oven, so to say, that require looking into the data and at different levels of granularity, grouping, ungrouping, things that you in the workflow of a data scientist do all the time. And what closure and tablecloth does is that it makes it very easy, which is not obvious at all in other platforms. But also, let me add that this is a constantly evolving ecosystem. People are working on these and um, uh, yeah, we're always looking for more people to help. Help can be come in the form of writing a library, but even more so to organize things, to work on the website, to do all the other kinds of stuff that is necessary for, for this kind of project. So if you're curious about data science, if you're curious about these tools, Please join us. Um, Zulip, as we have seen, is the main main place where we meet. Um, Here also is a, a link for uh, with a repository that has all this code. So if you would like to dig in more deeply, uh, look at some of the, uh, the the code, play around with it, and possibly even run a model that uh, predicts better than ours, that would be great. <laughs> That's not possible. We, we... <laughs> we did work hard. <laughs> we worked hard. Okay. Thank you, everyone. This was a blast. Thank Bye-bye. you. All right, awesome. Thank you so much to Sami and Ethan for this really engaging and enlightening video. So we are going to do a super quick five minute break where you can use the bathroom, get coffee, think of questions, please post them in the channel where it says uh, QA for Ethan and Sami. You can also post them in the Zoom chat or just raise your hand when the time comes. After the break, we will see one more talk from our friend Zhao. And then we'll loop back around for questions with Ethan, Sammy, and Zhao. All right, folks, we will see you soon.
All right. Hopefully we are getting people coming back from their potty break, getting their coffee, getting excited for this next talk, because I think we are just in time for our next speaker, Zhao Santiago. Santiago is a bicycle riding, machine learning loving data scientist who will share his thoughts on the nuance of feature development using Clojure and how to manage data in production systems. Enjoy his talk and his demo. So hi everyone. Um, my name is João Santiago or just Santiago for short. I hope everyone is having a blast in the conference. Uh, there's some really cool talks in the lineup. I'm personally super excited to be here with you today to talk about just-in-time features, also called on-demand features for machine learning models and exploring a bit why I think closure and um, just-in-time features are a match made in heaven that we are not exploring enough. Um, these days, I work myself as a data scientist. I'm leading the anti-fraud unit uh, in a company called Billy. We are a fintech based in Berlin, mostly focused on um, buy now, pay later solutions for B2B online shops. We had a really nice Series C funding round um, in the past months. And actually, we are hiring. So if you're looking for a, a new closure challenge, either look at the link or get in touch with me. Um, so we, at Billy, we started to feel that uh, our deployments for machine learning um, were not as smooth as they could be. And a big chunk of this issue was related to feature engineering, right? So my whole point in this talk is to say that feature engineering as closure is a match made in heaven, but what does this mean? Um, we'll start with defining what feature engineering means in the context of this talk, because different people may have um, different perceptions or notions of what this term entails. We will look at um, a higher level architecture of how this is um, dealt with in the real world, some examples of possible solutions, and then have a little demo in the end um, of Bulgogi, which is a prototype I've been working on specifically to address the concerns we'll be exploring during the talk. So let's start with feature engineering. What does that mean? Let's imagine because we are, um, I mean, the fraud department, I need to make an anti-fraud model, right? So let's say that these are transactions coming in from some online shop. Uh, usually we will have data that looks like this. We have an email from the buyer, an amount, um, a timestamp, and a couple other things. Now our job is to figure out if this is fraud or not. We cannot simply send this into a machine learning model. The reason being that most models don't handle strings well, don't handle complex data like this. They much rather prefer to work with um, just integers, just numbers in general. So we need to go from this into a numeric representation of this data. And that's what is meant by feature engineering. It's to go from raw data, pass it through some process that engineers these features and then feeds the data to a machine learning model. In this case, let's imagine that we know from experience or from research that um, the number of digits in an email and how long an email is, an email name, is, is predictive of uh, fraudulent behavior. So this is a closure conference, so we could write this in closure as two simple um, functions, right? We can just apply them in order in parallel, doesn't really matter. The point is we need to map these two functions into this data so that we get these two features. So out of this feature engineering process, we could get something that looks like this. Let's imagine we are using the number of digits, the number of characters, and the amount of the order itself. Here, the important distinction to make in the context of what I'm talking today is what is then just-in-time features, right? Here, just-in-time features are only number of digits and number of characters. Why? Because they are calculated right before we send the data to the model. We didn't do anything to, to the amount, right? It's already a number, so we don't need to change its nature, its type, before sending it 
into the prediction um, engine. So we send this data into the model and out comes an actual prediction that could look like this. We could say it's fraud and some probability or some score um, that defines how we got to that classification. This is the general concept and is, is this frame of thinking that I'll be always having in mind when we see feature engineering throughout the talk. So how does this look in a real world context? It could look a bit like this. Usually you have a development environment and an actual production environment where the model runs. The development environment could be, you know, you have a database, you have a CSV file, you have some sort of data you want to use. You may need to do a couple of other steps, hence the, the dot, dot, dot in the middle between the actual data and the feature engineering, like, I don't know, joining some other data to the data you are interested in. Uh, need, maybe you need to massage the data to having a certain structure or a certain format. But at the end of the day, you always need to go through the same process as I've shown you before. You need to turn any data that is not numeric into something that the model can understand. And maybe you even, it's not about being numeric, you may even need to change numerical values into something else, like saying, I want the average, or I want the, the difference between the current order and the previous order. It's still a numerical ca calculation, but it's something you can only do just in time, right before you send data into a model, because you are dependent on data that you, are, you don't have um, during the production of it, right? So when you are producing the data, just an example, let's say we have our little ninja here that's trying to get some stuff online for free, and they produce this um, data in the front end, for example, right? They write their email, they select some item to buy. Um, the important thing to remember here is that ideally in a data science context or world, this data that is produced by the user will then be saved to the database exactly. Um, which means whatever you do in training in the above row in development, so going from this to the numerical uh, representation we spoke on, I spoke about before, you will need to do that too in production. So you'll have a system that more or less looks like this. You're doing exactly the same types of transformations above. So in this case, it could be calculating the number of digits, calculating the number of characters, and then feeding it onto the model. This is the crux of the problem um, that I want you to keep in your mind today, is that these two things are coupled together. They need to be deployed together. Any change you do in your development environment to how you calculate features, or how or which features you use even, you need to replicate that in production every single time. So how do people usually deal with, um, with this? In the data science world, R and Python are the most commonly used languages. I personally use R, but there's also colleagues in my company that use Python. And um, how this usually goes is those two things, feature engineering and an actual model are coupled together in an object, um, which are most commonly called pipelines. Uh, R, the tidy models framework calls these workflows, but the idea is essentially the same. You have an object that receives some new data as input, makes it go through all of these steps of feature engineering, and finally applies the model to the final data. You can, of course, build your own solution for this, which is um, what we've done at Billy. We don't use an object per se, we have things separate to keep things slightly easier to manage and reusable. Now, the thing with Python and R is that they're both not the fastest languages around. They are single threaded, so doing things concurrently is awkward or not great at best. And if you are writing code in R, it's not easy to reuse it in Python. You always need to translate it somehow. So it's not great when you work in a polyglot organization, such as my case. Um, other companies or other teams use something called Spark. I mean, there's, of course, other options to do this. Spark is just one of the most known. It's um, originally a successor to Hadoop MapReduce. So it's 
meant mostly for large batch jobs, uh, although it can also do streaming and it can do real-time computations. So it's a really, really great tool. You have massive amounts of data that you want to crunch at the same time. Um, but in my opinion, this is the case I'm making here. It's a bit overkill for a very simple transactional use case. Because remember, our ninja, when he's placing an order, is not producing a stream of continuous stream of data. It's, it's, it's actually looking at a spinner waiting to know if the order was approved or not. So the cost of adding new concepts to learn for your team and added complexity such as um, so Spark is this cluster, which is something you have to now deal with that is completely orthogonal to your problem. There's a new language, you know, some companies rewrite some of the stuff that the scientists do in Scala just so they can use Spark. Yes, Spark has APIs for Java, for Python, for R, but again, you have this cost of translation between um, the language of implementation of Spark, which is Scala, and the actual languages that data scientists use. And in the end, it's just added cost, not, not just in terms of having a team to manage this, but also the infrastructure needs to be adapted, adapted. On top of this, some companies add Kafka to make it make everything work on streams. And now, in my opinion, you're really going with a full bazooka into a problem that seemed very simple some time ago. So my question is, why not keep this simple, especially if you already have um, good engineers in your in your company or in your team that use Clojure, why not just use Clojure? And by Clojure, I don't mean re-implementing the idea of a pipeline or of this object in Clojure. I mean simply using the structures that Clojure already give you. So how do we actually keep it simple? I think um, the main goals here are threefold. We should use what we know. We don't want to have some big piece of technology that we now we need to learn and manage. Uh, the number of moving parts should be as low as possible to keep the whole system simple and understandable for everyone. And obviously the main, main goal is to decouple feature engineering from the actual models. And we want to do this so that deployments are independent and make the feature engineering bit more reusable, not only across deployments, but also across teams. So if I write something, for example, the number of digits in an email feature, and now another team also needs that feature, they can just use this new system to get that feature without having to worry about implementation details or uh, rewriting it again in another language they want to use. So how can we do this? And First, let's look at the architecture, and this is what my goal is or what I came up with. Simply centralizing the feature engineering process. So we, we are very much into the whole microservice architecture. So this could be just another microservice in your, um, in your global ecosystem. Now, this is nice because suddenly all the features in the company or in all your teams can be placed in a single spot. So if you make a new project and you're thinking, hmm, did someone else create the number of digits in an email feature? You just go into this centralized repository or centralized service and you see, is the feature there? If it is, you can just ask for it. So it should be seen as a buffet of features. All of the features are available there. You just go in and pick what you choose. In this sense, that means providing some data and providing a vector or an array of feature names that you need to be used. Um, and then just expect the system to map the features over the data. Simple as that. Another cool thing we can do here is then asynchronously, because there's no latency um, constraints when saving the actual data, we want to be as fast as possible responding to the, um, um, to the model and to the user, because remember the user is most likely seeing a spinner this whole time. So we want to be very fast. But then we have all the time in the world once things are calculated to store the results into a database. And the cool, cool uh, consequence of this is that if you have all your features calculated, you don't need to do this again. You don't need to transform the data again whenever you want to train your model in, um, in development. 
right? Because you just you can go to this database and just say, give me features A, B, C, D in this time, time span. And you can directly feed this into your model to train it. And usually this type of um, speciality database is called a feature store. I would really invite everyone to read more about it. It's a very cool concept uh, for productionizing machine learning and for uh, scaling up machine learning in organizations. And this is just one bit. I just called it Bulgogi. Um, it could be called something else. It can be done in different ways. Other companies come up, came up with different ways of doing this. I simply feel the closure method um, is not only simple, it's also elegant and makes it very easy to um, scale out and cre add, create additions to the system. So let's actually look at some code. So I have my editor here, the REPL is already loaded. I'm just gonna make sure everything is in my buffer, so all my functions. And right now, Bulgogi is a single Babashka script. This is how simple you can do this in Clojure. And one of the main arguments, I think, for using Clojure for this use case, the amount of boilerplate is pretty much next to none. I imagine this will grow as we add more features, such as maybe some metadata, maybe some spec to uh, validate, um, validate features and add test cases. But in general, you're just writing closure, you're not doing anything that's alien. So let's take a look here. We can already find that, see that like we saw in the first slides in this talk, features are just functions in closure. They are pure functions most of the time, um, but I would recommend to keep them pure so that they are transparent and you can just say, this function is the number of digits in the email. So you see, there's nothing very special about it. It just takes um, a map. So all of the features in Bulgogi take a map as input so that they, are, they are, have the task of choosing which data they will take from this map, um, which can be a, criti a critic point. You can say there's too much coupling between the actual name of the thing you're interested in and the feature that the function that calculates it. And if you have that criticism, I would love to hear your opinions on how to do this better. Another cool thing you see here, because everything is just functions in a namespace, is that you get dependency management for free. So we know that number of digits in email name depends on getting the email name itself. And this is just yet another function that is called when you call number of digits. You don't need to do anything special. I can envision that for some um, performance sensitive use cases, we may want to have a pre-calculated pre DAG, um, like a graph, so that we don't go through the same calculation twice, right? If you here calculate a number of digits and number of characters in email, email name is being calculated twice. So this is an optimization uh, that Bulgogi will, uh, that I will probably look into adding to Bulgogi at some point once this is more mature. And so we can keep adding features um, as functions, always the same idea. They take in a map, they output some value. And then we get to the real meat of the whole system, which is the pre-processed function. So now the pre-processed function takes in a request map, which looks like this. Here's an example. The request map should always have an input data key and the features key. Input data should be a map and features should be a vector or an array in JSON. Um, and I think you can already see where this is going, right? We have some data that we are interested in transforming and we are telling Bulgogi um, with strings, these are the features, which for closure is just functions that I'm interested in mapping over this data. So if you look at the pre-processed uh, function here, it's only six lines of code and this is pretty much the whole logic, the whole business logic of Bulgogi. We extract the input data and the features, and then we look using the strings, we look into the namespace 
if there's any symbols, any functions with those names. And we make a list of that. We keywordize all the feature names so that then we can have a nice map with the keyword being the name of the feature and then the actual value you computed. And then we simply pmap the functions over the data that was sent to us. So in this case, we are parallelizing everything, um, which in my experience for my specific use case, which might not be true for you, um, greatly increases performance and um, it makes sense because data is not usually very dependent on each other. Then finally, we simply zip map the, um, the whole package. So we can see how this actually works. So let me just evaluate this and let's see, let's simulate this. So this can be, um, you can imagine this is a microservice, right? With the simple REST interface, it's getting an HTTP request um, in an endpoint. And now we just want to pre-process the data and respond back as fast as possible. And asynchronously, we want to write the results into a database. In this case, I'm just writing a file just to keep things simple. So very basic. You can see um, we asked for this data. These were the features we asked for. And now we get back our nicely pre-processed data. If we want to add more data to the payload, we can just say, for instance, let's see if there's any risky items in this in this order. So same thing again. Now we get all of the functions, um, all of the features with their respective results. Here contains risky item is just a, a is a boolean, but as an integer indicator. So one means yes. It seems that either Foo Industries or Buzz Corp is are very risky brands in um, in our little scenario here. And this is pretty much it. Obviously, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, there's no errors, error checking. There's no validation of any kind. Uh, but I feel that the main idea is already solid enough to build upon. We simply use namespaces to take care of of um, keeping our features and making making sure that we can find them. We simply use uh, the functions we already have in Closure Core to find those functions and apply them over to the data we have and respond back. And then a future or maybe a channel if that is more, um, if that makes more sense as we develop this to asynchronously save everything into a database. So to summarize here, um, there are good things and there are bad things. The good thing is it's just functions and maps. So it really doesn't get more known than this. Um, the core logic as you saw is extremely simple. It takes six lines of right now, six lines of closure to explain what's supposed to happen when you get a request. So there's almost no boilerplate. And this is very important, not just for the developers that may do this, the, 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 the data engineers, but also if you want to bring in data scientists that may not be completely familiar with closure, it's just very simple because you tell them you just need to write a simple function so they only need to learn a, a small set of how things work and then build from there. It's completely decoupled from models, right? So it's a separate system. The models don't need to know that it exists um, in the sense that they are not deployed together. We can have deployments in separate times. And it just makes features very simple to share between teams because now they are in a single point. If I want to reuse something that my colleagues used, I just need to call Bulgogi and say, hey, give me this feature, and that's it. Now, obviously, it's not all uh, roses and unicorns. There's also some disadvantages to using something like this. Uh, the main one is that, obviously, new features must be backfilled before training, meaning we need to retrain. Um, we need to send the data in to Bulgogi and save it into the data database before training a model. Otherwise, we have a chicken and the egg issue. Uh, which means there's a bit of a slow feedback cycle. So you need to wait for features to be available before you can actually train your models. I still think this disadvantage um, is not bad enough that the system like Bulgogi doesn't make sense because the benefits that are on the good side are just much, much major in comparison to these uh, downsides. 
So um, it may not be ideal for all use cases. I feel it's ideal for my use case. And this is what I would like to know from the community. If you see this as something um, you can use or what changes would need to be done for this to make sense in to be a more general use case. And obviously I think it should scale, but maybe it doesn't, and it's a lot of real, real world testing. That's what I have for you guys today. Thank you very much for your attention. And I would just like to give a very, very big thank you to Daniel Slutsky and the whole Cyclotch community for organizing or helping organize this conference. Um, also listening to me a couple of times, um, talking about Bulgogi and some other topics, and also especially to Dave Lipman and Jack Rusher, with whom I exchange a lot of ideas um, going over this first iteration of Bulgogi. Cool. See you all in the panel later. All right. Great talk. Thank you so much, Zhao. So now we are going to start our panel. So we have some, we're going to start off with questions for Sami and Ethan. And uh, then Renza is going to join us and we are going to hear a little bit from Zhao. So uh, let's see, Sami, Ethan, are you here? Yep. It's Hey. Sound working? Yeah. Can yes. Okay, good. Sammy, talk. Oh, one second. Okay. I hear you, Sammy. Okay. I hear you. I don't see you. And oh, I know I we want to see him with the if he has his normal setup, which is just amazing. <laughs> Ethan, you can see me, but the rest can't. Yeah, well, I see. I you. can see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now you're talking. <laughs> oh, yes, everybody. Let's look at that. Mm, okay. That DSLR action. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Very we vivid. will start with the icebreaker, and this is for both Sammy and Ethan. You both have been involved in the Cyclosh community for a long time now, very valued members of that community. So how long exactly have you been active, and what is your favorite part of being active in that community? What's the thing that you love the most about it? calculations. Uh, I think uh, my uh, engagement started around uh, the time when Daniel came to, to Kloyutre in Helsinki. That's way before the COVID, but I can't exactly now recall. So it's maybe two or three years ago. And then we started working on some uh, the Berlin event and I met Ethan there and stuff like that. So, so from around that time, Mm, what's the favorite feature? The people, of course. There's amazing people there, and and you can always get help and yeah, encouragement and everything you need to keep you going. Oh. Awesome. And Sami, if we could get you to um, bring your mic just a little bit closer, or bring your gain up, that would be oh, oh yeah. I meditation time. Nice effect. Yeah. All right, Ethan, your turn to answer. Um, yeah, I, I think I got involved, uh, I don't know, I had I, in to the end of 2019, because it was right before my son was born, uh, which means then that shortly after it started, I was less involved. <laughs> so I've had it up and down. Um, and I think, yeah, I don't know, for me, it's just a really nice group of people. And I think one part of that is the uh, one oftentimes we talk about uh, not having kind of uh, litmus tests around expertise or sort of level of e even in terms of level of familiarity with the things that we talk about so frequently so there's a concerted effort to explain things from the beginning to always be willing to do that and to bring to make you know hopefully that makes it possible for as many people to get involved you know whatever their level of familiarity with data sciences or closure or certainly the things that we specifically have frequently discuss. So. Yeah. And there will be lots of opportunities. We will hear from Daniel Slutsky um, all along this conference of the numerous opportunities there is to get involved with this awesome, awesome group of people. Um, all right, Zhao, are we here? Zhao and Renzo? Hello? Yes, we're both here, I think. Hello. Yeah, here's Can you Zhao. hear me? 
Yes. 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 Yep. Great. Sound clear. Asia, so I, I have a, like a, you know, a very first question is, should I, should I call you Joao or Santiago? Sorry for this. Usually people question. call me Santiago. It's easier to pronounce, but you're doing a very good job. Okay. All right. So, well, you know, I'll go with Santiago just because you, you told cool. me, you told me so. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to use the usual icebreaker question that I, I like to do. Like, is there anything some, like uh, surrounding you, some item that you, this curious item that you want to share with us? Curious item. I have all my bikes here. Oh, As I could, said, you could see them. Oh, nice. See. Yes. So, so this one, store bought, not so exciting. This one I built myself. It's my little baby. Wow. And I unfortunately cannot show you my basement, which is also full of all bike bicycle paraphernalia. So when I'm not building, you know, bulgogi type things, I'm usually building bikes for my friends and stuff like that. Okay. But is, so those are like in your living room and do you still yeah, use them? Yeah. Okay. I use, okay. So the, the one I built, I just, I'm too anxious to leave this outside of my house, but I do use it all the time. Like it's meant for riding, not for showing on the wall. <laughs> Cool. That that the way it should be, I guess. Except for very exceptional bikes. Anyway, um, thanks. So I'll probably um, give the microphone back to Jordan for the first uh, question to Sami or Ethan. Okay. And a lot of these um, questions are kind of um, dual Sami and and Ethan questions. I think there were lots of interest around. Um, clearly, this took this recording took place over the course of several days. Um, can you tell us more about how, how you recorded this, how many days it took? Clearly, you're very good at pairing with one another. How long have you been pairing with one another? You know, uh, just share us more about that, that process. Yeah, so I can start. We, um, the very beginning part, the introduction was made, um, around two weeks ago when the first deadline was for the for the uh, conference and we sent that uh, to the conference and we still had all the work to do so we just had the introduction and basically yeah we were doing some mostly asynchronous asynchronous planning of the of the setup also with daniel he was he was very busy with it as well because of the um the workshop and i think I think the most of the recordings happened uh, this previous weekend. So we did um, something on Friday, some twice on, on, no, I don't forget, uh, I don't remember exactly, but yeah, because we have this situation of, of a slight time difference, we, we have these windows early in the morning and early in the evening. So we did a bunch of, uh, bunch of uh, coding and recording, and then we met when the other other one was awake again and continued. Yeah. So where where in the world are you? And at this, where are you, Sammy? And then where is Ethan? You can answer. I, I'm close to Helsinki in Finland, Northern Europe. I'm near Seattle. Cool. Cool. I guess we we did know that. And okay, one more question. Who is responsible for the post-process video editing? I know that can be hard. Did you just say, all right, ready, set, go, OBS? Did somebody have to edit and snip it? And are you just, you just rock, clearly you just rock with it. I loved that actually improv part of it. That was Sammy. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I did some editing because if we would have showed you the raw version, you wouldn't have been as impressed at our ability of being <laughs> concise and, and, and good explainers. But, but yeah, yeah, I, I worked a bit on the editing afterwards. I believe there were a lot of ums that were um, nicely removed. <laughs> so we sound more, you know, succinct. But I have to say, um, Ethan is a wonderful explainer. So a few arms away here and there, and it was it was clear. It was a nightmare to try to make anything I said into coherent. But so most of the editing time I had to spend on myself, actually. But I'm very happy we had a very good, good communicator here on, on board. Very kind, Sam. Well, we were definitely very impressed. So you did a very good job because that can be, that can be the hardest part of this, this whole, this whole deal. Um, so uh, let's go. It's, it's fun to, to, to do that actually in this format, because, you know, normally in, in talks, 
when you're live, you cannot do it, but now you can sort of play around a little bit with it. Uh, so we, we ran with it. Yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, we got kind of Sammy definitely guided this, but I think we kind of ended at this place where we could be kind of reasonably uh, comfortable as we were just talking things through. Uh, and then kind of there are a few guidelines about, you know, kind of how how to do that so that we could still keep the what we were you know recording intact so that it could be cut together well. Uh, so it allowed us to be both, you know, to be kind of comfortable and no normal a bit more while we were recording. Yeah, that's, and, and y'all have been pair coding together for years now through the Cyclosh group. So I imagine that really helped in the, in the, in the process of being comfortable. We had a question in discord about how did you get so good at pair coding? Well, yeah. been doing it as long as y'all have together. Yeah. And that's, I think that's, yeah, that's a good point. I think it's worth emphasizing that that is something I think we, maybe we didn't, we could have been more explicit that we were sort of trying to showcase that, but it definitely came out, the practice definitely came out of the way we hang out on Zoom for Cyclos where we're just talking about stuff and trying to work through problems um, and being very open uh, about about that. Uh, so I, yeah, I think that was showcased there and certainly buoyed us when we're, you know. Yeah, there's, there's been like hours and hours of, of study groups that have been done over Zoom with uh, like half a dozen people doing exactly what me and Ethan did did live there. So yeah, that's that's a, actually a nice feature. I could have chosen that as my favorite thing about the community actually. Yeah. Yeah, and if you, I should, we should plug those, you know, if there, uh, if people want to join, uh, there's two communities that there are two kind of uh, threads on the Closure and Zulip uh, ML study and another one that we call Shifu, S-C-I-F-U. And ML study is, there's a lot of wonderful sessions that Daniel runs um, most frequently that are looking into certain, you know, data science problems and just looking at them. And then Shifu is one that I've been hosting and it is a bit more focused on uh, learning the data ecosystem, the libraries, and with the aim of helping, helping people get to the point where they might contribute to them or at least understand their internals a bit more and how they connect. Yeah, yeah, and, and uh, Santiago, are you also involved in this Cyclos community? Not as much as I would like. Uh, mostly from my my fault, uh, like I I gave maybe one workshop so far. Uh, like I gave a workshop in this in this uh, conference, and then I have a couple of demos and some explorations with Daniel. And I also was part when there was you know in the good old days of 2019 the data yeah. science meetup in Berlin. Um, I was also around, but uh, lately. I unfortunately didn't have enough time to just like produce stuff. I'm trying to hope that Bulgogi can be this entry into forcing me to just be a more active participant. Um, but in general, I think both like Sami and, and Daniel usually hear from me and, uh, and we exchange a couple of ideas from time to time. So there are a couple of questions that um, you've been already answering uh, Joao um, in the chat, but I, um, I, I wanted also to make others aware of and maybe you can answer them live as well. So one was from Jakub uh, regarding it would make sense to reuse some of the feature computations such as Boolean to none uh, from the Cycloge libraries. Um, so this is something when I first saw uh, Sammy's and uh, Ethan's talk like in the in the back office. Uh, before the conference, I was like, wow, I mean, I was not aware of all this utility function that exists. And I've been thinking all the time, um, how could you bake in this functionality into Bulgogi? Because at some point, you're going to be repeating the same things over again. And it's just another namespace where you're going to have functions like uh, convert milliseconds to something and are extracted an hour from a date um, and so on. And I saw the, what they were doing. I was like, yeah, this is exactly it. We don't need to go somewhere else. So I think all of these utilities from tablecloth and all of these other um, functions that already exist, they just fit in very well. Because again, Bulgogi, you saw it, it's just closure. So there's nothing that doesn't interact with this and doesn't interact with the functions. Um, 
it doesn't use, at least from my personal use case, you don't need this whole data frame abstraction, uh, but all of the tools that are being created to uh, use the data frame abstraction, like utilities, they will just go right in um, and they would fit very well. So that's actually another point to say, if these things already exist, then it's very simple to bring a data scientist that works with Python or R or whatever, and tell them the things you want are mapped to these things in Clojure. And I would just need to learn the very simple um, syntax of Clojure to write a new function that you want. Thank you, Joao. Um, Jordan, do you want to ask another question? Sure. Um, and it might be, hopefully y'all can answer this because it's a, um, a little specific, but Holy Jack asked in the Discord that it was kind of out of topic, but he was curious to what you use to zoom in to the code buffer when it appeared as a new on the top rectangle over both Emacs and in the browser with bigger font. When rewriting map to Emap. So hopefully, Sami or Ethan, you you know. If not, maybe we can get a uh, more specific um, time when when that occurred. Sami, Ethan. I believe that was more of Sami's magic, but uh, post processing. Is that right, Sam? Yeah. The the nice feature there is is a beauty. I also. Uh, fell in love with it, but but unfortunately, it's made with uh, DaVinci Resolve, which is a video editing tool. So we still have to wait for that to come to Emacs. But but yeah, yeah, it it it's a nice a nice little feature, I think, to be built. Should I go with the next um, question for Santiago? I don't hear Jordan, but I'll, I'll probably take that. I'm here. So, yeah, yeah, fantastic. So um, Kevin was asking, um, you mentioned that Python or R is low compared to Clojure. And I'm interested in why Clojure is faster than Python and R when Python has libraries like NumPy that are baked by C. So I imagine people in my organization country might claim that Clojure is fast with that. And I wonder what you would say in response. Right. So, I mean, to com for completion, R has the same thing, right? We also have lots of libraries that are backed by C or C++ or Fortran. So they, they should also not be seen as slower in comparison to Clojure. Uh, when I made that comment in the talk, I'm referring to vanilla Python, vanilla R, which is actually what we have to use when we deploy these things. Uh, so I'm not using NumPy or a NumPy-like thing in production to calculate these features because it's, it's such a small thing. I'm not going to use NumPy to make X minus Y. It's just overkill. Um, and in those scenarios, if you also, on top of this, have all of the power of using all the CPUs at the same time from Clojure by just saying PMAP, right? Then it's just faster. Of course, sure, maybe some use cases, this is not true. Um, cannot make like a blank statement, but that's definitely not the like the killer feature for me that a closure is the best way for feature engineering because it's fast. I think it's just because it's simple, it's very well understandable, and it composes very well. Um, but I think someone else also mentioned D type next. So if you want to have as fast or faster than C uh, performance, then closure also has you there. Can I also respond? Uh, yeah, I, I, it's kind of, it's interesting because that D type next does give some of that uh, performant uh, speed. And that's also the basis for the data sets, uh, tech ML data set is, you know, its columns are built on D type next. Um, I wonder if Bulgogi could also at some point support a data set and that, that Although that might not be important in many cases where you don't, you just don't need that level of performance if there are some instances in which. But, but you can, right? I mean, if you look at Bulgogi without my feature engineering lenses that I gave everyone, mm -hmm. it's a very generic general purpose thing. It's just getting some inputs telling here's some data, here's some functions I want you to run. And it does that. So what the functions right. are could be, 
you could even be calling an external API to do some word embeddings. Who knows? Yeah. This is up to you. The, what I really wanted to capture is this idea of centralizing these transformations yeah. and having this buffet, right? You can have mm -hmm. everything in there. You can choose whatever you want. So people can easily collaborate because they're collaborating on a single place. Yeah. Um, so yes, of course, like using, um, using data set here could be, it's not my use case, but this is why we're having this discussion. Maybe you look and say, well, this is cool to use tablecloth and other libraries. And then you're basically just passing a map through, right? I, I want to make sure. I, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's it, it's kind of interesting because there's a similar, not the same, but similar pattern in the in the, the uh, Cyclos ML library where it's called this like metamorph context, and it, it's it's a very similar idea where you're, uh, you know, basically this map is being passed through and it collects stuff <laughs> that is important and exactly. useful. Uh, I wonder if there's some, you know, cross fertilization that could happen there between those with your tool and that one. It seems like there's some pattern overlap. Like, you know, you might be wrong, but it seemed like there was something. Well, it sounds like we have room to explore stuff. Yeah. Which is good. Yeah. yeah. So we have a question here from Ray1729, who says, is Encanter now dead? It looks like it's been superseded by Tablecloth, FastMath, and the Vega-based visualization libraries. And this who wants is to for, take this one? Yeah, yeah, who? This is for anybody that wants to answer it. <laughs> Any encounter representatives here? <laughs> Good answer. But I, I guess the, the there hasn't been very much uh, activity on the encounter front. Uh, for quite now, I haven't looked at it recently, but but I think it, it it has been quite quiet for a long time. So so yeah, we, um, that is one aspect. Joe, you wanted to comment on that. I was uh, just saying that if if I have the option of using the same type of tools from Closure, I wouldn't use something that is interfacing with R from closure, right? So I, I would like to, I would prefer having either directly using R and just commit to that environment or commit to closure. So there's also the talk with Bulgogi with some of people in my team that maybe we could have functions written in Python because that will be easier for them. And then we have to interface with that. Um, but it sounds like things are working out so well that maybe we don't need to have this connection, right? Because Encounter is nice, but it always felt a bit like the less resource. It's like kind of, oh, we don't have these things in closure. So let's make a, a bridge to that world using this uh, library. Okay. So we have, uh, there's another question for Santiago. Um, Again, Ray asking uh, why introducing a microservice, why introduce a microservice rather, rather than inlining code? It seems like the network calls will only add overhead. Introducing a microservice instead of inlining code. Yeah. Well, why I understand from this question is why are we not doing this inside every function or every model, right? Together with the model where the model exists. So yeah. this is this was the whole story in the in the talk, right? If you do this, which is what we do today, you have to deploy them together, and then you have to copy paste this code around, or you have to extract the code into a library and manage the library, which is fine to some degree. This is why I said this is not it's it's not a fix for all use cases. So if I'm working by myself and I'm a team of one in a company of not that many people, it doesn't make sense to build Bulgogi. Like you're not collaborating with anyone. You don't have a problem to fix. The problem only happens when you have a certain scale and you realize people are writing the same things over again. And you, you don't have a, a nice or easy way to keep um, the data you get in development to be exactly the same as you have in production. So you have to duplicate these two things. So you're inlining code in two places, right? You have to inline the code in development, inline the code in production. And on top of this, if you get a new colleague that just says, well, I'm more efficient in Python and I'm more efficient in R. Okay, that's fine. Everyone does what they want. 
but then we just need to find a common ground where to collaborate. And to do this, it you just cannot inline code. And this is why um, Bulgogi needs to become some sort of microservice. It doesn't need to be a microservice, but needs to be extracted, in my opinion. Fantastic. Yeah. That, that, that makes sense. It really seems like collaboration is the key of, of a lot of y'all working together. Um, we have a question for Sami here from one Tom. Any reason for using the ELIS style indentation when using Clojure? And he adds, the result is less ragged code and you can set the font size bigger too because the horizontal screen, screen real estate is less of an issue. And it's very helpful for screencasting, he mentions. Yeah, no, no specific reason. That's a very good, good uh, tip. And uh, next year, wait for that indentation. <laughs> we'll use that. Unless uh, Ethan, you have a reason why we're not using. No, no. So thanks for the tip. It's uh, it's good. So Renzo, do you have maybe one last question? I think uh, we are getting to the time to wrap it up for one yeah. more break. Yes, we have one last question. I think it was, uh, why did you decide to, I think this is from Pavel before, why did you decide to implement Bulgogi as a Babashka script? Is that specific to your company setup infrastructure or there are other benefits as well? Oh no, it's just, it's very fast to prototype it like this. Okay. It, no, I didn't, I was thinking, well, I just want to try a couple of ideas, how this can this be implemented. Instead of making this a full setup, I can just share a script with someone else and say, hey, I run this in the command line. See if this does what you want. So I, I think Babashka just enabled a whole level of prototyping that it kind of existed before, but now it's just at the script level, which uh, closure was missing a bit and you always have for granted in R and Python. So no, it will not be Babashka script forever. <laughs> All right. Um, so can I just add a short, since this yes. became also a discussion about post-production panel. So mm -hmm. I'll just make a little shout out to uh, any Linux users who want to work with a proper uh, video edit NLE, there is something for years and years, I was waiting for something, but a couple of years we had the uh, DaVinci Resolve, which is not open source, but it's free. So we can do proper video editing on Linux. Thank you. But it doesn't work with a Radeon GPU, FYI. <laughs> yeah, you need to have that. I found that out the hard way. It's yeah. <laughs> just figured to mention you need an NVIDIA for that one, I think. <laughs> True. Okay, I think, but correct me, Jordan, if I'm wrong, are we uh, at the end of the list of questions that we collected so far? There is, we, Jacob had asked for Sammy kind of what he says is the status of the closure data science scene and the roadmap. I do know that we are going to hear a little bit more about that from Daniel at different points during the conference, but if Sammy has anything to say on that right now about what they're working on, that would be good to hear. Yeah, I think Daniel is is uh, an excellent person to to talk about that. And but but I I warn you a bit. Every time we ask Daniel when is it ready, he says in a month or so, in a couple of months. But yeah, we, we'll be we'll be honest. Uh, this uh, takes a lot of time, but the amazing work that has been done uh, now it's it's pretty far already. It's pretty mature. It's not completely uh, mature for for uh, beginners and stuff like that. We have a lot of work to do still, but it's it's making amazing strides. It's it's exciting. That is wonderful. And remember everybody to stay tuned. Daniel Slutsky is the person to contact about that. And he will be sharing. There's even an extra bonus day of the conference on Sunday where you can dig in and learn more about that. So, uh, so yeah, stay stay tuned. There's also the website, the Cyclos website of you or the Zulip. There's also the Zulip. There's lots of ways to find out about this. Okay. So if we are done for with questions, so once again, I'm going to thanks um, 
Sami, Ethan, and Santiago for the wonderful talks and the effort they put into this. And uh, we are going to move to the next section. So um, we are not going to break um, because we, um, we have probably enough material and we are going to maybe gain a couple of minutes uh, if anything goes wrong with uh, the few videos I'm going to play for you. So um, the next part is the daily interlude. What is the interlude? So it's a space dedicated to quick presentations by uh, our sponsors today and tomorrow will be used for the live talks. So uh, needless to say how grateful we are for all the great support we received this year. Uh, not just the sponsors that you see on the website, which is great, but the many, also the many individual contributions of people like you, uh, our audience today. And uh, I need to thank, uh, thanks opencollective.com for making this process so simple for us to accept donations and is all transparent and you can go there and see how we're spending the money and uh, or not spending them because at the moment we still have to allocate the budget. But what is going to happen with those money is that we are going to support not only this conference, but any of the other wonderful initiatives from the London Clojurians uh, uh, meetups, um, Closure Bridge, and uh, maybe something else in the future. So that is all very well, very welcome and well used and, and for the uh, growth of the closure community worldwide, I think. So now about the interlude, um, we are going to start uh, with a, a sponsor pitches now, and we are going to start with the Fresh Code. Um, Fresh Code is very fond of closure, and as you might have heard this morning from Artem and his in his presentation, so we are going to hear a little bit more about them. And uh, uh, the idea of this is presenting what. Uh, what they do, um, a little bit of their culture, and uh, uh, getting to know them a little better. And if you're interested in having a chat with them, there is a, a sponsors uh, fresh code in this case channel on Discord for any questions you might have. So, uh, and without any further ado, here's Artem. Hello everyone, my name is Artem Barman and I want to tell you about my company, Freshcode. I fell in love with Clojure and functional programming about 10 years ago when I was a student. Today I'm a co-founder of a company that helps people to turn their ideas in reality using Clojure and frankly speaking some other languages. The name of this company is Freshcode. Uh, its story began in 2013 when I quit my daily job as a Java developer and decided to build my own product. I started with Java, but then recalled my experience with functional programming and decided to try Clojure. Startup wasn't successful and we switched business model to service company that helped other guys building their own products. In 2014, we found first Clojure project that requires help. It was from Australia. And now our closure department is uh, six ongoing projects. Some of them last for five years and 17 developers. Uh, also, we pay a lot of attention to developing the community and advocating closure inside our company and helping people to switch from other languages to closure. So right now we have 150 IT specialists working on several technical stacks like Java, JavaScript, .NET, and of course, Clojure. Also, we are working on different business domains like health tech and ad tech. So we have a plenty of experience. As an IT service business, we provide a wide range of closure development services, such as developing closure project from scratch, uh, extending the teams, staff augmentation of an existing projects, and maintenance also. We also pay a lot of attention to the communication because it's usually a very stressful part of the work with the outsourcing company. And uh, I personally pay a lot of attention in developing the skills of a client to properly encode the task projects, the, the tasks on a project and uh, 
uh, on a team to properly decode the received information. We use a variety of business analysis techniques to make it proper. And also it reduces stress a lot. So if you have any question and maybe you want to work with us as a partner or employee, please feel free to ask them uh, in a LinkedIn, in an email or in a Discord channel, fresh code. I will show you. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, thank you again, Artem. Thank you again, Artem, for uh, your uh, introduction to fresh code. So um, now we have another pitch. So um, the second sponsor that we are going to feature today is Skywan. And we, um, I'll, I'll let the presentation speak for itself, but we are very grateful uh, to Gaivan and in particular Felipe, uh, in particular Felipe for delivering the website experience that we are all enjoying this year. Um, thanks Felipe a lot for your hard work. And uh, now some words about Gaivan. Give me a second. Uh, I can't do one thing, so give me one more second. All right. You got it? Yeah, got it. Yeah. Sorry for that. I'm going to mute myself. It's from the heart of closure. We are the Gaiwan team. You may know us from the Heart of Closure conference, which we organized. From the Closureverse forum, or from the island tools and libraries we maintain. Like Kaosha or Ornament. Gaiwan loves closure. Which is why we love supporting community events like Reclosure. You may have seen the amazing event website. Reclosure.co. That was us. A lightweight design. Leveraging web standards for maximum accessibility and a responsive experience across devices all in an appealing package. Gaiwan delivers closure and closure script based projects to a range of clients. By being a small and tight knit team, we can still deliver that personal touch, closely working together with our customers to make sure they are as delighted as we are with the result. We are a fully remote team and highly value work-life balance and flexibility. Software is created for and by people. And so we always put the individual first. Does that sound like a place you want to work at? Yes, it does. Then get in touch. Get in touch. Get in touch. Get in touch. Please get in touch. Maybe we have something for you. And that was uh, Guy One. And uh, so, as I said before, if you have any questions, you want to know a little bit more about them, uh, please head over to Discord, um, Guy One, and fresh code channels. Um, I also need to thank uh, New Bank, uh, like a, a bank you might know uh, at this point using Clojure. Uh, they also uh, sponsor um, for this year conference as well. And last, I want to thank also Jax for sponsoring the conference and not not just uh, sponsoring the conference, but like being a like a uh, being so supportive of the London Closureians for a long time, the closure ecosystem for many years now. Um, they're bringing closure to small and large companies, contributing to its adoption worldwide. So uh, we can't say thanks, thank you enough, Jack, for your continued support. Um, if we have uh, Malcolm uh, on the call, Malcolm would like to say a few words. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, That's Renzo. Um, take it away. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Uh, All good. Oh, uh, good. Well, yeah, it's it's been a long time since we've we, London and the closure community has been really a home to Jux. It's where we founded, um, and I I kind of remember um, some of the you know the talks that we we've, we've given over the years, 
Um, it was 2012 that we got going really, and it's, it we're coming into our 10th year. Um, and I remember the, the first Euro closure conference that was held was in London, um, held in May, and it's kind of before, um, and I spoke at that, and it was it was a really kind of an inaugural event. And we've been kind of doing the um, these December conferences for now, you know, for a long time. I can't remember when the first one was, but it's um, it's fantastic to see closure evolve. And, and we are as much in love with closure this year, you know, now as we always have been. It's been a fantastic language for us. And, and closure has been one of those things I can think of, you know, truly has been career changing, you know, for all of us and, and the, the values and the philosophy of Rich Hickey. Um, we've really uh, taken it as a kind of uh, the philosophy of closure right to the heart of the company. We're a real hacker company and um, lots of challenges ahead. Uh, the the um, last year we talked a little bit about the roadmap for for this year, and I I, I made a little piece where we talked about um, working on GraphQL and Open API, and it was really nice to see this year Joanna showing um, our GraphQL uh, approach through site on top of the the database, which was called Crux last year, and we've had a uh, you know, quite a, a long year where we've we've um, obviously renamed the database as well from Crux to XTDB. Now, XTDB is written in Clojure and it's a team that we are heavily investing in. So next year, as we're going to 2022, we're going to expand that team. And we are really looking for people who are passionate of building a, a mutable database, um, which is by temporal. And we've got a huge roadmap of features. And so uh, if, you, if, this is a, um, if you'd like to work on a, a Clojure database and get right to the core, uh, we've, we've, we'd love to talk to you, so do get in touch. Uh, also, if you've been, um, if you want to work on our client projects, we've got um, uh, three quite significant uh, projects in Juxt, or four actually using um, XT, three, three using Site, um, and it's a really kind of growing and evolving platform, and we've got some other really exciting closure projects as well. Um, with um, very much open to remote people as well, remote applicants and, uh, and working um, in different time zones. So just, yeah, do get in touch. Um, this, this kind of time of, year, time of year really holds a sort of special place in my heart in a way, because I, I was giving a, um, a, a, about nine years ago, it was, it was always a, um, there was a closure conference I gave, uh, a talk I gave called Chow, um, which was about writing in core logic uh, in Italian English, um translator and uh, i remember um i was in london getting ready for this conference and i got a call that my wife had gone into labor and and a few hours later my daughter was born our daughter was tara and and uh, so this year is always kind of a is part of the year is always an anniversary and she'll she'll be nine tomorrow uh, so it seems like a kind of uh, a long time long time to uh, it, um in this community but it's um it's a, it's a, a really lovely community. I mean, I'm really, really proud to be part of it, as, as is John and, and Hawken and many of, many of the, um, uh, the, the, the London Clodurians. So, so just thanks, thanks Renzo for keeping this um, and, and everyone who's organized and, and John um, and everyone who's been part of the organizing of this kind of reboot of, of uh, this uh, reclosure conference. So this is just really a fantastic thing to keep that flame alive in London, or well, it's more than a flame, and, and keep everything going from strength to strength. So uh, yeah, do do come and join us for, uh, to do do if you, you want to get involved in our kind of, we've got lots of new horizons in, in, in Jux, lots of things that we're working on uh, to, you know, that, that we've we've laid out in our, our philosophy, and, and we'd love you to come and, and help uh, move things forward. Um, so thanks very much for hearing me out and uh, yeah, get in touch. Thank you very much, Malcolm. And thank you, Jux, uh, for your support. And thanks to all the other sponsors uh, as well. So we are going to have um, five minutes visual art break to stretch a little bit and uh, start for the last block of the day next to two talks, one panel, and then we'll go straight to the keynote. Thank you very much. See you in a bit. Thank you. 
And we are back after this uh, short break. Um, we are now entering the final part of this wonderful first day at Reclosure. Uh, next up is Dragon Juric. Um, Dragon is pretty popular in the Closure community uh, for his work in the uncomplicated libraries like Neanderthal or Closure Cuda. And Dragon is also a prolific writer um, and professor of software engineering. So we can probably say that he's a pretty busy guy. Well, I'm looking forward to hear his talk. So without further ado, here's Dragon. Hello everyone, my name is Dragan Juric and this is More Closure, Less Complication. Here's my contact details uh, in case you'd like to find out more. I'm a professor of software engineering at the University of Belgrade. I've been using Clojure as my primary programming language since 2009 and I teach it uh, since 2010. Uh, you can find me on GitHub and uh, you can find lots of related closure articles on my blog dragon.rocks. Also in the past uh, couple of years I have written uh, a couple of uh, closure books uh, that use libraries uh, that I've developed uh, to uh, teach you some uh, novel uh, programming and uh, artificial intelligence uh, topics. Today we will mention a few of the high-performance software libraries that I develop. We will walk through a Hello World example that illustrates typical neural networks enclosure and see how Clojure makes even more advanced stuff simple if not always easy. So, we all love good, powerful software. We love uh, elegant closure software even more. But what I think is even more important is to know how to properly use it in the right context. That's why these two books came to be. Both Deep Learning for Programmers and uh, Numerical Linear al Algebra for Programmers teach applied math, machine learning, and high-performance programming in detail, in closure, but they go beyond that. They teach the context and the fundamentals, and that is their major mission, to open these exotic areas for typical programmers preferably using Clojure, of course. And uh, they are uh, primarily supported by a couple of uh, uh, Clojure libraries that I have written. Uh, this is Neanderthal, which deals with vectors, matrices, and li linear algebra operations uh, around these data structures. Also, Deep Diamond, uh, which covered tensors, which is uh, more or less uh, n-dimensional uh, vectors with uh, all kinds of internal structures optimized for uh, deep learning uh, operations. And this is in line with closure philosophy of using the right data structures uh, and uh, a small set of operations that uh, operate on these uh, data structures. Okay, it's small number of operations is relative uh, to the domain. It could be uh, large numbers in absolute terms. But the point is, by combining a limited set of uh, data structures and a limited set of operations, uh, we can get a lot of stuff done in a relatively simple, simple way. Also, some libraries deal with GPU programming, uh, with CUDA, with OpenCL, and I use these libraries in both Neanderthal and Deep Diamond. Uh, and other cool, do cool domains are, are cover covered by uh, some other libraries uh, that I, I developed. But this uh, talk 
primarily uh, will use deep diamond. These books fund, fund my work on all these things and make Uncomplicate uh, viable in the long term. Many thanks to everyone uh, who's supporting me. Uh, the wonderful Closure community also supports my work through the Closure Together, uh, Closure is Together Foundation grants. Also, uh, the books uh, that I uh, write uh, directly fund all this open source work. Oh yeah, uh, these libraries are completely fr free and completely open source with Closure compatible EPL license. So, AI and uh, machine learning have been hot topics for the past several years. Many programmers heard about it. Uh, however, most programmers never had an opportunity to learn this. On the surface, it looks trivial. You just call a couple of functions and the black box magically does the job. Sure. But it is only after someone else found the solution to that specific problem and created the functions you call. To apply a similar solution to a similar problem requires reassembling that black box using lots of math, statistics and other esoteric backgrounds. That early point when there is not a straightforward tutorial to follow is when the learning path becomes unbelievably steep. The literature is uh, either heavily theoretical or too superficial. In these books, we connect theory and application by, by starting from scratch. Building the tool itself from scratch. So, all these libraries that I'll show you, I also teach you how to create these libraries. And as we go, we apply it on increasingly challenging problems learning the foundations one by one as we need them, uh, covering the full path from theory to the actual code that we use. And uh, here is how a simple interactive session of teaching the neural network to predict how prices based on past values looks like in Clojure. Uh, I will um, uh, lead you uh, through this uh, Hello World now to see uh, what are the typical uh, parts of a neural network that does, does some useful work on uh, some uh, simple data uh, that uh, we all can understand. And I will show you all parts of the code uh, that uh, resulted from using these libraries. Of course, of course uh, in the books I show you all the background and I show you uh, how you can extend this uh, to even uh, features that I didn't support, but you can support them because you will have uh, knowledge to do that. So typically we start uh, from uh, some data source that is our, out of our control. It might be a web server, it might be a database, uh, or in simpler examples, it could be a CSV file with a serialized data from some other system. So, uh, we read this CS file, uh, CSV file for, uh, using plain closure. They, there might be specialized tools for the task, but they heavily enforce the keep it simple and stupid principle in these books by introducing something only when it is needed. So, the reader understands not only how, but why it is done. So, for this data source, pleasure Plain closure is completely enough. The data records 14 measurements for each of 500 areas in Boston, including zoning, age, and median house value. Our task is to create a machine that predicts median value based on other data for future cases when we don't know median value and we would like to uh, predicted from other data that we do know at that point in future. So, uh, this kind of problem is called regression. Other popular uh, problem 
class is classification, but uh, this example doesn't deal with classification. It uh, deals with regression, predicting the actual approximate uh, real uh, values. Um, neural networks work with numbers. Luckily, for this data, the transformation from strings is straightforward because the data uh, has been serialized in strings and we loaded it in closure data structures, closure vectors and sequences full of strings. Uh, now we have to convert this uh, to numbers first. And uh, luckily in closure, this is not a, a big deal. Note that this part is not accelerated in any way. way. If we have used a special, uh, specialized library, it might have been faster than plain closure, but this is still relatively slow. We work with files and strings. So avoid doing uh, that uh, as much as possible. So only do these conversions at one point and prepare the data, put it in the right formats, and then only use these formats. Uh, don't go back and forth be between uh, plain closure data structures and optimized vectors and matrices and tensors and vice versa, unless absolutely necessary. And this is usually necessary at the edges of the system because your data comes in unoptimized form. But once you convert it, uh, don't turn it back at each uh, step. Now, it's time to put these numbers into the appropriate high-performance tensors, meaning da data structures uh, that uh, are optimized for internal hardware uh, and uh, that will uh, enable operations to use this uh, uh, stuff uh, optimally. So Deep Diamond and uh, Neanderthal's operations are optimized for these native formats supported uh, underneath these matrices and tensors. And uh, on the surface, uh, these are all uh, matrices, vectors, and tensors, but underneath there are much more complex structures. So it's not linearly, um, uh, so this data is not linearly ordered in uh, uh, actual memory. Underneath, there are lots of sort of optimizations that hardware, hardware vendors provide us. Um, so the data needs to stay in this context. Don't forget that. Don't do unnecessary conversions. Uh, creating the network is technically easy, as you can see uh, on this slide. Since I use closure, a uh, closure awesomeness to implement a very nice API. Notice that this is not a specialized data, uh, uh, specific uh, domain-specific language with a magic compiler that will somehow turn these elegant expressions into some something that actually executes. Everything here is a closure function. And each part can be evaluated and debugged on its own and combined on its own in different parts of software. The same as closure. This is not a special syntax. This is just a closure uh, vector with a couple of uh, closure functions in it. So uh, the uh, deep learning for programmers book explains what to do in detail and when to do it and how to do it. Um, and the training can be fully automatic as we use here. So the network is unleashed on the data and it learns how to guess that kind of data well. One hint about why neural networks were difficult to apply for a long time. Even though uh, this is a small network, it does have 5,000 parameters that uh, it uh, needs to learn from the data. And everything is learned through many, many iterations of trial, error, and refinement. <coughs> so these are, these are 
millions and billions of operations. If we have tried to uh, write this with our own loops and recurs uh, or, or for loops or every, every other typical uh, operation that we use for normal software development, it would run for days or years even for not so complex examples. For this simple example, example, it could be a couple of hours even. But with this optimization, it would be it would be completed in less than a second. And but now, when we grade human students, we usually don't value how well they can parrot the text from the book back. We give them new problems. Uh, which are not too dissimilar from what they have seen before, but not completely the same. And we see how well they perform. So it's the same with machine learning. We save the portion of the original data, which the network has never, never seen during uh, training. And we use that for later testing how uh, the network will perform. So that's one of the typical uh, newcomers. Uh, mistakes uh, that they teach a neural network to uh, approximate some some function because neural networks are basically uh, functional uh, uh, engines that learn how to approximate a function. So if we know the function, there is no point of approximating it. But the point here is that, that we don't know the function and the neural network will discover that function on itself, uh, so we have to test it with some other data that it has never seen to see how well this approximation goes. So that is the point of machine learning. It works on new data without explicitly being told the rules, as opposed to uh, traditional programming where the programmer uh, decides on the rules and codes the rules in the software using branches and uh, looping and whatever explicit logic that is available in the programming language and uh, but here that explicit logic cannot be known because the problem may be too complex uh, so the neural networks learn learns everything uh, in uh, from the data so the key advantage of neural networks uh, compared to other machine learning techniques is that they do not require much preparation and they do the analysis more or less automatically. That all uh, other techniques usually require more human involvement in tidying the data up, even for such simple examples. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the neural network is just some magical uh, black box that can learn everything. It is still up to the programmer to decide on the architecture of the network and to uh, fit it to the problem itself because machine learning is fragile. So the, the solution only looks simple, but it's easy only because it has already been solved. However, in, it cannot solve your problem. You have to find out a network architecture that works well for your specific problem, and that's guesswork. Closure is great for interactive prototype, though, so all these can be uh, pretty much the same as we develop normal closure software with lots of REPL uh, work. On the other hand, even serious networks uh, don't look much more complex in uh, Deep Diamond. Uh, here's an example of a convolutional network. It automatically fits most arguments uh, of these layers. So the resulting API is that simple, uh, meaning the user only has to provide very few ar arguments that the network cannot uh, set by itself. Uh, so as you can see in this uh, code example, uh, this network is not much more uh, it is uh, more, much more advanced than the previous network that we have seen, but the code is pretty much on the same level of uh, complexity. 
And to train serious network, uh, networks, we need accelerators such as uh, graphical processing units or gra uh, graphical uh, cards. So, uh, but look at the code. The same code that runs on the CPU in Deep Diamond will work on the GPU too. I had to use some uh, advanced closure internally to achieve this. But from the user's point uh, of view, it's just regular, regular closure. No magic here. And a knowledgeable programmer could point out that what I've shown you is all fine, but the latest neural network architecture requires branching and gradient support for that branching and complex uh, uh, graphs. And yes, Deep Diamond now supports even that, although it's still in the snapshots, it's not uh, released yet uh, to the cloud jars, but you can use it, you can play with that and uh, uh, send me bug reports. Uh, and here is an example of branching a tensor into several parallel sequential networks for different channels, followed by a concatenation into one tensor. From the user's perspective, everything works automatically. No need to manually uh, connect all these uh, connection, uh, connections between layers. Um, the point here is that all this is implemented in regular closure. I did not develop any magical compiler, domain-specific language, or magical black boxes. Any competent closure, uh, closurist can dig in and understand how something is done, fix bugs, and create custom layers. They can reuse existing parts uh, uh, of Deep Diamond at several levels of abstraction for their own specific purposes, uh, while each part can be interactively used on its own, even without the network and surrounding functions such as train, etc., etc. Everything is within reach of the competent user. And any competent closure programmer? Hmm. You're joking with us, you, you, you'll think. This surely required a large team of programmers, or at least a few programmers, and resulted in a million lines of code, or a couple of hundred thousands. Well, not at all, not at all in closure. I created this in my spare time and everything, including the integration with verbose low-level libraries uh, provided by Intel and provided by NVIDIA, uh, and direct support for GPU and direct support of custom coding, and all automation and forward-looking infrastructure for future extensions is less than 9,000 lines of code. <laughs> and I'm just a typical closure programmer, I'm not some uh, Google genius or anything like that. So if I could do it uh, with a little bit of effort and learning, you could do at least part of this, this if you need it. And probably some of you could do this job a lot better than I. Uh, so I encourage you to explore this uh, uh, exotic and interesting kind of programming that is more, more and more required in modern application because now we have lots of data and it's time to analyze it properly. So, to sum it up, uh, I have shown you a couple of things here. There are some libraries that are very useful in my opinion, that are totally closure and in line with closure philosophy of a limited set of data structures and a limited set of operations and combining these can give uh, practically unlimited possibilities. Uh, I have also show you the books uh, that are very detailed and that are no fluff, just practical stuff connected to the theory Nothing is skipped, everything is tutori in tutorial fashion, not as a reference, so you can learn from this. Also, there are, there's lots of free articles at uh, dragon.rocks. By the way, the libraries are, are completely free and open source, and you can use them, them as a, any other closure libraries. And the books I have had to make uh, 
for pay because I have to fund this work somehow. Uh, and also, uh, not to forget, Closure is Together Foundations who uh, uh, generously support my work. Uh, so check them out and if you have interest in the uh, work that you need funds for, uh, it's a good, always a good time to apply because they are very friendly and very uh, supportive. So thank you for listening and please contact me if you have any questions or advice or anything else that you want to share. Thanks all. All right, welcome back. Um, so we are now um, introducing, uh, well, thanks very much, um, uh, Dragon, for your talk and looking forward to the panel at the end of the next talk. Um, so we are now uh, going into the first live talk of the day, um, excluding the, the keynote. So until now, we were pre-recorded. So we are going to use um, this space to make sure that our next speaker uh, Kathy um, is available, we can connect with her and everything is working fine for her talk. So I invite, um, let me actually allow um, unmuting. And um, Kathy, if you are around, can you please unmute yourself? I've unmuted, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, I can see you. So it's all, it's all working as expected, I, I guess. I do need screen sharing though too. Show this. Oh, yes. There you go. That's why it's good to connect. <laughs> Thank you for remembering me. Try now. Okay. Yes. Oh. Okay. So we can see your screen. So I say that uh, even if um, we are a few minutes ahead of time, but I'd, I'd say that if you are ready and uh, you want to start the talk, we, pro we could probably start the talk. Actually, let's um, because I'm 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 not sure that I mean there might be people connecting for your talk, uh, yeah, we, and they we might can miss wait. the the very first part. So uh, actually, I mean I wanted to introduce you. <laughs> so sorry for all the confusion. I'm trying to remember everything. So just, um, I can check. Are you seeing just my slide, or are you also seeing the notes? Uh, we also see your notes as well. Yes. So okay. you need to change the view. Yes. Try again. Yes. Hang on. Um, hang on. Go ahead. You, you can you can introduce while I get this set up again. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So the next speaker, Kathy, is also an, an accomplished researcher and professor like Dragon. Uh, and she's a, co um, a professor of computer science at Brown University. Um, one aspect that I believe is particularly interesting about Kathy's research is that she explored the teaching computer science using functional programming and more recently data science, among other things. And I think we have something to learn here as the Clojure community about how to teach programming with Clojure in data science and spread the gospel more easily to newcomers to the community. So. Now I can see the slides are in good, nice shape. So no, but that changed went, the notes again, didn't it? Yeah, it went back to that. Well, hang on. I can't. Not sure why it's. Try that. Yeah. Yeah, okay. that's working. Good. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Kathy. Sure. The stage is yours. Okay. Uh, do you are we waiting or is this time to, to start? No, you can start this 29th. Okay. Yes, we are very close. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and good day. Good good evening. I know we're we're all over time zone wise here. And you know, what I've been working on for some time, and this is joint work with Sriram Krishnamurthy, who's also at Brown, is thinking about 
how we rethink introductory computer science to better support learning data science. And there's several reasons why I think we should do this, which we'll, we'll go over here. So for starters, it's worth thinking about the pressures that are on the computing curriculum within the university context. So first of all, you have the rise of data science. Um, there are many programs and students who want to be learning about data science, and we have to figure, about, figure out how that fits in the computing curriculum. There are questions about the societal impacts of algorithmic decision-making and what we should be teaching about that. There are concerns about diversity in tech and the tech workforce. And with the strong tech economy, you're bringing many more students from many more backgrounds into our computing courses. So all of these pressures are building up on intro computer science classes. So it raises a question about how we can redesign our introductory courses to support data science while also thinking about some of these diversity and social impacts issues, which at least in the United States are generating a lot of discussion with regards to curricula. And the proposal that I'm gonna put forth in this talk is we should centralize data in a way that leads us into teaching, uh, in, into data structures. And this is going to let us combine some data science work with some conventional computer science work. Where am I coming from with this? So my technical job title is I am a research professor of computer science. Uh, I'm also the associate director of the undergraduate program in computer science at my university. So I see this from all sides. I see this as a researcher who studies computing education, as a person who lectures large introductory courses in computer science, and from an administrator position trying to manage a large undergraduate program. I've been teaching first year computing for 25 years. And for the last 10 years, my primary research has been in computing education, looking at the intersection of languages and uh, pedagogy and tooling and things like that. I am a functional programmer at heart and at core. I can play other kinds of programmers on TV when, when necessary, but really I, I tend to think from a functional programming perspective. So if we think about different ways that different linguistic communities approach intro computer science, let's look at what they do and how well they might accommodate data. So if you generally are teaching intro computing from an imperative programming perspective, you go heavy on conditionals and loops and assignment statements with some arrays and lists. And that's how you get started. If you start with objects, well, then you're getting into starting with classes and objects, then getting into conditionals loops. And if you take an algorithmic focus, now you go into some of the classic algorithms in sorting maybe some of the basic graph algorithms. Another model, which is starting more functionally, is where you're emphasizing functions, lists, recursion, higher order functions, and these form the early foundation of your computing curriculum. In my case in particular, I mostly have taught with the how to design programs curriculum, which is based in Racket. Uh, so that's kind of where some of my thinking on the role of functional programming in education is coming from. And if we step back and ask ourselves how these three approaches might accommodate data or think about data, well, an imperative intro is really designed to emphasize control, not data. The object-oriented perspective tends to put data structures before data. And the functional intro ends up emphasizing traversing data structures, but not necessarily necessarily thinking about data in the data science sense of it. So the question I want to ask is, what if a two-dimensional table were the first data structure that we showed students? So here's a sample, small two-dimensional table drawn from one of my own lectures. And what you can think about in looking at this table and why this might be an interesting place to start, it's rich structured data, but it's in a non-threatening format. 
So I think a lot about how to offer introductory computing education to students who do not have prior experience in programming, who maybe are not even majoring in computer science. They might be studying social sciences or, or something else, but they still need to learn about data and computing because of the way this is under learning all of their different career options. You can come up with many authentic tasks when you work with a two-dimensional table. And if you want to be raising some of these issues about the impacts of technology, they can come up rather naturally. I'll give some examples as we go. And if you have questions like, how many tickets got sold with a student discount, you're letting students explore problem decomposition, which is something we often teach early on in programming, but it's in a very concrete format. Students can imagine taking the tables apart or scratching out on them or drawing on them. I've seen students do this in ways that I have not seen them do when we try to work with general data structures like lists. You also can give students something of a process that they can understand for preparing data to work with. We normalize, we look for suspicious data, we use visualization, we analyze. It's another good format to expose students to the idea that software development and coding proceed with processes and not just something that we, we kind of do because we really were good at it necessarily, but there are steps that they can follow. In the context of data science, I'll point out that this is as much data engineering as it is data science. Notice I haven't really talked much about statistics and regressions and what kinds of analysis methods you use, as much as how you think about managing, maintaining your data as a precursor to doing that kind of statistical analysis. And I think this data engineering perspective is really important if we're going to try to bring computer science faculty into embracing data more from the way we start teaching our courses. Now, anytime I give this variant of this presentation and I say we should start with tables, uh, people invariably say, well, what's the best language for working with tables? And we're back arguing about what programming language to start with when teaching intro students. R and Python get a lot of, a lot of the airtime, Julia comes up. And as a computing education person, what I want to say is just stop. This isn't how we design curricula. You don't design curricula by picking a language. You design a curricula by laying out what you're trying to teach first. So I want to start there, that if we're thinking about a narrative for introducing students to computing and programming that embraces data, what does that narrative look like? And what topics does that suggest? So what I'm describing here is a vision that we've been calling data-centric intro to computing. So very much computer science, but with data at its core. In my experience, it helps to start by helping students realize that both information and code have structure. It's not obvious to a student who's never programmed before that a program is not a sequence of characters, but rather a structure of functions and expressions and computation. We want students to understand that the role of computation is to transform or summarize data, or in the case of tables, data sets. Sometimes we aggregate information across data points. Lists are a natural vehicle for bringing up that notion of aggregation across data points. The fact that your data set attributes might themselves have structure leads you to an introduction of data types. Understanding that data points might have relationships among themselves and not necessarily be independent is a natural segue to talking about trees. Sometimes programs actually end up needing to update their data sets. And this is where things like state and assignment can come into the, to the story. And then when your programs start getting more sophisticated, you have to start thinking more about the efficiency of working with associative data 
And this is a good reason to bring in dictionaries or hash tables. So what you see on the screen here is the topic sequence that I use in my data-centric intro course, starting very heavily functional. We're functional all the way up until the state portion of it, but tables come much earlier than in a typical functional programming curriculum. Woven throughout this, we try to always draw students back to the data. Every topic we do is motivated by something a student might want to do with a data set. And this motivation is important for working with students who do not see themselves as computing students, but instead students who are trying to prepare in data. There's many points in this curriculum when I can bring up issues about social impacts of computing. We bring up planning, composing plans, decomposing problems from the very start with tables. Notional machines is the term that programming, uh, sorry, that computing education researchers use for semantics. I spend a lot of time teaching through semantics and models of program ev execution and evolution, excuse me, in my classes, because I want students to start to understand how languages work. And that again is something we can concretely visualize at the level of tables and repeatedly bring up as we, as we go through this curriculum. So I just wanna give you a couple of more concrete examples about what I mean by some of these orange boxes and, and what we're trying to teach. When I talk about students appreciating the structure of data and the structure of code, I first teach them how to construct images like flags. Because if we're constructing flags of the world, we're seeing small bits of images, like three stripes here, and we see how the image has a, has a structure of stacking, and the code has a structure of nesting. We do a lot in the beginning trying to appreciate this relationship between structure of data and structure of code. And this will translate very nicely into tables and some of the other things we're trying to do. When we get to tables, we are going to pull the tables into a programming language, either by writing small tables manually or importing them from CSV or a Google Drive. And we learn how to write functions and make small programs that do things like compute new columns on tables, which is what I'm showing at the bottom of this slide here. So a simple Lambda-like function gets used to extend this table with a new column. In this table context, I can talk about normalizing data, and that's a process of filtering or searching for values that we don't understand, mapping, transforming data in the process of normalization. We can talk about checking whether all the values are expected as part of just confirming that our data makes sense before we process it. We can capture filters of the table to focus on different subsets of our data. All of these operations that we like to teach as higher order functions, say on lists, extend very naturally into tables and they make sense to students because it's a context that they can envision working in, in whatever domain they're coming from. We also get into discussions about how to represent data. One of my favorite lectures is I ask students how we should capture timestamps. Do we use multiple columns for hours and minutes? Do we make them strings? Do we use big numbers? And this gets us to talking about issues like data schemas for time and for names, which get into issues of internationalization and having students think about who they are designing software for. This is an example of social impact kind of thinking that I try to bring across. There's a series of articles that I like a lot, falsehoods programmers believe about, these long lists that have been compiled by professional programmers of mistakes people make in trying to represent things like names and dates. It's instructive and natural for students who are looking at early stages of data. You can also bring in many practical questions that show data design trade-offs. 
We look at how to store lists in a CSV file, how to extract lists from a CSV file. A lot of the programs of the kind of scale and heft that we might normally do in an intro programming class can come up very naturally within this, this focus on tables. So now I've given you some examples of what I wanna be able to do. Now we can come back to the question, what language should I be doing this in? And more often than not, people will say, we have to do this in Python. Why? Well, because it's the, the place that students need to end up with if they're gonna do anything practical. And yes, I agree that ending the students someplace practical makes sense. In fact, the course that I teach at the very end comes back to tables and we show them pandas. So Python's a great place to end up for giving students something concrete that they can look on Stack Overflow or get online help with. It works very nicely. But do we have to start there? And that's again where my pedagogy hat comes on. We are functionally inclined programmers, um, assuming if you're at closure. And functional programming underlies tools for processing tabular data, for doing data science work. Um, Hadley Wickham is the developer of our studio. He writes a lot about teaching and learning data science and the importance of functional programming. So in the curricula that I work on, we start functionally. And we're starting with a language called Pirate that we have developed in-house at Brown University. It has built-in support for images and tables, like I showed you on those couple of slides. It has a Python-esque syntax. The PY in Pirate is not accidental. We lifted some things from, from Pirate. Um, we did drop the white space having semantics. That's not very friendly to new programmers. But the idea, the other notational forms look rather similar, but it's a functional language with proper data types. It builds testing into function definition. So we really enhance for students this idea of testing and writing illustrative examples as part of how they write functions, habits that we think we should be building from very early on. One of the fun things about Pirate is it's backed by a lot of research that's going on in our computing education research group at Brown. So we have looked at building techniques like having students check whether their test cases, their test suites are thorough and accurate before they write programs. This is the kind of tool that we can easily build into a, a research environment. We have studied how to make students write good tests, how to learn how to organize data and how tool support can help in getting them to that point. We've been studying higher order functions and how students learn to use them and learn to develop them. All of this work in Pirate is driven by education research in, uh, for computer science. And that's something that can't really be said for the developments of things like Python and R. They have good places that they came from. I'm not at all knocking those. But my perspective is I'm trying to introduce people to thinking about programming and data. So I want education to really be driving how I do this. So when we're doing this course, we do the first two months of it functionally in Pirate. We're learning how to write abstract data types. We're learning how to process these data types with recursion and functional programming from a strongly data-driven perspective. At the point that I'm ready to introduce state and updating data, we take that as our opportunity to switch to Python. And there we do state, hash tables, and wrap it back around to pandas, showing them that all the things they did in Pirate at the beginning we can also bring over to, to Python at the end. And then there's follow on courses that get into things like objects and data structures and algorithms and, and other more, more advanced topics. This is the first in a multi-course sequence that we're teaching. So to kind of pull this together, what's the problem I think we're trying to deal with here? At least in the United States, we're seeing a lot of schools developing data science programs. 
And the data science programs are starting with intro statistics, maybe a little bit of data scripting. They do more statistics, big data, and eventually they get to the point of wanting to do data management. A computer science major is organized differently. We start with intro programming, we get into data structures, and then we go into more advanced classes like databases, data science, and machine learning. And what we often see are students who see that little bit of scripting, say in their second or third course in data science and say, oh, I like programming. I wanna be a CS major. Or we see CS students who get up to the upper level data science class and say, you know, I'm really not into developing software, but I really like this focus on data. The student gets to data management on the data science side. And now they say, well, I need databases because I think I wanna do more data engineering. And what we have effectively done here is set up a system where it's extremely hard for students to switch. There's so little content alignment from a conventional CS approach and a conventional data science approach that students effectively have to start over to switch. And that's unfortunate, especially when we see that there is a way to start these things commonly with tables and higher order functions as our early programming examples, and then let students do a second course in whichever of data science, computer science, computer engineering most fits what they're trying to do. Novice students don't understand these fields well enough to decide which one they want or what they all mean. We really have to think about pedagogy that's gonna help them figure out those interests as they go. So to put this in, in perspective, I think we have three different subfields or, or um, job titles in some sense that we see competing for mindshare in early computing education. Data engineering is overlooked frequently, even though it's a really important component of being actually able to write scripts that are maintainable in a data science context. Data science is exciting because students across campus are interested in it. Data engineering needs non-trivial computer science. So it needs a foundation to build on that it won't get if we do a statistics-based data science alone. Every computer science student these days needs some grounding in data and statistics, given the way data is part of everything we do. And we've got these increasing calls for social responsibility, at least being raised to students. The sweet spot is the intersection of these three pieces. Start in the sweet spot and then branch out. And this is what we have been been working on. If you're interested in seeing this laid out more as, a, as an argument, we have a paper that we wrote in communications of the ACM on this model of data centric computing. It's really the article version of, of this talk. We have a textbook that we have been writing um, called the data centric introduction to computing. It's available online. The first version is out. The second version will come out sometime over the, the winter break when I make revisions after this semester. I've also put the URL there for the course that I'm teaching out of, of all of this. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions on the curricular design or things we know about learning programming through these different venues, but thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. That was a very nice talk. Uh, we already received a request for the slides because <laughs> they are amazing and, and people I, I can would like that. to. Fantastic. Yes, yeah. we, we don't need to discuss this now. Yeah, no, um, <laughs> no worries. Um, so if you can, let's see if I can stop your sharing. Yes, there it is. Okay, thank you. So um, let me see. We can uh, probably get started preparing the panel. So you're already here. So we don't need for once. We don't need to uh, mess around with connections. Um, let's uh, just see if we can uh, get Dragon as well on the call. I know you didn't ask, but I'm here too, Renzo. Hi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just about to like. Uh, Can't uh, miss. Actually, me. sorry, I, I'm, I'm, I forgot to enable um get like people to unmute unmute themselves so let's see unmute if the dragon is yep i just clicked it love oh, it's... 
it's a dragon, dragon, dragon. If not, we can just wait a little bit. Oh, well, we can, um, we can leap into some questions with Kathy since we're here. And um, I kind of, yeah, I kind of have sure. one. Um, sure. I come from a non-traditional background where I didn't go to university. However, I do have a lot of friends who attended different universities and I've heard a lot of them express a lot of frustration with like how outdated they say the curriculum is and how they're not learning anything useful and blah, blah, blah. And I wonder, do you think that your data centric intro to computing curriculum and focusing on the data could be a tool to soothe these frustrations? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly what we seem to be seeing. The course that I've put together around this is extremely popular from students across campus. The students that, that I work with, they know that data is playing a huge role in their lives, whether it's their academic lives or their personal lives. Like They're on social media. They're concerned about algorithmic bias and Facebook and all of these issues. So by teaching this course centered through data, we bring those issues up. When we're looking at the tables, we talk about metadata and privacy. We talk about how does inference get made from a, from a large data set. So I think we are able to connect these to the kinds of concerns that students have both academically and personally. And I think that that takes a lot of that stale feeling out of the curriculum. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess the follow-up question to that is also, I really like the slide where you said, you know, you don't, you don't pick a language and, and teach to it. Um, I think the question needs to also be asked that, is it necessarily the responsibility of a university to teach these like constantly evolving frameworks and languages and ecosystems? so that a student leaves the university, you know, with the bachelor's prepared to start the workforce? Or is that something that should be done in an internship or should be done on their off time or? Um... So, you know, when I look at the, the typical student population, not all of my students are headed the same place. So if I wanna teach the language that appears everybody for the workforce, what the heck do I teach them? Right. I've got students going into everything from, you know, building uh, low level systems to doing data analysis to doing graphics and animation. I, you can't center an intro curriculum around the needs of industry because your students aren't all going to the same place. Now, maybe if you're in a boot camp and you're trying to prepare students for a very specific injury, I'm sorry, industry, that calculus is different. But at the university level, there is no one place they're all trying to go. And I also think that we need to get students to have a flexibility to adapt to different languages. I'm a strong believer in having students use multiple languages in the first semester or first year so that they begin to appreciate what it takes to take something they've learned in one language and move it to another language. And then I think industry and internships, those are places where you start to learn the conventions of the subfield and the work you're trying to go into. The other thing we tell students when they come in as first years is that, you know, the average hype cycle of a language is about seven years. So if I teach them now what's in the hype cycle, within a year or two of them graduating, it's going to be dead anyway. So I'm not serving them well by, by teaching to the hype cycle. Right, right. The fundamentals are really what's important there. Right. So I see we have, has Dragon joined us now? Hello. 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 Can you hear me? Hello, Dragon. Okay. All right. So we have all the talkers in the panel. I have heard that there is a raised hand. Uh, oh, Ethan. Hi, Ethan. Um, do you want to go ahead and ask your question then, Ethan? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's for Kathy. Uh, I really love the talk. Um, I was just having a conversation with Elena uh, Makasova. I can't pronounce her name very well. But she's at University of Minnesota mm -hmm. and also interested in teaching um, functional languages. And I, I did a computer science minor when I was like in college, like 20 years ago, uh -huh. and it was all object oriented. Right. And it's just, and then I've gotten into functional. It's just amazing to, to kind of like realize 
how different that would look now. Um, mm -hmm. This was really illuminating, kind of like helped me understand what the road I've traveled. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess there, I had so many questions, but I think maybe one that most, yeah, is, is um, you mentioned that data engineering gets overlooked. And I've always, I've kind of like, I've noticed that too. And I always wondered why, because as somebody who programs like regular programming, you know, kind of like full stack or whatever. One of the things I like about it is there's this kind of like carpentry aspect of like designing a system. And when I think about data science, which also interests me a great deal, sometimes it's like that path of like design, you know, training a model seems kind of repetitive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, I'm, um, you know, I miss the carpentry aspect. And I kind of wonder if I've always wondered, it seemed to me like data engineering might be a place where that exists more. Yeah. Um, and so I, I wondered why it doesn't get more attention. I wonder if you have like more, more to say about what, why that is, or, so, you know, yeah. You know, the same way you have legacy languages survive in software projects, you have legacy curricular designs serve in university departments, right? There are conventional ways that we have taught programming for a long time and you have to, at some point, you have to decide that it's time to throw out the way you've been doing it and, and revamp what you're doing. So a lot of places I think are still stuck in the seventies, frankly, that basic C programming, maybe we do basic C programming in Python syntax, but we haven't fundamentally changed the way we think about the topic sequence. And Data engineering doesn't really align with a topic sequence that says, first we teach variables, then we teach while loops. It just, they don't line up right. So you have to come at curricular design by asking yourself, what do I want my students to learn how to do? What do I think is feasible for them to learn given what they know already? And then kind of break it down and construct it back up from there. But if your curriculum is kind of in an older way of looking at the world or older set of those decisions, you have to make a conscious decision to break that. So I think we saw that jump happen once in the early 90s when people started jumping to say, let's do objects now. And things changed around to what they were doing. Yeah. Um, you know, now you're getting, you get some jumps around scripting. There's kind of been the scripting jump that's happened. And now I think we're getting ready for a data science jump um yeah it's just it's the nature of the the beast just maybe a quick follow for that is part of your argument that the fun that maybe that the functional mode of teaching is particularly useful for that last jump i'm that arguing that so given if you look at a data science library it's very heavily functional mm -hmm. right it's it's higher order functions Basically, they don't might have the same syntax, but it's that's the concept of what we're doing. So the functional style of thinking about code aligns very naturally with many data science libraries. Yeah. Right. And that's the perspective from which I'm saying I think functional is a good platform from which to launch this. Yeah. Wonderful. That's great. Thank, thank you. Thank you for responding to that. Um, so going to loop Dragon back in here, I know you think you got lucky and we were going to forget about you, but we're not. Um, start with the ice, icebreaker question that I am particularly interested in. I would love to hear about your interest in Cuban salsa dancing and how you got into that. And also whether you've talked with Chris Nuremberger about his passion for dancing, because I know y'all are, I know y'all know each other in the same spaces. So uh, yeah, let's break the ice with you. Oh, so I got into salsa maybe 12 years ago or something like that. And it was, um, well, uh, in Belgrade, uh, Serbia, there are lots of uh, Cubans because they don't, they don't need visa. So they use it as a kind of a jumping uh, point uh, for uh, uh, emigrating to Europe. Uh, so there are lots of them and they introduced salsa maybe 20 years ago into the city and it got uh, relatively popular. Uh, so there are lots of uh, schools, lots of parties, and um, that's how I got into it. Uh, and I, I didn't know Chris uh, also dances. So that's another 
great thing about him. Yeah. Do you think it relates to um, that style of dancing? Do you think it relates to um, the way you think about programming or is it just completely different? Well, perhaps <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's uh, let's say it's pretty improvisational style of dancing, like a street style. Uh, it's not competitive. It's a social dance. So it's important to enjoy yourself and uh, with your partners and friends and just have a great time not to compete with each other. So maybe there are similar things in programming because the point in programming is not that there are winners, uh, winners and losers. The point is that at least in open source uh, programming, the point is that we all help each other and uh, learn from each other and uh, uh, work together. Uh, yeah, so the community aspect sounds like it's uh, what draws you to that and also what draws you to open source work. That That's that's really wonderful. Um, okay, since we're doing round robin style, we can go back to Kathy now, um, kind of do a follow-up question about what we were just speaking about with Ethan. And uh, what do you think of the recent boom of data science as a chosen major and a career path? And do you think that that is sustainable or do you think it's just hot right now and it'll eventually settle down? Do you think it's just going to keep going up? Um, I hear the market's very competitive and it's very, uh, very trendy, that space. It's certainly trendy. Um, but I think there's a, there is a fundamental grain of truth there that we are collecting volumes of data and many industries and disciplines are making decisions based on data. So if data is gonna be a fundamental bit of organizational infrastructure, then people need to know how to work with it. Um, so I don't think the need to have students prepared to work with data is going away. I think what might go away is the feeling that this is the thing that you major in because you wanna make sure you get a job. Right, you know, like people don't run around getting degrees in English because they need literacy. Right, at some point, it becomes a literacy that we figured out how to get to everybody, and it doesn't have kind of the the trendiness that it that it has now. But I think there's something healthy to the trendiness um, when it's bursty like this because it really forces us on the education side to stop and ask: Am I serving? people well with this. You know, I've been teaching for 25 years. When I started, you majored in computer science because you were going to be a computer scientist. You didn't have people who kind of picked up a little computer science in an intro class because they thought they should have it as a job skill. So you could teach your intro classes, assuming that the people who were, were, should be in there were the people who were going to go all the way to a major. And if you lost out the people who weren't going to major, that was okay because that wasn't who the course was for. Now we have been forced to reckon with the idea that our intro courses have to serve the entire campus. People who will take one course and stop and still wanna do something useful with it. That's a paradigm shift in how you think about teaching your courses. So I think there's a real value to these trendy spikes if they force us to rethink the population we're trying to serve with our classes rather than just try to figure out how to get everybody through an intro programming class and see. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And increasing literacy when it comes to data and when it comes to computer science is, is super important. And that can kind of uh, take us into our next question for Dragon here. And uh, I'll take this time to do a quick shout out to Jacob, who has been so forthright with questions in the chats. You've been a great role model. Thank you so much. As hosts and organizers, we really appreciate you putting in these questions that everyone's wondering. So Jacob says to Dragon that if I want to learn to use machine learning for my work problems, but I don't know anything about machine learning or data science, what learning path can I take? And I assume if you wanna consume your content Dragon, if there are particular books to start with, what to pre-study, yeah, thanks. Uh, that's a really a great, a great question because probably every develop, developer, not only Clojure programmer, but any Java programmer or any C-sharp programmer 
or even any Python programmer would ask themselves, okay, I see that machine learning is somewhat popular. I see that lots of people are talking about it. I see that lots of uh, big companies are pushing some uh, impressive applications that they say use machine learning for. So I want to know more about it and probably to upgrade my skills and someday use it uh, in solving practical problems. But what is usually the problem for us developers? Then we go, okay, let me, let me see what are the most popular books or mo most popular courses that deal with machine learning. And uh, there are two kinds of. One kind is directed primarily to, towards researchers in machine learning and data science. So people who probably uh, have a lots of math background, lots of statistics background. Uh, so that content is heavily based on theory and has almost no applications and no code. The other uh, big uh, big chunk of uh, the the content that is available is uh, written from people and uh, for people who uh, maybe don't have much background in maths, don't have much backgrounds in uh, computer programming, but have a background in some scientific field or some or some uh, specific field uh, that. Uh, machine learning is applied for. For example, uh, statisticians uh, or uh, uh, biology uh, majors, or maybe business uh, people or something like that. So they, uh, that content is uh, heavily directed towards applications of a black box. So uh, machine learning and, and data science without proper understanding but just put into context with some recip uh, recipes how to solve these particular kinds of uh, business problems or, or scientific problems with machine learning. So developers are neither of these typical archetypes. So we have problems. The theoretical, uh, theoretical literature is too abstract for us. We don't see how to apply it easily without majoring in maths and statistics. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, the business side is too superficial for us because we immediately see how to apply it and maybe understand how it works on surface, but we still don't understand how exactly this works and how we would apply for different problems. So uh, my approach was to offer something that is uh, targeted for developers. So takes developers perspective, uh, assumes that a developer has some background in maths a long time ago, everything is forgotten. We have this something like, like a skill that is underneath, but we don't really have it, it's, it's a bit rusty. Uh, so we need a refresher for that. We may know some basic statistics, but usually we didn't understand it properly, even when we uh, attended these courses, and let alone five or 10 years after that. Uh, and we need something that is uh, that we can run off on our computers immediately and see how each part develops. So my point is, when we build something, we start to understand that that's the way uh, that we think about problems. When we when we program something, for example, we don't we may not understand accounting, but when we program uh, an accounting system, as a part of that, we we start to understand something about accounting. We we may not be experts, but we know a lot of it. Or uh, about, for example. Uh, inventory uh, management. When we program such system, we start to understand how this being business functions. So uh, the point is that I try to do something uh, like that for machine learning, uh, specifically deep learning, and for linear algebra and the math background, uh, 
uh, that is needed for, for all kinds of uh, machine learning that is based on linear algebra. Yeah. Oh, so, so to, to come to, to Oh, to yeah, yeah. What about what book? What path? How do we, let me, is there something about the uh, Cyclos group maybe? I don't know. Uh, yes. Uh, so, so now, now the actual answer. Uh, the answer is uh, regarding my books. Um, they are uh, both books are uh, self uh, uh, are can be used independently of each other. So uh, the deep learning book is uh, a primer of how to build a uh, deep learning library from scratch and apply it to some typical problems that are used for teaching deep learning and how to integrate with uh, Intel's and NVIDIA's uh, mainstream uh, high performance uh, tensor libraries. So uh, we start assuming that you don't know much and it, in each chapter we learn one or two things and we build these things and that's how we build understanding. Uh, so uh, most programmers could follow it without referencing the numeric, numerical linear algebra book. But at some point, uh, most programmers will be a bit more com uh, confused with the details because they forgot about linear algebra and math. So at these points, they could uh, go to numerical linear algebra book and uh, learn uh, these specific things. So deep learning is more like a novel and numerical linear algebra is more, more like a collection of uh, short stories that build on each other. Uh, and this is uh, more uh, concentrated on the actual core of machine learning and, and deep learning and linear algebra, uh, not, with, uh, uh, not with so much with the other uh, aspects that uh, cycloge libraries or other integration libraries are concerned, which is more like, okay, how do I consume CVS files and web services and different databases? And uh, how do I do this uh, data, gluing the different kinds of data sources? Uh, my books deal with, okay, uh, we have a data source and how do we get it into closure? And how do we build a system that can uh, learn these functions from data? Because deep learning is basically, neural networks are basically function approximators. And can people uh, contact you on the Zulip or email you for if they would like to know more, I assume? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, okay. there are, I'm active on most of uh, closure communities, so awesome. they can contact me. Awesome. All right. We are going to do one last question to Kathy here and then end it off so we can have a five minute break before our keynote. So. Kathy, do you think that programming is a life skill? Should this person be teaching their wife and their kids to code? Or do you think it is more of an expertise? That, that you know, if you, the literacy shouldn't need to be considered if um, you're not going to specialize in that domain professionally. Yeah, so I think through this question, because I've, I've been on several organizations um, in in different states in the United States that are developing their learning standards in computing for K-12. So that's kind of the frame from which I think about this. I don't think everybody needs to know how to program. I think everybody needs to, how to live safely in a digital society where data is collected about them and shared about them all the time. You need to understand the life cycle of data. You need to understand what people do with information, what people can do with phones all the time, right? It's, so I think that's actually the life skill is living in a digital world. Programming is a medium that works for many people to learn that skill and to express that skill. But I don't think programming is necessarily the end skill especially if you look at the small amount of programming that one could fit in, say to a, you know, an elementary school curriculum, you wouldn't get to do enough of it to turn it into a life skill. So I'd rather see us thinking about just literacy of data and citizenry 
as it were. And if programming becomes part of that because your school district can fit it in, that's great. Um, but otherwise, you know, being able to move sprites around the screen, which is where a lot of students get, it might feel powerful, which is itself a, a good thing. But I don't think that's the life skill. Yeah, yeah, I do. I agree that there is a difference between um, computer literacy and programming literacy. You know, you should know how to navigate a file using a GUI, but maybe not need to open the terminal for everything. Right. So, um, right. Right. so with that, um, that was Dragon and Kathy. We are going to take a quick five minute break so everybody can use the bathroom, stretch your legs, grab coffee, do anything you need to do before our very, very, very exciting keynote speaker. And I'd love to hear more questions from y'all because we, we need some questions for Mr. Wolfram. Okay. See you soon. Thank you.
All right. Do we have people rolling back in? Do we have the man himself and Renzo? Yes, I'm, I'm in. Here's Stephen. Yep. I'm Hello, here. Stephen. I oh, wow. Okay. That was quick. Fantastic. So if you want to go ahead and uh, share your screen so we know that you can do it, and then I'll do a quick intro just to present you. Seems to be working so far. Good. Fantastic then. Well, welcome, Stephen. I'm very happy to see you here. Um, thank you very much for being here. So it has been like a long, interesting day with the talks. So now uh, this is the last uh, slot for the day. This is la the last, the, the keynote. And it's a great honor for us to be joined by Stephen Wolfram. Stephen, as many of you know, is a computer scientist, a physicist. He's the founder and CEO of Wolfram Research, where he, he designed the Mathematica and the, the Wolfram Alpha language, uh, the Wolfram Alpha engine and the, uh, the Wolfram language. Stephen is a prolific writer and speaker. He's recently on a renewed quest to find a fundamental theory of physics. So why did we invite Stephen? So Stephen is connected to our conference and our community in at least two important ways, I think. As you may know, a reclosure driving theme this year has been data science. So this is one connection. But Stephen is also the designer of the Wolfram language, as I was mentioning before, which is inspired by Lisp in being symbolic and functional. So we definitely have some ancest ancestral interest that I think Stephen is going to talk about today. Well, enough for me chatting now. Uh, let me introduce you to Stephen Wolfram. Hi. Nice to be with you all. Well, you know, I was just looking at my um, uh, archive and uh, I see 2008, I see a message saying, closure seems like an interesting language. So I've been, I've been looking forward to learning more about closure for a great many years. And I've had, it's been nice um, uh, seeing a bit more about closure. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's great to be, to be with you guys here today. Uh, so as, as Renzo mentioned, um, I've been involved, well, I've been involved in language design for a long time. The first big language I designed was in 1979, a language called SMP, Symbolic Manipulation Program, which was kind of a forerunner of Mathematica. Mathematica came out in 1988. Mathematica uh, is basically Wolfram language. Wolfram language is kind of its, its modern name. Um, and uh, I'd been interested in language design all that time. In fact, I'd been doing language design pretty much every day for the last uh, 40 years. And uh, in the last few years, I've even been live streaming many of the language design meetings that we've been having. Uh, so people might find those interesting. The, um, the thing that, uh, how come I've been doing language design for, for all those 40 years? Uh, one might think when one thinks about uh, typical programming languages, well, they're small things. And um, after a year or two, a few years, it's like the main design is done. But actually, our goal has been very different from that. Our goal has been um, uh, not to make a traditional programming language, but more to make what I call a computational language. And I'll try and explain a bit about what I mean by that. Um, I would also say that in terms of the, the history, when I started designing SMP, I had been, I did it first of all, because I wanted to have a tool to use um, to do uh, physics, which I was very interested in at that time. And um, I wanted to kind of uh, make a system that was sort of as general as possible. And my inspiration in terms of making a computer language was to use sort of ideas from natural science. In natural science, one has all these phenomena in the world, and the goal of natural science tends to be to drill down and find out what are the underlying essential primitives that make up all those things we see in the world. And that was kind of my approach to designing a language was look at all the computations one might want to do and kind of drill down and find out what are the primitives that are most effective in defining those computations and then be able to build up from those primitives. And when I started doing that design process back in 1979 or so, my, my main inspiration was to, well, to try to find sort of what was the, the way of, of, of thinking about computation sort of in terms of its essential primitives. And I kind of went back 
and I'd studied a lot about mathematical logic. And um, in fact, many of the, the same inspirations that uh, John McCarthy had in the design of Lisp, whether it's um, from uh, uh, Lambda calculus or production systems or combinators, whatever else, were also influences on me. The other big influence on me was APL. Um, those were the sort of two big language influences uh, as on me. But um, so what, what is the point of a computational language? The point of a computational language, as far as I'm concerned, is to have a way to represent as many things in the world as possible computationally. Little different from the objective of a programming language. A programming language, the story is we've got a computer and it does certain things. Let's try to make sure that we can tell the computer as effectively as possible, even when we want it to do lots of things, what it should do. A computational language, the goal is ultimately to be able to represent things in the world and things that we care about thinking about in computational terms, both as a way to communicate those things to a computer and as a way to understand those things for ourselves. I kind of view it a little bit like the objective that mathematical notation had starting maybe 400 years ago or so now. Mathematics had been something you described in words, then there started to be streamlined notation like plus signs and equal signs and so on. And that streamlined notation was pretty important for the launching of what became the mathematical sciences. And what I see the goal of our computational language today as being as this kind of a notation for computation that can be used to kind of launch the computational X fields in the same kind of way that mathematical notation launched the kind of mathematical science uh, kinds of fields. So one of the things that's very different between programming language and computational language is in a computational language, we want to have as much knowledge as possible about the world. It's not just a question of knowing what, how one's computer is supposed to do things. It's also a question of knowing lots of things about the world. Well, maybe I, without further ado, I should actually start uh, showing some things. So let's, uh, this is a notebook. Um, we invented this notebook idea back in 1987, when just before um, Mathematica version one came out. Um, I guess notebooks have now become finally popular. I view that as being one of the most trivial ideas in, um, uh, in, in what we built in Wolfram Language. But so what is this language? Well, the, the one thing to understand about it is it's symbolic. So I type in X, it's just X. I type F of X, oops, I type, let's say F of X, it's just F of X. I can do things I could say, for example, nest list F, X, 10, I'll get some sequence of nested things. It's all just symbolic. I, I could say if I wanted to, I could have something which uh, immediately means something. I could say, you know, uh, use the function framed and I'll get something that looks like that. Let's, um, but one of the things that's important about having this symbolic language is that that X can be anything. It can represent whatever I want it to represent. I could, I could have it, for example, let, let's say I make a, um, a graph. Let's say I make a random graph, um, 100 nodes, 200 edges, there's my graph. Now I could say something like make a, um, uh, make a community graph plot from that graph. Now notice I can just put that graph in as an argument of that function um, because it's just that graph is just a symbolic thing like the X was. Um, or for example, I could say, do something like this. I could take, let me pick up an image here. Let's, um, let's get a little image there. And let's, um, there's my image. And I could say something like, you know, edge detect that image. And now I'll get the edge detection of that image. Or for example, what, what I could do is I could say nest list, edge detect. Um, and I could just take that, that, um, that there and let's say, I don't know, 10 steps or something. And now I've got uh, that big mess of, of edge detected images. So, so I'm just using that, that kind of mechanism there. So another thing to understand, I mean, I, can, I could as well, I could say, if I wanted to have a function, I could say nest list, here's a pure function. There are many different notations for pure functions, but let's say I have a function, I don't know, what would I do? Let's say um, uh, x squared mod, um, uh, mod 100 or something, and then let's do that. Um, actually, what I want to do, um, I don't know whether this is going to be very interesting. Uh, let's start this off from, from three or something. Let's do that uh, 30 times. Okay, this is totally boring. I was thinking I would make, um, okay, I know what I might do. I could, for example, I could make something that goes, no, this is going to be boring. Okay, that was very boring. I could say, um, uh, find transient repeat 
oops, I want to say um, uh, percent just means the most recent output. Uh, but I could say, for example, say that, and um, that will just find uh, uh, find the repeats in there. Okay, but um, maybe I could do okay. Let, let me let me do something different here. Let's say make a table. Uh, let's say uh, I goes to. Um, let's do my the thing I was thinking about back back there. Something like this. Um, I up to a hundred. Um, so that will make a set of of rules that say two goes to four, three goes to nine, etc. I could make that into a graph if I want to by just saying make a graph of that. There's the graph. Now, for example, let's say I want to make this um, uh, this n. Uh, I want to make that a variable. Let's say I could say that that's now a symbolic expression where I could say manipulate that uh, n goes from let's say ten to two hundred in steps of one, and now I'll get something which is a dynamic thing where I'm where I'm generating that uh, that graph layout uh, for for each value of n. Okay, so let me uh, let me save this just so we might have a chance to um oh, where do I have it? There we go. Um, uh, I'll, I'll I'll push this to the cloud so people can play with it themselves. I, I should say what I'm doing. I'm running here a desktop version of Wolfram Language. There's also a cloud version, and I could be running this notebook just in a web browser in the cloud. Um, I'm I'm just doing it uh, locally because it's convenient to do that. Um, okay, so let's. So actually, you know what? Just for fun, let me let me push something to the cloud. Just to, just as a just what the heck? Let's say I want to cloud publish. Um, and for example, let me make an API that will take an integer. So let's say we make an API function um, that will be take an integer at n. It's well, we'll say it's of type integer there. Um, and let's say what we do here is let's compute one of those. Uh, let's make that graph there. Um, let's say so now this is going to be a pure function, um, anonymous function, lambda, whatever you call it. Um, using that thing that's called n, let's go. Okay, let's do this. All right, let's see what happens if I do this. So what this should do is, um, actually, let, let me not make it a, a, an API function. Let me make it a form function, um, just because it'll be a little bit easier to see what's going on. Okay, so what I did there was I, I made this be something that was now uh, uh, published to the cloud. So I get a URL there, and I can get up. If I go to that URL, there I have a, an N there, and I could type, let's say, 99 or something, press submit, and hopefully there we go, we get a result. So that was that was just pushing that piece of that little fragment of code there um, that was uh, was now being pushed into the into the cloud and it's running against a Wolfram engine in the cloud. Okay, let's um since we're talking about language design, let's talk a little bit about things like how would you define a function? So what we're dealing with, fundamentally, the operation that Wolfram Language does is it takes symbolic expressions and it makes transformations on those symbolic expressions. So for example, I could say, I could have an expression and I could say, uh, let's see, is that a, um, the, uh, um, I could just say something like fib of one equals fib of two, oops, I'm typing the wrong thing, equals fib of two equals one, okay? So now if I say what's uh, what's fib of two, it'll say it's one, great. If I say what's fib of three, it'll say, I don't know. It's just fib of three. It's just that symbolic thing, fib of three. Now, but now let's say that I want to tell it what's fib of any number, anything, n. I, I could as well here say fib of, you know, x to the fifth minus five or something. It'll just say, I don't know what that is. It's just a symbolic thing. But now what I can do is I can say fib of Let's say n blank colon equals fib of n minus one plus uh, fib of n minus two. Oops. Okay, what does this mean? That blank just stands for any expression. So remember, all it's doing is it's making transformation rules for symbolic expressions. That blank stands for any expression. The n names that thing n, and then it uses it on the right hand side. So if now I type, you know, fib of ten or something, I'll just get the, that result. If I wanted to memoize this, I would just type fib of n, that colon equals is a delayed assignment. I would just type fib of n equals that. Then I can do this and I could compute fib of 100 or something, and it will be memoizing uh, each of those steps. But so this idea that blank stands for anything, 
there's many generalizations of this, but let me let me clear fib so that I don't uh, make a big mess here. But let, let's say I let's say I say something like um, uh, f of x blank y blank something like this. I could say that colon equals let's say g of y or something g of of y x or something. Okay, what does that mean? That means if we have something which is of the form let's say u comma five comma six, they'll say, I don't know what that is, doesn't match. If I say u comma five comma five, it will use that, oops, did I, do, oh, I did it the wrong way around. This should have been comma u. Um, then it will, it will use that pattern. It will then use the transformation rule that we have defined for that pattern. Now I have to say that in my use of orphan language, I hate defining things like this. I, I much prefer to have everything be as immutable as possible. But um, this is that that's uh, and, and so uh, I could perfectly well if I if I say something like I don't know I make um, well we can we, we can we can use this as well to let's say we say cases in um, let's make a table uh, that's a good example here let's make a table of uh, this isn't going to be so exciting well no it doesn't matter we we, we could say something like um, uh, Let's make uh, here. Let's let's make an array of primes. So here we'd say array prime hundred. That will make a, a array of the first hundred primes. Just to understand what was. Oh yeah, I should explain something else. It's important here. That thing prime is just a function like f. We can say f of x. We can say f of x of f of x of y. We can do all kinds of things. We can have this head can be an arbitrary expression. If that head is prime, that is a, as a known thing. So prime of six will be the sixth prime number. When I say this, it is equivalent to saying something like prime of hash sign, ampersand, that thing there is just a pure function. It's just a lambda. I could equally well write that out as function of x prime of x. Um, any, anything like that, or I could write it in the, that other notation. I could write it something like this. They're all the same. Um, these are so when I take something like this, I can then take that object that is just a head, and I could say, you know, f equals that if I wanted to, but I can just take that head and apply it to some number here. And now I'll get the 666 prime. Okay, so uh, that's, a, that's a little bit on the kind of on, on the language. Um, the, the sort of the big story of this language is that there are about 7,000 of these built in primitives things like prime that try to capture not only kind of computational kinds of things, but things about the world. So for example, let, let's say uh, we could go ahead, we could say, I don't know, give me a list of words, for example. And so this will by default, will just give us a list of, of words in English. And we could say something like, let's, let's just take the, um, uh, let's just take the first letter of every word in, in the words in English, there we get that result. And now let's say something like word cloud of that. Um, and then we will get uh, a word cloud, which will show us the, the relative frequencies of words in English. And if we want to be a little bit more ornate, we could say instead of uh, English, we could say, we could pick another language here. We'll, we'll have data on lots of languages. I don't know, let's pick, um, let's pick Russian, for example. Um, and uh, might have to look, okay, there we go. So there's the, there's the corresponding result for Russian. Okay. so. So knowing about the world, how do we, what kinds of things do we know about the world? Well, let's, let's, look, at, um, let's look at something else. So this, some, this idea of symbolic expressions, we can use that to represent things, real things in the world, not just X or some polynomial, you know, we could, we could work out some symbolic integral where we have, uh, you know, where the, um, uh, I don't know, where, where, where the, um, uh, where the x is standing for an algebraic variable, but the x as well can stand for some real thing in the world. Like it's, it could stand for, I don't know, London, for example. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm typing in that input in natural language, and that was a, a little sort of uh, input device, control equals, um, that uses our Wolfram Alpha technology stack um, to do natural language understanding, to take the, the thing that we're entering as natural language and turn it into an entity. So this thing here is just a symbolic object. So for example, if I say, what is it? What is it actually made of? It's an entity of type city, London, greater London, United Kingdom. 
Okay, but this entity is something that we know things about. So, for example, we could say London and we could say something like population here, and now it should be able to tell us what's going on. There we go. It gives us a number of people. Maybe we could even say if we wanted to, I don't know if this will work well, but, but let's see what happens. If I say, show us the population, I don't know how much data it will have on this. Okay, so it's got 27 data points. It gives us a time series. Now we can say date list plot. That time series, again, is just a symbolic expression. I could open it up. I mean, any one of these symbolic expressions, just to be clear, this thing here is just a symbolic expression. And what is that symbolic expression? Well, we could, if we wanted to, we could say, show that in full form. I'm just using a, a input device here. Slash slash just means apply the, the that, uh, just, just to show you how this works. There are, you know, when I say f of x, that's one notation. I can say f at x, that means exactly the same thing. I can say x slash slash f, that means exactly the same thing. It's just a convenient way to do this. The full form of that is just this thing that again is this collection of, of, of powers like of, um, uh, of, of expression like that. So for example, if we wanted to, we could say, show us the tree form uh, of that expression. And uh, there it is. And that's, that's kind of how, how the language thinks about any kind of expression. And again, this tree form is the thing on which pattern matching operates. And the whole operation of the language is you just take a collection of, of transformation rules defined by patterns and apply them. And you just keep applying them until you reach a fixed point, And that's the result. Maybe I'll talk a little bit more about the, all the subtleties of kind of the evaluation process, and that will segue into talking about the fundamental theory of physics, actually. Um, and we'll see how that, how that uh, comes out in a minute. But let's go back here. Um, we, we had worked out the population of London. Let's see, that was on line 48. Um, and uh, so now that's showing the population of London as a function of time based on the curated data that we have. And we've been collecting data about lots of kinds of things for many, many years now and have uh, a huge amount of data, including all sorts of real-time feeds of data and so on. Um, but let's, okay, so let, let's do something else. Let's say something like uh, capital cities in Europe. So now what we're doing is we're using natural language to basically have a quick way to enter something we could have entered. Um, we could have entered precisely here, but it's a convenient way to do that. So this will give us the, um, the countries in Europe as an, that, that is a symbolic object, and then capital city, another symbolic object. Here are a bunch of symbolic objects. What can we do with these symbolic objects? We could say something like geolist plot um, that will just give us a, um, uh, that will show us where all those cities are. Or for example, we could say something like uh, geo position of, uh, we could just go ahead and see, what was that? That was, um, well, let's just take it again. Um, we'll just say geo list plot, geo position of all those things. And maybe we could say, actually, no, you know what? I can just take the original thing. Let me see if this works. Uh, I think it probably will. Um, let's see if I can do that. There we go. So what that's doing is it's solving the traveling salesman problem for that collection of cities. And um, it's showing us a, a tour. So now what I've got to do is take that, that list of cities and go ahead and uh, I could do this more elegantly perhaps with a nice pure function, but let's go ahead here and just say, um, just get that list of cities in the right order. And then let's say, make another geo list plot. And uh, let's say we join the, um, the points there and um, uh, there we'll have our traveling salesman tour of the of the cities of of the capital cities of Europe. Okay, so so lots of kinds of things that we can do that are sort of built-in features of of the language. Um, we could uh, equally well um, let, let's do something that's more machine learning like. Let's take. Um, I think I had a picture up here. Let's. There's a good picture. There, there we've got a picture. So let's take that picture and let's say something like. Um, let's just try image identify that picture. Um, and see what see what that gives. See what how how silly the result is. Or actually, perhaps more interestingly, let's. Um, okay, that wasn't too exciting. Let's say we say something like facial features. Um, and again, it might need to download a classifier from the cloud to be able to use locally, or may just crunch on it for a little while. Um, and there we go. Okay. Um, so sad. Um, the. Uh, uh, so, so that was just an, another, uh, but let, let's, let's ask the question, let, let's look at, for example, how some machine learning training might work. So let's say we say resource data, we've, I think we can pick up 
We've got a big data repository that has all sorts of useful kinds of data. This particular thing is probably the MNIST training set. Um, so let's uh, load that in here. Come on, there we go. Okay, so that's handwritten digits. That's 60,000 of those things. So now let me take a random sample of, let's say of that, let's take a random sample of a thousand of those and let's um, then, uh, okay, there we go. And now let's take that and we've got a built-in function that's called classify that will try and build a classifier for those digits. So it'll go and it'll it'll show us a little progress monitor, but it'll now go and, and try and um, use sort of automated, it's kind of rather automated machine learning. So it'll try a bunch of different methods to find a good classifier based on that. And the thing that we'll get back as our classifier is a classifier function that is essentially just like a Lambda, that it's just a, another one of our pure functions that we can apply to things. Okay, there's our classifier function. Okay, let's go pick up a digit from here. Let's go pick up that digit there. Um, and let's just take that classifier function and apply it to that digit. And there, okay, it says it's zero, good. Okay, so that, that gives us some sense of how, and, and we could do this with, um, with much crunchier uh, kinds of things. Maybe it's interesting to see if we, if we just look at, um, uh, at one of these, um, uh, here we go, there's our image identification network. This is the raw network. And we could go and we could drill down and we could see what's inside that network if we wanted to. We can also build it up with functional primitives. Um, or we could we could go ahead and let, let's just take just a few layers of the neural net, let's say five layers of the neural net, and apply that to where was our picture? Let's apply that that to um to this picture here, for example. Um, and uh, so that's just five layers of the neural net. We'll apply it and we'll get out a okay, we might need to let's try doing this. Let's make that a collection of images, that slash at is a map. Um, okay, so there we've got a collection of images that were what happened at layer five in that neural net. So and for example, we could say, make a feature space plot of those and it'll try and uh, lay those out. That wasn't very exciting. It will lay those out in a kind of feature space where it's showing us um, which things it thinks are connected to which other things. So, okay, well, this, this perhaps gives a sense of uh, kinds of, um, I mean, there are many different kinds of um, uh, of data and things that we have. Let, let, let me let me try and give some some sense of scope of the types of things that we deal with. Um, we, our goal, as I say, is is to be able to represent sort of anything in the world computationally. And so there are many kinds of things to represent, things like geometry, things like text, being able to do natural language understanding. Well, we we have a uh, both natural language understanding and uh, here, let, let's try this. Let's try, we say something like Wikipedia data of, let's see, I wonder what happens if I type in the control equals closure. Um, I think it will probably know, okay, closure, programming language. Let's see what it knows about it. Um, you can tell me whether it's right. Uh, so let's just have it disgorge a whole data set of stuff that it knows. Okay. So, um, Let's let's do this. Let's take that closure programming language entity and let's say let's get Wikipedia data for it. Um, so now we can go ahead and um, uh, I hope and have it. There we go. Okay. So now there's some text. Maybe we want to take. Um, how about we do the following? Let us try. We're living dangerously here. Let's say text cases in that of uh, programming language. Let's see whether that, let's see whether it can um, extract natural, do natural language extraction from that. Uh, what do I want to hit? Um, oh, that's not what I want. Okay. Um, I thought that was what I wanted. Well, all right, let's try this. Okay, so now it's going to try and scan that, um, that piece of text and give us all the instances, I hope, of programming languages Oh, it probably had to load a, a classifier from the cloud here. Um, it's probably still loading a classifier. There we go. Detecting entities. Okay, good sign. Interpreting results. Let's see what it does here. Okay, there we go. So that that's giving us. Uh, it was actually we just told it to give us the strings for those things. So that now, so now, just for fun, we can make a word cloud of the appearances of different languages in the Wikipedia entry for closure. Um, then, um, okay, what, what are some other kinds of things we can do? We can deal with things like 
uh, well, we can do all all kinds of deep mathy kinds of things. We can deal with things like geometry. That's a that's an interesting thing to see. Let me see what could we do there. We could take um, uh, well, let's just um, yeah, let's just do this. Let's say random real numbers. Let's say a bunch of random real numbers from um, uh, let's say um, sixty random real numbers, sixty random triples of real numbers, and then let's say uh, con. Uh, let's try this. I wonder what this will look like. Um, concave hull mesh. I don't know what this will do. There we go. Okay. So there's a 3D object that we made from those points. And now we could do something we can say, again, it's a, it's a symbolic thing. So we just pick this up and just feed it in to, let's see what happens. If we just feed that in to um, uh, volume here, and ask it what's the volume of that thing. Oh, undefined. Maybe I want to ask it the surface area. Uh, there we go. Yes, it's because it's a, because what we gave it that because it's a it's a mesh. It's a two dimensional mesh, so it just has a surface area. So that's that's that kind of thing. Or, or another thing we could do. Let's let's just look at one more thing here. We could say something like a video. Um, let's say we um, uh, we have. Um, let me see what I can find here. Um, Let's let's take a sample video. Okay, I think I have one here. Um, this is just, I mean, we could load. Okay, so now we've got a video. We can play this video. It's some video of some little critter here. Let's say, actually, if we just say video frame list, um, we could say of that, and let's say 10 frames, then we'll just extract 10 frames from the video. But we can also use the video as something that we... Um, uh, map a function over. So let's say we say um, video uh, video map time, and we have to say what we want out. So video map time series, and let's say we want, let's say we just want measurements, image measurements. Um, we're going to have to. It's a little bit tricky because it can also work on the audio and things. So let's let's um, okay. Let, let's get just the mean uh, color out of this, and let's say that's a function. So then we want to map that function over the original video, which was on line 78. Uh, actually, uh, if I really wanted to show off, I would I would copy that video and stick it in there, but let's not do that. Um, the Okay, it's easier to just type that. Okay, let's see what this does. So that's now going to go and process the frames in the video, and it's doing that, uh, you know, it's doing all this sort of out of core-ish stuff that it should do to do this efficiently. It's processing the frames in that video, and what it should bring back here is a time series that will be the, um, uh, it should be the three color channels. Okay, so that's the number of points. So now we can say something like date list plot, whoops, um, of that. And let's just, uh, because we know it's red, green, blue, we can just say red, by the way, it's, it's worth seeing that red, again, it's a symbolic thing. So we can just say, we could evaluate it in place. It's just red. It's just that, that uh, swatch of color, red, green, blue. Okay, let's look at that. What did I do here? It's not, oh, oh, that's because I evaluated this, silly me. Okay, um, okay, there we go. Okay, so that is now giving us the amount of red, green, and blue in the successive frames of that video. And also, I mean, we can do the same kind of thing with audio. If I just stand here and say something like, uh, say audio capture, and I say, hello, can my computer understand me? then I should get a piece of audio. And again, as another symbolic object here that we can go and we can say something like, if we wanted to, we could say, make a spectrogram of that object. And then it will show me the, the, um, the spectrogram of my, of my voice there. But I could also just say speech recognize of that um, original thing that was on line 84 there. Um, and now hopefully it will go and see whether it can understand what I was talking about there. Okay. Um, so there's the result. All right. So anyway, so this is a little bit of a, a sketch of, of what Wolfram language can can do. Um, the as I say, the the objective is represent sort of everything in the world um, in a kind of symbolic computational way. Um, and uh, whether that's some um, data, we could pick up all kinds of other data. I don't know. There's all sorts of fun data we can. All right. Let's just try one other thing. Let's say random entity, and then let's say movie. Um, so we'll pick up, let's pick up, um, uh, I don't know, 20 random movies, okay? And now we could say something like entity, again, these are symbolic objects, so entity value that 
comma image, and this will be uh, should give us some uh, movie posters of the ones that are available. We could say something like delete missing here. Um, and then we could say something like if we wanted to, we could say feature space plot, uh, or we could we could do uh, image processing on these if we wanted to, but I showed you feature space plot before, so we could try doing that. And that's not very exciting for these ones, but that's giving us uh, some sense of, of where these uh, images lie in feature space. Okay, so anyway, lo lots of things that Wolfram Language can do. Um, also this whole interaction with the cloud and so on. Now, Wolfram Language has its roots in the kernel of Wolfram Language is just an engine that you can perfectly well access. In principle, you can access on the command line. What was happening there? Uh, can I use a command line anymore? Yes, okay, there we go. So here I can, I can as well type something like this in, or I could say I could start typing in those entity objects and so on. And all of this will just work. Or I could say now that will give us a date object that would look more beautiful if you were using the notebook interface but you can still get everything in this kind of um, traditional, um, the uh, um, uh, traditional kind of um, uh, command line interface. Uh, this is actually what I'm running here is actually the free Wolfram engine for developers. That's a thing you can just download and and uh, and launch. Okay, so what kinds of things can you do with the with Wolfram engine? Uh, with Wolfram engine, well, you can interact with it from other languages. Maybe I should show, by the way, something else. In, in a notebook, I could I could actually interact with a bunch of external languages. Clojure isn't yet one of these, it should be. Um, uh, we would love to get help in building that. Um, but for example, I could interact with Python here and I could say, I don't really know Python, so uh, I don't know, I could just type something here. And the, the, the main point is that there's a translation of data structures. I don't actually know, is there a, Oh dear, I don't know anything about, is there, a, is there a function like that in Python? I don't know. It's, we're about to, oh yes, there is. Okay, so notice that that came back. Oh, it's a zero origin language. Okay, um, that came back as, um, uh, as an actual Wolfram language list where I could go and I could say, you know, that to the power six or whatever else. So that's calling an external language from within Wolfram language. We can also go and call from external languages into Wolfram language. So there's a well-developed, for example, Python client library. And one of the things that I really wanted to see happen as, as part of uh, doing this keynote was I, I wanted to see if we could use this to stimulate the actual creation of a link from Clojure to Wolfram language so that you can call Wolfram language from within Clojure. And I'm happy to say that thanks to a bunch of work uh, that was done, um, well, uh, initially many years ago by, by Garth Sheldon Coulson and, and uh, his contributors to a project called Kujaratica, um, but more recently by Christopher Small and Pavel Saranka and other people involved in uh, Reclosure, um, we've been able to produce something, they've been able to produce something which is a link from uh, Clojure to Wolfram Language. So let's let's try and see what we can do with it. And remember, this is I'm I'm operating in an alien world here, so things may go horribly wrong. Um, but uh, let, let's start off with something like this. We can say something like um, uh, evaluate, and then I could say something. This is this is a familiar world for me. I can I can type in some just Wolfram language code in a string here, and I can get oh, what happened here. Help! Help! Did I do the wrong thing? Do I have to? Oh no! I'm. This is. I see. I told you it's an alien world. Um, there we go. Is that going to work? No. Well, that's certainly not going to work because it auto completed that bracket. Okay. There we go. More like it. Okay. So, and let's say we let's say we have a instead here. We just evaluate a Wolfram language string, and we let's say we have some kind of list here. Let's say we make a um, uh, uh, an array of of primes here. Um, uh, let's make 20 primes there. Um, okay, there we go. So that, now we've got a closure list of those 20 primes. I bet that it's the case that if we make an association, let's see what happens here. Let us see, let's live extremely dangerously here and let's see whether we can do this. Let's try, oh, I don't know how to escape a, a, a um, uh, hmm. Well, let's just see, this, this could be super dangerous. Uh, I'm going to say word translation. Now I'm going to guess that I can escape a quote like that. Let's hope. Um, let's say fish. Uh, and let's say I wanted that in all languages. And now what this is going to do is it's going to do 
something which, let's see what happens if I do this. This may or may not be a terrible idea. Oh, oh, well, that was exciting. Now the only question is how do I display it? Oh, there we go, there we go, there we go. Okay, so this I think will be, hmm, it might be what we call an association, what I think in closure is called a map um, of, uh, so this will be entity, something or other, the translation for the word fish into Hebrew and uh, Croatian and all these other different languages here. Um, but okay, so, more interestingly, so this is just using, uh, just sending Wolfram language code as a string, but more interesting is that we've got this namespace, this Wolfram namespace loaded in, and now all of the names, all those 7,000 names in Wolfram language appear as direct names inside Clojure. So for example, now is this date object Again, you in, in a notebook, this would be printed out a bit more beautifully, but this is the raw expression form of a data object. And for example, if we say something like, I don't know, uh, let's try um, uh, something like, well, let's try something, let's see, what would we want to do here? Let's say we say, well, let's do, let's do one of our prime things. Let's say prime, uh, let's say prime of that. And let's now evaluate that. That will give us a result. Um, let's, uh, we could be more elaborate. We could say something like, um, uh, let's try doing, um, let's try doing something that um, involves, uh, well, let's see. Um, we could try just doing something which says, which is map. Uh, and then we could say something like, um, I wonder if this is going to work. Quote F, that will be our symbolic F, onto, and let's try this. Uh, let's say, ah, I'm typing commas. I shouldn't be typing commas. Let's see that what happens if I do this. Okay, there we go. So that's now, uh, that's now the symbolic result of that map in Wolfram language. And we could as well have, have used some other Wolfram language thing here. Okay, so... Let's see, we could try also doing some graphics. I believe there's a, a function called, um, uh, let's see, I think it's called quick show. Does this autocomplete? Yes, it does. Um, okay, quick show. And now we want to say something like, um, uh, well, let's, let's just be cheap here. And let's just say, uh, let's just use the evaluate thing. Let's say we say, um, uh, let's say graphics 3D, of a dodecahedron, dodecahedron. Um, actually, you know, we could hook up the language server protocol mechanism that we have for bringing um, our syntax into this. That would probably be a good thing to do. Um, okay, let's see what happens here. Now, if, I, if all goes according to plan, that will generate output. Okay, what is that doing? That, that will generate output, which I think will come up in another window if I can find that window. Hold on one second. Let's go on a window hunt here. Uh, hmm. Hmm. Let me see. I wonder what it's. Uh, I wonder what it would be identified as in the task manager here. Well, it was coming up in a separate window. I'm sorry. That doesn't seem to be. I don't. I don't seem to be able to find that extra window. Um. It's, uh, oh, wait a minute, what's, what's this? This might be it, but I wonder whether that, that um, let's try running that again. Um, did it, fine, let's see. No, I don't know what that window is. Anyway, it was working beautifully. Um, to have the graphics um, be, be generated into this window here. So anyway, that, that's that's a little bit of a sketch. And, and I'm kind of hoping that uh, you can think of Wolfram Language and the Wolfram Engine as just being a giant library that you can immediately call from Clojure here to get all of those, all of those capabilities that exist in Wolfram Language. And I think the fact that uh, Clojure is sort of a list-based system that has sort of symbolic aspects to it and functional aspects to it will mean that this connection is one that's really quite rich and quite useful. So 
anyway, that, that was, so I, wa I wanted to make sure to show that and I'm really uh, uh, thank the folks who, who worked on, on, on getting this to go. And I should say that you can uh, download from GitHub, you can download the current um, version of this connection and you can also download Wolfram Engine um, from our website and you can uh, uh, play around with this. Uh, before I forget, let me just take this notebook here. And before I go on and talk about some other things, let me take this notebook here and push it to the cloud. Let me just say publish to cloud here of that notebook. And what should now happen is this will now, um, uh, if I press publish here, this will now push that notebook to the cloud and um, we'll, um, and we can put this in, um, it's a bit of a big notebook, I think. Come on, wake up, do your thing. Um, the, uh, okay, let's see, it'll, it'll, it'll now be pushing that to, and, and again, you can, you can edit it and interact with it in the cloud and, and run all those interactive things in it too. At least if it, if it manages to actually get around to pushing it successfully to the cloud, maybe I'll let it, let it do that for a moment and then give you the, um, the cloud link for it. Actually, while, while, while it's doing that, let me just show you, well, of course it finished just as I was saying that, okay. There's a, a cute barcode for it, but let's forget that because we've got Zoom here. So let's just um, uh, let's just send this. I'm not. I'm afraid I'm not reading the things that are in Zoom chat. Um, but there's the um, uh, um, there's that notebook with a rather bad name. Um, shocking. Okay, but anyway, just just for we could just see that notebook if we wanted to. Um, there it is. Oh, it's probably still caching itself. Um, there it is in the cloud. And I could go uh, and say, make your own copy, and then you can go off and start editing it and doing your own computations here. Okay, well, I want to talk about a second thing. I I've shown you a bunch of practical things about computational language. Uh, kind of the aspiration is describe everything in the world computationally, be able to have a language that it's possible for humans to read and work with, as well as computers to understand. And I think that's an important thing because it's kind of the important bridge between sort of what is computationally possible and what we humans can, can understand and, and care about. And we think of it as sort of the computational notation, a bit like mathematical notation. All right, let me, let me move to a sort of second segment here. I want to talk about basic science and I want to talk about the relationship of basic science to thinking about computational language and also perhaps quite directly to some questions about closure and uh, uh, issues about space and time and computation and so on. Okay, so let me, uh, let me uh, many years ago, I was interested in the question of sort of how do systems in nature work? What is the essence of what's going on in systems in nature? And many systems in nature look very complicated. We are um, and one of the things that tended to happen is that sort of the, the standard mathematical methods that one uses to analyze things don't seem to work well for explaining, I don't know, what the shape of a, a snowflake is or something like this. So I got interested in if one's going to be able to make models of things, maybe there's a generalization of the kinds of models that we're used to making from mathematics that we can use to study things in the natural world. And that got me interested in the question of what is the most general class of kind of models for things that one can make. And I realized that, well, programs are a good kind of raw material for those models. So then I got interested in the question, very basic science question of what do simple programs actually typically do? If we make a program that's just like half a line of code long, what will it typically do? Uh, I've now like to call this field ruleology, the study of rules and what they do. But a particular kind of program that I got interested in um, are things called cellular automata. And um, these are, so let me show you a typical cellular automaton. So its rule is, um, uh, it's very simple rule. It just has a row of black and white cells. And at every step, you update the color of the center cell, depending on its color on the previous step and the colors of its two neighbors. Okay, so given that, we can say what, what will that cellular automaton do? And so here we can say, let's, let's use that particular rule. Let's start it off from just one black cell. Let's run it for 40 steps and let's uh, show what the result is. Okay, so there's the result. We start off from just one black cell. We're following this particular rule at every cell at every step. That's what we get. Very simple rule, very simple behavior. And I'm gonna save this again into something called closure-o2. Um, and uh, 
Okay, so now the question is, well, what, what about other possible rules? Here's another possible rule. This is just using the, the same, same idea, but a different detailed pattern of, of bits there. Uh, and you can think of this as a Boolean expression if you want to. I'm sure I can even, I wonder if I can actually translate that directly into a Boolean expression. Might be able to. Um, actually, I could just say Boolean function 90 comma three, and then I could say, um, ah, there we go. And so that if I just said ABC, that would be some, and let's say I say uh, Boolean minimize of this, uh, there we go. So that, that particular rule, rule 90, that's, uh, it's, uh, that must be a DNF form of that, uh, of that function. And any one of these things we could, if we wanted to, we could represent it as a, a little program like that. So the question, the sort of basic science question is, you just look in this computational universe of possible programs, what kinds of behavior do you find? It's like kind of turning a computational telescope out there and seeing what you see. So let, let's go try and take a look at that. Let's say N here, let's say uh, 40 steps, let's do this. Let's get rid of that. And let's make a table. Uh, N goes from let's say zero to 63. Okay, so this is kind of a basic computer experiment, uh, just seeing what do these programs typically do. So some of them produce these nested patterns. There's an example of that. Some of them just do very simple things, but my all time favorite is this one rule 30, and that's what it does. So let's let's take a look at that in a bit more detail. Let's say we run it for um, run rule 30, let's say for 400 steps or something. Um, rule 30 there, uh, 400 steps. Um, and uh, okay, this is what it does. So to me, this is a very remarkable phenomenon because we have a very simple rule, starts off from just one black cell, and yet it makes all of this complexity. It's as if there's some mechanism here that in fact is the one we think nature uses. It's kind of the secret that nature uses to make all the kind of complexity it seems to make is in the computational universe of possible programs, it's actually very easy to go even from a very simple program to make what seems to be very complicated behavior. So for example, here over on the left-hand side, there's some regularity, but if you look at, for example, the center column of cells here, they seem for all practical purposes random. They're random enough that we've used them as a pseudo-random generator for, for many years. So, and, and you, can, you can make many kind of scientific conclusions from this. This turns out to be a great source of raw material for making models of things in the world, these kinds of, of, of systems like cellular automata. There's some deeper kind of computational ideas that come out. For example, one question would be, uh, what if you want to figure out what this will do in a billion steps? Well, sort of the traditional story in science is, all you have to do is find a model for something. Once you found a model, you're pretty much done with the science. But so that would suggest that given the model, which is very simple in this case, just the simple rule 30 rule, we should be able to immediately say what will happen after a billion steps. But in fact, we can't. In fact, most likely, this is an example of a system that is computationally irreducible. What that means is the only way to find out what the system will do after a billion steps is essentially to run it for a billion steps and see what happens. This is kind of something closely related to undecidability. If we ask what will it do after an infinite time, that will be a question that we can't answer in any finite amount of time and so on. But this idea of computational irreducibility, this idea that there are computations where you can't kind of shortcut them is a very important idea that, that kind of uh, that gives one a lot of different intuition about how things work in the world. Uh, here's an example of one uh, this is rule 110. It happens to only grow on one side. Let me run it for a few more steps. Let's run it for a couple of thousand steps. Uh, oh, let's make it bigger. Um, okay, you might be able to see if it isn't too anti-aliased out um, that there's some little structures here. Here, let, let me do this. Let me, let me run rule 110 starting from random initial condition. Um, Uh, let's run it for 600 steps or something there. Oops. Um, okay, so here I've just run that for for uh, with a random initial condition. You'll see it makes these little structures, these kind of like particle-like structures that are running around. And you might say, kind of looks like that thing is doing a computation. Well, it turns out that it is, and you can show that in fact, you can make a universal computer out of the rule 110 cellular automaton. It's an example of, of um, 
of where you can get uh, sort of arbitrary computational sophistication from an extremely simple rule. But one thing you can also ask about rule 110 is, okay, it starts off from one black cell at the beginning. You see it generates all this complicated structure. You can ask, what will it do in the end? Well, if, there were, if it was computationally reducible, you'd be able to just jump ahead and say, given that I know the rule, I can immediately say the result will be such and such. But because it's computationally irreducible, you can't do that. You basically just have to wait and see what it does, and eventually it will it will die out. This this pattern will die out. Um, one of the things that uh, well, there are many things to say about this. I've worked on these things for for a long time. But one of the principles that's rather important is this thing I call the principle of computational equivalence. And the issue is when you just look at simple programs or simple systems and you ask how computationally capable are they? Well, something that just produces, let's say, a simple nested pattern, we can say it's not very computationally capable. But one of the things that that I concluded a long time ago is that there's a but above the threshold where it doesn't look obviously simple, the behavior that the system will generate will correspond to a computation which is as sophisticated as any computation that can be done. So in other words, that what that means is it, it says things like, as soon as you get above some very simple, some very low threshold, essentially every system you look at will be capable of universal computation. So it will be capable. So in other words, from rule 110, if we could make a molecule that would execute the rule 110 cellular automaton, which is not a completely out of range kind of thing to imagine doing, and maybe I'll talk, maybe if I have a chance, I'll talk a little bit about using combinators and things and actually making molecules from those. Um, but uh, the, if, if you could make a molecule that would execute rule 110, you would have something that is computation universal. Okay, so the fact that we can get very simple rules, produce very complicated behavior, we can use a bunch of things like cellular automata as kind of raw material to make practical models of things in the world, that leads one to a big question, which is, okay, we can see that very simple rules can produce very complicated behavior. What about this whole universe that we live in? Could it be that the whole universe is actually constructed from some very simple rule, and we are just seeing all the consequences of the exit of the running of that particular simple rule? So I thought about this for, for a long time, and a couple of years ago, we had sort of a breakthrough in thinking about that. And the result of that breakthrough is that at this point, I think we have really nailed understanding essentially what the machine code of the universe is like. And um, uh, I'm not sure that I really have a chance to go through this in tremendous detail, but I'm happy to try and answer questions about it and things. Uh, let me let me try and give you a sketch of this. And um, uh, the this this project has gone just remarkably and outrageously well. Um, I, I I have to say I had not thought that understanding the foundations of physics will be anything like as easy as it's turned out to be. Now let me just mention something. As we understand the foundations of physics computationally, that will also allow us to understand the foundations of computation physically. And in fact, things about actual practical programming languages and distributed computing and so on, it looks as if we can get a great deal of inspiration and ideas from understand, from leveraging the kind of the achievements of physics and applying them to computation now that we understand that computation underlies physics. But let me try and give you a little bit of a sketch of, of how our kind of model of how physics works um, uh, is put together. And I will say that this, this model I view as being kind of the underlying machine code of the universe. And there've been many other approaches from, I don't know, causal set theory to spin networks to, to string theory, we're not so sure about that one yet, uh, to a bunch of other kinds of approaches to, to physics. And one of the things that's been really remarkable is that it looks as if what we have built is kind of machine code that underlies all of those different approaches. It's not that we're right and they're wrong, it's that we are the kind of underlying machine code from which you can see all these things uh, uh, operating. It's, it's I view it as a little bit like what sort of happened in the early days of computation when people understood once you'd seen a Turing machine, you could realize that it was equivalent there was a, a pretty explicit way to understand what was going on in computation. And it turned out then to be equivalent to a bunch of other ideas people had had about how computation might work. Okay, so how does this how does this get put together? So the first thing is, what's the universe made of? Well, at, at the first step, one might say the universe is laid out in space. 
ever since Euclid, we thought about space as just a background kind of thing. We say there's this there's space and we can put things at a particular position in space or another position and so on. Space is just this background kind of thing. Well, we might say, uh, but but one of the one of the sort of key ideas of, of our project is space is actually made of something. It's a little bit like we might say if we have some water or something like that. We might say water flows around and we could, you know, pick any position in the water and it's it's all fine, just like we can pick any position in space. But in fact, we know that water is made of discrete molecules. And so we couldn't, in fact, pick any position. We might hit a molecule or we might not. Well, so one of the, the sort of foundational ideas is space is made of something. Space is made of what we can call atoms of space, discrete elements. These are not actual atoms of any kind. They are just pure elements. They are things. You can think of them as things with a UUID. They, they, they have, they're just abstract elements. And the only thing we know about these abstract elements is how they're related to each other. So, for example, we might say that there's this sequence of three elements and they are in a relation with each other. And we, we so when we do that, what we're building up is essentially a hypergraph. We're saying there are just these, these, all these, all these elements, all these atoms of space, maybe in our universe right now, there are about 10 to the 400 of these atoms of space. And all these atoms of space are arranged in a giant hypergraph. Okay, so what happens then is we, we go from these kind of this, um, this discrete networks that um, represent, that correspond to all these atoms of space connected in this hypergraph. And then we look at the limit of that hypergraph when it gets very large. And one of the important things is that that limit behaves like ordinary space. It's much the same kind of thing as happens in a fluid where there are a bunch of discrete molecules bouncing around, but on a large scale, it seems to behave like a continuum fluid. And it's the same thing with space. So if you were to drill down to space, down to a, a size of maybe 10 to the minus 100 meters, you would start seeing space is actually made of discrete things. But to us, at our usual scale of a meter or so, space seems completely continuous, just as a fluid seems continuous. So, okay, so that's that's kind of what space is made of. And, and it's not even obvious what the dimension of space would be. One can start understanding kind of as one, let, let me just show you how uh, one can start sort of understanding the, um, let me see, uh, I want that. Okay, so here's a, here's a typical uh, network that might represent a very tiny piece of space. Uh, here are maybe some other networks. Now, one of the things is that these networks can have a, uh, uh, we're not even defining the dimension of these networks. Um, sometimes we might have a network that could get laid out like this, which looks like a sort of two dimensional thing that's curved, but we can start asking, you know, how will we define the dimension of these networks? And we can do that just in terms of the kind of discrete structure. We can say we start at a point we just build this kind of ball by progressively going more and more steps away from that point in the in the network. And if we say that the number of, of nodes that we reach is about r to the d, then that exponent d characterizes the dimension of the space. And there's a correction term to that that characterizes the curvature of the space. And that co correct correction term, the sort of the dynamics of that correction term gives one the structure of space and gives one things like gravity. Now, let me, let me explain something about, so we've got this network. The question is, how does this network, what, what happens? How does it progress in time, for example? And the idea is that there's just a rewrite rule. It's, it's very much like the expression rewrite rules that I talked about in Wolfram language, except now it's operating on elements of a hypergraph. And so here, we're just, we're just saying we have this very simple rule. We just apply that rule, and we apply it wherever we can in this hypergraph. And what we'll get, for example, in that case, we might get, um, we'll get a sequence of, uh, uh, of configurations of the graph. This is the sequence of configurations. This might be the very beginning of the universe here. And um, uh, then it's progressing. And by the time we've reached today, it's many, many steps forward. And it's a big thing that behaves like space as we, as we currently see it. Okay, so essentially what happens is there's time in our models is something rather different from space. Time is this kind of inexorable progress of computation of the progressive rewriting of this hypergraph. Space is kind of the extent of the hypergraph. So then one question is, well, how do things like relativity arise? It turns out the important thing to understand is that 
as entities kind of existing in this universe, there are only certain aspects of what the, what happens that we can be sensitive to. In particular, we can think of every rewrite here as being an event. And that event, that rewrite, is effectively taking certain inputs. It's like a function. The rewrite is like a function that's taking certain inputs. It's taking certain hyper edges, and it's then rewriting those hyper edges and producing other hyper edges. It's just like the application of a function. And the uh, and so one question is, what are the causal relationships between different function applications? And so we can build up a causal graph that represents the causal relationship between updating events. And it turns out that as entities embedded within this network, within this, this, this system, the only thing we can ever be sensitive to is that causal graph, not the actual arrangement of, of, of this hypergraph, but only just the causal graph of what event affects what other event. What event, for example, in us is affected by what other event out there in the universe. And so when you construct that causal graph, um, you that, that's, that's what you're sensitive to. There's one other thing. In, in many of these rules, there's a property we call causal invariance, uh, which is a generalization of the property of confluence in term rewriting systems. And the point of that is that it means that there are well, actually, I should explain some other things before I get to that. Let, let me just say that that what 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 you end up doing in this causal graph is you end up saying uh, in the causal graph you've just got a bunch of events. The causal graph defines a partially ordered set of events, and then what you want to do if you are trying to, as an observer of that causal graph, you're trying to make sense of it. You want to say what correspond to the successive moments in time? Or in other words, what correspond to the possible uh, events that could be happening simultaneously in time? And you, you are then building up reference frames by foliating, by slicing this causal graph. And so those reference frames are essentially defining which computations, which events can you think of as happening in parallel and which events are forced to happen sequentially. In the language of physics, what you're asking about is what events occur in a time-like sequence, that is one comes after the other in time, and what events can be space-like separated in the sense that they can be at different places in space at the same time. So one of the things that comes out here is that you start thinking about these different reference frames, picking different choices of space-like hypersurfaces that represent the, the, the things that are simultaneous at successive moments in time. And you start imagining the universe, you can sort of think about programming in the universe, and you can think about, well, what reference frame am I going to pick to understand what's going on in the universe? And that story of what reference frame am I going to pick is kind of a story of relativity. And the, the equivalence between different reference frames turns out to be what leads to relativistic invariance. I'll show you just one thing maybe that's sort of a simplified version of that. Uh, let's see if I can find it, here we go. Um, so this is a very simplified version. This is not a hypergraph, this is just a, a string rewriting system. And it's a very simple string rewriting system. It rewrites every string BA to AB. And so what it's going to do is it's progressively going to sort these, um, these, this string. And these are some events. This is one possible collection of events that could be occurring to sort that string. And um, what we can do is to look at different possible, let's see, where do I have an example here? Yeah, we can look at essentially different possible reference frames in which we uh, decide when these events happen. So here we're saying all events that could happen at the same time happen at the same time, and we progressively sort the string quite rapidly. If now we go into a different reference frame, which corresponds essentially to a moving reference frame, where as well as uh, where we think of things as being sort of moving across space as well as progressing in time, we can also, we will also succeed in sorting the string, but we will do so in more time steps. And this is, the, this is the, the fundamental thing that leads to time dilation in relativity. It's the fact that you are using, you have a certain amount of computational resources. You can either use those computational resources to progressively evaluate something uh, at one place in time, or you can use some of those computational resources to essentially rearrange yourself at a different place in space, to move in space. And if you do that, 
you are using some of the computational resources for your motion. And so you have less computational resources to evolve in time. And the result is that time appears to run more slowly and it takes longer in effect to get to the same result. Now, by the way, I think that something very similar to that, you can think about things, even transducers, I think, enclosure and so on. You can think about kind of this, this notion of relativistic transformations on sort of the way that you operate on data structures and with some of these same kinds of effects of time dilation happening there. Um, all right, let's come back to physics for a minute. And let me see if I can, can give you a quick summary of some of the things that we, we figured out here. So one of the big results is that uh, it is a generic fact that when you have these rewrite rules operating on hypergraphs with certain conditions, you end up getting the equations of general relativity, the Einstein equations for the overall structure of the space time that is the continuum limit of these hypergraphs. And it's very much the same kind of thing as when you start off from molecular dynamics in a fluid and you say, what, are the, what is the continuum behavior of the fluid? You can derive the equations of fluid mechanics. So here you can derive the equations of space time. And there are all kinds of things you can, you can understand about how gravity works, how black holes work, all sorts of things like that directly from the structure of these systems. I, just to mention one thing about black holes, Black holes have event horizons. Event horizons are places where the causal graph disconnects, which means that the causation, there is no causation from inside the event horizon to the outside. So there is a disconnection in the causal graph. At the center of the simplest kind of black hole, Schwarzschild black hole, you find that one of the features of, of standard general relativity is that it says that essentially there's this space-time singularity at the center of black hole. In the case of these systems, which can be thought of as kind of uh, term rewriting type systems, that singularity at the center of the black hole is a place where time stops. What does it mean that time stops? Well, what it means is most of the time you've been merrily going along, rewriting your hypergraph according to certain update rules. But when you reach that singularity, what happens is you've reached a normal form. You can no longer do any updates. And when you can no longer do any updates, that means time has stopped. And so that space-time singularity is associated with reaching a fixed point. It's sort of getting the result of your computation. The result is the thing that's the center, at the center of a black hole, and that's the answer. Now, most of what happens in the universe never reaches an answer. Most of what happens in the universe is just an ongoing computation that never stops. You can pick these reference frames to kind of get a snapshot of what the structure of, of the universe is at a particular time, but the computation is going to keep going. I should mention, by the way, that one of the important features of this model is that the only thing in the universe is space. And space is made of this hypergraph. And all the things that we care about, all the particles and all those kinds of things, those are just features of that hypergraph. They're a little bit like in a fluid, you might have a vortex, which kind of persists and moves across the fluid. So similarly here, you might have a particle like an electron that is some topological feature effectively of this hypergraph that can move more or less unchanged across, across the hypergraph. So one of the things you can ask is, well, what fraction of the activity of the universe is involved in just knitting together the structure of space? And what fraction is all the stuff we care about, about electrons and quarks and, and all those kinds of things? Well, a rough estimate is maybe one part in 10 to the 120 of the activity of the universe is involved in all the things we care about. The vast majority of the activity of the universe is merely concerned with the knitting together of the structure of space. OK, let me mention one more thing here, which is, uh, we talked about these, these uh, applying these rewrites to these hypergraphs. One question is, where do you do that? We say, we apply the rewrite wherever we can apply the rewrite. Well, there may be many places we could apply the rewrite. There may even be overlapping places where we could apply the rewrite. Which actual rewrite do we apply and when? So this is sort of a key idea that there isn't just one form of, there isn't just one history for the universe. Instead, each one of the possible sequences of rewrite applications corresponds to a possible history for the universe. So we make a thing we call a multi-way graph, which represents the, the possible sequences of rewrites that can be done on the universe. And so this is a, this is a version of that multi-way graph also showing its multi-way causal graph. Um, but this is, this is basically showing how the universe might start in one state and then it ends up in three different possible states and then maybe some of those states merge and so on. This makes this multi-way graph. Okay, what does this multi-way graph correspond to in terms of known physics? Well, it corresponds to quantum mechanics because the key idea of quantum mechanics is it's distinguished from in classical mechanics 
you know, you throw a ball, it goes on a definite trajectory. In quantum mechanics, the ball follows many possible paths, and we only get to see the probabilities for different paths. Well, here, what's happening is that these are the many paths, and what's happening is that, that we, are, we as observers embedded within the system are essentially looking at collections of these paths. We are essentially conflating together um, in, in the language of, of automated theorem proving, we're doing completions on this, uh, on this kind of term rewriting system to be able to sort of make a, a view of what's actually happening in the universe. In any case, the, the end result of this is that the sort of the, the branching and merging of this multi-way graph gives one quantum mechanics. And that's kind of a nice way to think about it, which is in, in when we talk about this hypergraph, we're talking about the, the extent of the hypergraph corresponding to the extent of physical space. In this multi-way graph, we can take sort of slices at particular times, and we can say, what is the kind of pattern of connection between branches? We can say, if we look at any given pair of, of uh, states here, um, do they have a common ancestor one step back or not? We can make what we call a branchial graph that is a, a map of the sort of entanglements of those states associated with their common ancestry. And this branchial graph defines another kind of space we call branchial space. That's a kind of space in which one is, it's not ordinary space, it's a space of what turn out to be different quantum states. And it turns out that what in physical space corresponds to the, the effect of gravity in branchial space is precisely how quantum mechanics works. The effect of energy momentum on, on the motion of particles, the, the fact that mass curves space-time is equivalent to an effect here where essentially the presence of energy essentially curves this, this uh, um, the, 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 the kind of the branchial space that exists from this multi-way graph. And so it turns out that uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics turn out to be the same theory, except general relativity is in physical space and quantum mechanics is in branchial space. So anyway, the, the, this is, um, so there's sort of a, a big story of how that works and, and how that kind of gives one physics. Um, maybe I'll just mention, uh, well, all right, let, let, me, let me mention a couple of things that, are, that are perhaps go even further than this. So one question is, Let's say we've got this picture and we can say from a particular rule, we can re reproduce something that is like physics. So uh, one question we can, might ask is, why this particular rule and not another one? Doesn't that seem weird that we would have got rule number 714 or something for our universe? What about all the other rules? Okay, this is where things get quite funky. The answer is, there is actually a way of generalizing this multi-way system and saying not just look at at where are all the possible places we can apply a particular rule, but where are all the possible rules we could, what, what are all the possible rules we could conceivably apply? And what we get then is a thing we call the Ruleal multiway system, which says at these branches, we're not just applying the same rule in all possible places, but we're applying all possible rules in all possible places. And the limit of that is this thing that I call the Ruleiad, which is this entangled limit of all possible computations. So what, what, what one effectively has is something where imagine, you could think about it in terms of Turing machines, like maybe show you some pictures of that, um, that uh, you're looking at sort of all possible Turing machines running in all possible ways. You might say, well, how could you conclude anything if you had all possible Turing machines running in all possible ways? Uh, let me just show you one picture there. Um, oh, where is this? Uh, oh, well, let's see. Um, tag. Sorry about this. Um, here we go. Uh, okay, so that's a picture that shows this multi-way graph effectively for all possible. Uh, well, we, we're looking at Turing machines here, and that's that's an ordinary Turing machine just running. That's a multi-way Turing machine that has many possible, several possible outputs from any given uh, from any given state, and we can make a multi-way graph from all possible uh, Turing machines, all possible Turing machine rules, and that's the beginning of that ruleal multi-way graph. We can keep going, and we can look at 
the full version of the sort of graph of all possible uh, all possible outcomes from um, uh, from the Turing machine. And and there it is. The the basically the the this is related to the p versus np problem. The red thing is the is the deterministic computations. The gray thing is all possible computations. But in any case, this is basically showing the very beginning of the structure of this Rouliad, the structure of the entangled collection of all possible computations. The reason it's non-trivial is that even two completely different Turing machines might end up evolving to the same state. And so this thing doesn't just go off in all possible directions. It makes this kind of complicated entangled structure. So in any case, the understanding of what happens in our universe um, is that what we're seeing is slices of that Rouliad. We're seeing something where we are essentially sampling some piece of that entangled structure of all possible, all possible computational rules. And essentially what's happening is that we as observers of the system, we are making certain choices about how we observe the system. Just like in relativity or something, we might pick a reference frame moving at this speed. We might say we're at this particular position in physical space and so on. We're similarly making these choices within this Rouliad, within this, this thing that represents all possible entangled computations. We are at a certain position in essentially physical space. We're also at a certain position in Rouliad space in this Rouliad object. And so what you end up realizing is that the you can the, this is uh, this gets gets a bit deep, but um, uh, the the end result of this is that you can see that it is a feature of the way that we observe the universe, the way that we observe this Rouliad, this um, collection of all possible entangled computations. It's because of the way that we observe it that we conclude that the laws of physics are the way they are. In particular, the fact that we are computationally bounded observers, and also we are observers who believe that we are persistent. That is, even though at successive moments in time, we are made from different atoms of space, we still have the point of view that we are persisting through time. And similarly, when we move around, when we walk around, every time we walk to a different place, we're made of different atoms of space. But yet we have the point of view that we are maintaining our coherence as we walk around, so to speak. And those features are basically what feed back to end up giving one, and this is the surprising thing, giving one the precise features of physics as we know them, of general relativity and quantum mechanics and so on. And that, well, there are many conclusions from this, but, but um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention one last thing, which is the, um, well, one, one consequence of this is it finally gives one a way to understand why the universe exists. It also gives one a way to understand the relationship between physics and mathematics, because essentially what's happening is we're describing this Rouliad as this entangled limit of all possible computations. That is the same description that we might give of all possible mathematics. If we think of mathematics as something built from axioms, we can say, well, we'll pick all possible axiomatic systems and look at their consequences. Well, the thing we'll get from looking at all possible axiomatic systems and their consequences is this exact same Rouliad object. And so essentially what's happening is that mathematics is a particular view of the Rouliad done, made by a mathematical observer and physics is a particular view of the Rouliad made by a physical observer. And so, for example, one of the things I've just been working on, this is kind of hot off the press, so to speak, is trying to make a physicalized model of metamathematics. That is, if we imagine the set of all possible statements that are, can be made in mathematics, there are maybe three million theorems that have been written down in the literature of mathematics. If we look at all possible statements that can be made in mathematics, and we think of them, and we kind of think, what is the continuum limit of mathematics? What will mathematics look like when there are trillions of statements or more that have been made in mathematics? What is the overall structure of metamathematical space? And it turns out that one can make many conclusions about that from what we understand in physics. And in fact, the probably the biggest conclusion is that if you think about automated theorem proving and kind of grinding mathematics down to this kind of very symbolic level, very low level, that's kind of like looking at the molecular dynamics of a fluid. It's grinding it down to a point way below the point with, that we humans usually look at it. And the thing that is 
the basic result seems to be that it is in fact the case that there is kind of a fluid dynamics analog for metamathematics. There is a higher level description that is persistent. There are kind of the analog of vortices in mathematics might be the concept of integers, for example, and that that concept is something that is persistent as kind of you apply the process of mathematical proof. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a, a correspondence between physics and mathematics. All right, that got really abstract. But um, let me maybe finish by, by saying that um, a couple of things. First, firstly, the actual process of evolving, uh, doing simulations of, in our physics project, uh, I have rather a suspicion that some of Clojure's capabilities might allow us to do some rather efficient things in terms of the actual process of evolving hypergraphs and where little pieces of the hypergraph are, in, are effectively left unchanged, other pieces are changing. It's kind of a, a question of sort of keeping track of what's changing and what's not. And what we've learned is that some of that can be, we have kind of a bigger theory of that based on physics. And so that both suggests that perhaps there are ways to use kind of the things that we that uh, might even exist in closure uh, to do with distributed computing to do efficient simulations but also to use the ideas that we've got from physics from this correspondence between computation and physics to understand more about how to think about distributed computation one of the things i've been actively working on is what i call multi computation which is kind of a a different paradigm for making models of things and a different paradigm for thinking about distributed computing that's essentially leveraging the success that physics has had in describing uh, sort of large scale what we now know are, are, are computations all right, I should stop there. I'm sorry I've gone way over time, but I'm happy to have whatever discussion uh, people um, uh, people want at this point. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. So it's, it's just odd now that we don't hear like an applause. Uh, it's, uh, it's so strange in this like a virtual situation. We It looks like nobody's here, but I think everyone was listening very carefully. So let me just making sure that um, people can make their questions we we already collected uh, a lot of questions um so there's an amazing amount of topics there for discussion uh, the incredible features of the wolfram language the closure library that enable us to use that power uh, all the way up to the model to explain the universe black holes relativity a lot of stuff so it will take a lot to decompress um anyway Jordan, are you here with us as well to help with the... Um... Hi, yeah, I'm here. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we accumulated a long list of questions. Um, we encourage our audience anyway to prefer like raising their hands um, and make the question live if possible. It's, it's a nicer interaction, I think. But if not, um, I wanted to just... Um, uh, Stephen, what do we have at the moment? We have uh, about a dozen questions. Um, we have three computer science questions, one a little bit more personal, three more Wolfram language related questions, and I think four or five about physics, and they are like uh, the least. Okay. The least you, and you're going to ask me which order should we take these in? I have no idea. <laughs> no, I was, I was wondering maybe should we rotate a little bit from the different topics so we don't you know, start right, yeah, go, with go ahead. everything computer science and then everything physics. So we'll, we'll start from that. Jordan, you want to start with the first computer science question then? Yeah, so we have the first computer science question here. Mathematica and Wolfram language pioneered some er some ideas that are only now being picked up by the, by the programming mainstream. One prominent example is the use of computational notebook format for interactive development. What would be the one idea from Wolfram language that has been overlooked thus far, but you think it would be really beneficial for users of mainstream of more mainstream languages? Well, you know, to me, the fact that it took 25 years for people to understand the idea of notebooks is kind of mind blowing, because that to me was the simplest of hundreds of ideas that we had in the creation of Wolfram language originally. I would say that the, you know, the biggest idea is this idea of symbolic programming this idea that everything is a symbolic expression and you can manipulate things that way. That's the biggest sort of programming structure idea. The biggest kind of meta idea is uh, this idea of making a computational language, not a programming language. And that's an idea that, that in a sense, you know, we've been building this tower now for basically 40 years. And it's, 
it's kind of it's interesting because it's something where it's not like anybody else is building another tower that's like it. We are the unique such tower. And that has both the good feature that we're the unique such tower and we can live stream our designer reason. We're not worried about anybody stealing our ideas and so on. Um, but on the other hand, it means that it's not trivial to explain what it is that we have. I think, you know, we've been, I, I we just, Mathematica just had its one third century anniversary, so to speak. And I realized that Mathematica has existed, Wolfram Language has existed for half the time that, uh, that kind of um, you know production electronic computers have existed. It's a long time, and we're still at the rate we're going. It's going to be fifty or hundred years before people understand the next level of uh, of concepts. There, I think it is absolutely inexorable and inevitable that computational language is the way that people will think about interacting with computers. Um, it's surprising we're not there yet. Now, having said that. You describe us as not a mainstream programming language. We're not really a programming language, so we're not. We're not. Um, I think we're we're a mainstream system for people computing things. We're not uh, currently viewed as a mainstream language for people doing just programming. I would like to think that in the future, the that just programming isn't really a thing that people will mostly think about doing. They'll think about achieving things computationally. I and mean, I think my my vision is, you know, when I started using computers. Computers didn't have operating systems built in. It was just uh, you know you and the raw computer. Gradually over time, computers got operating systems. They got networking. They got user interfaces. There are sequence of things that you can kind of take for granted when you walk up to a computer. Um, the this idea of having the knowledge of the world built into your computer and a computational language for inter interfacing with that, that's something that in time, eventually, people will take for granted for any kind of computer. I might say that, that you know, there's some gradual progress in seeing that be more mainstream. For example, if you go to Excel today, you'll find a data tab in Excel. If you pull that down, you'll find a bunch of Wolfram data types there where you can start uh, making use of our at least our data soon, hopefully also our computational capabilities directly within any any copy of Excel. So that's kind of an example of a, of a piece of uh, sort of fairly obvious mainstreaming that, that's happening. But uh, yeah, no, so symbolic expressions, symbolic programming, that's probably the thing that has been the most um, not, uh, not absorbed. I think that it's worth understanding, you know, combinators had their 100th anniversary at the end of last year. I made a big study of combinators at that time. Uh, it's interesting that old Moses Schoenfinkel back in 1920 had already figured out a lot of ideas about symbolic programming. Uh, unfortunately, it's, you know, 100 years later, people still don't really understand a lot of those ideas. And, um, you know, it's, it's a slow process, but we're getting there. Okay, so maybe we are going to go with uh, Wolfram language and more business uh, question by Jakub uh, on Discord. So he said, I build customer facing business systems, web shop, data management systems, and I find long, the Wolfram language fascinating. Thanks for the symbolic operation and making everything accessible in the language. So the natural question is, will I be able to build my apps in Wolfram language? Sure. Lots of there are lots of big systems that have been built in Wolfram language. I mean, the you know Wolfram Alpha is one that we're very familiar with because we built it ourselves, um, and it's the thing that powers the knowledge system in Siri and things like that. Um, you'll find a lot of large companies have systems running that are Wolfram language systems that are customer facing systems. I I think there are a bunch of um, a bunch of Fortune 50 companies have large systems running that have Wolfram language backends. Um, and the, the, the typical model there is, uh, well, it's either running a raw Wolfram engine. Okay, so there are many different deployment channels for Wolfram language. Um, the thing I was showing you was just the desktop version. There's Wolfram engine, which is a standalone thing. There's a thing called Wolfram application server, which is a thing that supports APIs running against a containerized a uh, system that you can run on, on, on your own infrastructure. There's also uh, the Wolfram Cloud. We have a public version of that. We also have a private version of that called Enterprise Private Cloud that is something that supports um, both APIs and notebooks um, on a uh, either uh, uh, in the cloud. So th those are kind of deployment methods. I would say that the 
enterprise private cloud and Wolfram application server are probably the two most popular for deploying um, kind of enterprise uh, uh, kind of applications. And by the way, I should say that with the with the closure link that we were we were just showing, um, that will all just work with Wolfram application server, enterprise private cloud, or Wolfram engine. Um, so you can you can uh, build those two two things together. Awesome. It looks like we have a hand raise here. Sebastian Crane, thank you so much for raising your hand. Are you here with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, if I recall your explanation of the visual summary earlier, so that's the um, uh, yes. Wolfram's, yeah, uh, there's that multi-way causal graph on the right, the red one, that shows, if I understand correctly, the areas of the spatial hypergraph that can update independently. And so that, roughly, am I right? Not there? quite. Not roughly. quite. Um, okay. Okay. Keep going, though. And I was thinking that in classical physics, um, if you have a certain point and want to calculate the gravity that applies to it, um, that's a function of every other thing in the universe. Um, and well, so it, it, not every other thing in the universe, only the things in the past light cone of that point. In other words, only okay. those things which, from which a light signal could have reached that point from those other points in the lifetime of the universe or whatever. Yeah, I see. Okay. So in that case, there are still, um, in the perceivable universe, everything has uh, applied to that the gravity for that particle. So that, that makes me think... Yeah, it, it, the multi-way causal graph presumably doesn't map onto physical space because I can't say that a single particle's gravity is updated independently from the one next to it. Hold on, hold on. Many, many layers here. There are many layers. Um, okay, first point, what is gravity? Gravity, okay, in, in, in the absence of gravity, if you shoot a laser in some direction, it will go in a straight line and the line will be genuinely straight. The presence of gravity is represented by a curvature in space-time, which means that the shortest path is no longer a genuine straight line. The shortest path is curved because, uh, uh, because the space-time is curved. It's just like if, if, you, if you were on the surface of a sphere, the shortest distance between two points is not an ordinary straight line, it's a great circle path on the sphere. So what's happening in our models is the, the presence, okay, th 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 there's quite a few levels to this, but, but the, okay, first thing is this notion of GD6, shortest paths, is rather straightforward to understand in hypergraphs. You literally are taking two nodes and you're asking what is the shortest path in the hypergraph between those two nodes? That defines a GD6. Um, then the question is what is, for example, what is mass and energy? in these hypergraphs, it turns out that more or less um, energy is the amount of activity in the hypergraph. You have to be a little bit more careful. It's the flux of causal edges through space-like hypersurfaces. Um, it's, it's, it's sort of the density of activity, the density of updates in a particular place in the hy hypergraph. So what ends up happening is the effect of gravity is that what would otherwise be the, the, the presence of those updates kind of inexorably causes the GD6 paths, the straight lines, to be to be curved. I mean, this is not mm. obvious. This is a bunch of math derivation to show that that's that's how it works. But that's that's essentially how gravity arises in these models. Is that what would otherwise be uh, sort of where straight lines, where shortest paths are straight lines, shortest paths are curved because of the presence of these update events, which changes the structure of the hypergraph. Now, how that relates to, I mean, this is all. This is kind of complicated, and it's about a solid hundred pages of of uh, mathy stuff to kind of go through the, the the full story of this. But but roughly, the um, let's see the relationship. I and mean, again, it's kind of complicated because the causal graph is a space time causal graph. Those events are a particular. Uh, eventually you can think of them as being at particular positions in space and time. Although remember the whole thing is defined just by a graph. So there is no intrinsic set of coordinates. The coordinates are merely defined by the connections between different things. And then for example, space 
ends up being a slice through this causal graph. And so you have to, yeah, this, this is kind of complicated. I, it's, it's, yeah. um, I don't think I can do justice to it in, in, um, in a few moments here, but, but roughly, uh, and, and even when you talk about particles, uh, the notion of a particle is a complicated thing. Um, and uh, in fact, something that we are hoping to be able to do in the next year or two is to actually understand how particles work in our system. Um, we, amazingly and somewhat surprisingly to me, we've been able to understand things about energy and quantum mechanics and quantum field theory and so on without being able to identify this is the particular topological defect that corresponds to this kind of particle or that kind of particle. So we, we and so that's a yet different level of stuff discussing the effect of gravity on particles. And it's sort of a, a consequence of this general issue of, of geodesics in the in the hypergraph, but it's 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 a more complicated issue. If if yeah, mm. this, this is a, I I let's see, I can I can you can find on the web tons of details, but if you there's a big book that I put out, which is kind of at least the, the early documents about the theory of physics. And I I encourage you, I I think. There's a technical introduction there that I, I hope is quite readable that, that tries to go into a bunch of these things. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's, um, that uh, idea of the, like, the density of changes in a particular area being energy makes a lot of sense. So um, right. I suppose my critical question was that um, it seems as if there are parts of that uh, graph that, in, that update independently, and those to have, um, do they have, physical representations that are independent. If they're truly independent, that means there's an event horizon. Right, I see. So that, that's a completely different space in which, uh, well, it's a completely different uh, area in which gravity applies differently. Right. So for example, inside the event horizon of a black hole, you can have, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a quite separate thing. I mean, the, the way that, okay. So in ordinary general relativity, you start off with a four-dimensional manifold that represents space-time. And mm -hmm. there is a limit to what you can do with a manifold, a continuous manifold. You can't, for example, change its topology in any continuous way. A manifold, you, you, without, like, separately from the outside tearing the manifold, you can't change its topology. In our models, because there's this underlying structure that is discrete, you can have changes in topology, for example, you can have much more exotic kinds of structures than pure black holes. For example, one of the ones that we're really interested to go looking for is dimension fluctuations in the universe. So we think the universe is three-dimensional, space is three-dimensional, but our model suggests that it wasn't originally three-dimensional, that probably in the very early universe, space was infinite dimensional and gradually kind of cooled down to be roughly three-dimensional. And there's a decent chance that there are dimension fluctuations left over from the Big Bang. And it may be possible to detect those dimension fluctuations by cosmology experiments. And that's a, a thing of great interest to, to try to nail down. I mean, there are, there are a bunch of, bunch of totally weird effects that one wouldn't expect from standard continuum general relativity um, that, that our models suggest. Mm. Thank you very much for your answer. I'll, I'll have to read more into this because it's quite fascinating to see like the, the universe as a repl, I suppose, would be the, the uh, nice punch. Well, yes. And, and, and the other thing, to, if, you, if you really want to get um, sort of computational about it, here's, here's a bizarre thing. What's happening is these functions that are applying that are the events, they are creating atoms of space. What are those atoms of space? They're essentially free variables. They're things which are like the variables that they're well, they're, they're escaping bound variables from inside lambdas. So in a sense, the whole of the structure of our universe is escaped bound variables in some sense. Um, so uh, th that's, um, th that's a, a very oh, bizarre, okay. I mean, because that, that's what's happening is that, that it is creating new, uh, new atoms of space which correspond to new variables, each, each with their own, in effect, UUID. Um, so yes, it's, it's a... The, so that... that, that I suppose that justifies um, uh, not using. Sebastian, Sebastian, we, yep. we need, we would need to, like, to make some room for other for other questions. Right, no. Thank, right. you. Thank you. you. Should, if you're really interested in this stuff, I recommend a. We do a bunch of live streams about these things. B. Um, and I do a bunch of Q and A's in those live streams. B. We have a a summer school about our physics project, and actually a winter school also about our physics project. And um, if you really want to dive in deep, I recommend that. And that link is in the Zoom chat if you look to the right there. So that was a really awesome technical physics question. We are going to back it up, though, and do a more 
a, a, a lighter personal question. So you probably have very many, but what is your favorite and strongest contrarian opinion at the moment? Something that many people may believe to be true, but that you know, or you think is almost certainly wrong. Oh boy, this is a bad time to ask that question. You know, as a science person watching a pandemic take place, I, I have many, you know, it's, uh, 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 I've been interested to see kind of the relationship between sort of the science that I know and things that have happened. And I've been a little bit disappointed by, you know, I make sort of science predictions, at least I think of them, about what's going to happen. And it turns out that's not what happens, either because the science goes another way or because the politics and general societal pressures go in, in a different way. But I suppose the thing that, that I'm, I, I am curious about right now, it's not really a contrarian opinion, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a thing. This whole model of, uh, of, of physics and this whole idea of this sort of multi-way graphs and this multi-computation, all this distributed updating and so on, turns out that's probably applicable to the immune system. It turns out that, that one of the things that's happened in, in biology, biology is, a, is an area that doesn't tend to have much in the way of theory. People don't believe in theories. They just say, let's do the experiment, let's run a clinical trial, let's see what happens. And you know, if there's a theory, we don't believe it. Now, sometimes they're right not to believe it because biology tends to be just a really complicated, you know, it's like a big program that's been built up over the last 3 billion years and it's a big mess and it's full of gunk and it's hard to understand what's going to happen. But sometimes there are principles that are useful. Like one that was from the past is, you know, when genetics was being developed and people were like, there are all these different effects in genetics. And then people realized that there's this molecule, DNA, that just stores digital data. And once you understood that idea, it became very clear what was going on about a lot of questions in genetics. In the immune system, there's a lot that's just not known about how it works. And the uh, the thing that, I, that there's actually an old model of the immune system that kind of got abandoned um, and, and no new model arose that of any sophistication at least. And I kind of suspect that this whole multi-computation process of all these update events and so on is basically what's happening in the immune system. And that instead, this what, what lays out in, 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 the, in physics as physical space is shape space in the immune system. So you have these antigens and antibodies and so on, each one defined by a certain shape. And you can think about, well, when we talk about this branchial space in, in physics, you can think about that as laying out the space of possible shapes in the immune system. And I suspect that, for example, immune memory is, is very much associated with kind of this dynamic network of interactions between these different kinds of entities in the immune system. And this is something that uh, what, once one understands it, a bunch of things that go on about immunology will probably be really obvious, but they're not at all obvious right now. They just seem completely mysterious. And it's like, we don't know what's going on. We just have to do another experiment. So I suppose that's my, my um, I don't know whether that's a, um, uh, my, my main contrarian view is that, that it's worth doing theory in that area because one might actually be able to come out with conclusions one can figure out um, rather than just doing experiments and hoping for the best, so to speak. So. All right, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, so I have uh, another raised hands. Um, James, do you want to take the microphone? Sure. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks so much. Um, just for the next time I'm up at 3 a.m. thinking about all of these things. You mentioned a couple of points here that I'd just like to walk away with some clarification on. Uh, specifically, you talked a lot about metamathematical theories and topology, uh, lambda calculus and um, multiple Turing machines. And these bring up questions ranging from chaos theory, Gödel's incompleteness and the halting problem. And do I have to worry about a sudden universal collapse as soon as the universe realizes that it's operating at a finite space and can no longer continue? Or were these sort of just like analogies to help us understand what's actually going on or these actual concerns no, is, that affect physics? This is the real thing. I mean, in the sense that, you know, the good news is, we're almost certainly not in a halting universe. The good news is if we were near the center of a black hole, we would have to worry about halting because that's what it means. That's what a space-like singularity is, is the end of time. It is the halting of a computation. But it looks as if we are lucky enough to be in a universe. And in fact, this is the generic case in this Rouliad structure. We're in a universe that doesn't halt. 
So we don't have to worry. And, and actually, one of the more bizarre things is the universe is expanding in physical space. We don't know whether it will expand forever or whether it will, whether it will eventually recontract in physical space. It almost certainly can, will continue to expand in branchial space and in ruleal space. So even if physical space is compressed, it does not mean that there aren't degrees of freedom in the universe that are continuing to expand. So the, the, no, you shouldn't be worrying that the universe is going to end um, in, in, uh, uh, in a global sense. Now, in terms of, of um, well, let's see, uh, there's a question, will mathematics ever end? The answer is no to that as well. What happens in mathematics is the formation of essentially mathematical black holes. What is the mathematical analog of a black hole? It's a decidable theory. So for example, something like propositional logic is a Boolean algebra, is a decidable theory. Any, any question you can ask in Boolean algebra, you can just go crunch, crunch, crunch and get to the answer in a known amount of time. That's not true in fancier mathematical theories like Piano arithmetic, the axiomatic theory of arithmetic. That's what Gödel showed was had undecidability in it. There are things where there can be proofs that are arbitrarily long. There can be sort of proofs that don't terminate in piano arithmetic. That's not the case in Boolean algebra. So what happens in mathematics, I think, is that different areas of mathematics, you can essentially, when you have it, too many proofs, okay, so the density of proofs turns out to be the analog of energy in metamathematics. So just as the, the, the density of updates in physical space is like energy, the density proofs are like these update processes. So, so a, the, uh, you can think about this multi-way graph as being a sequence of applications of, re of, 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 of laws of inference, basically, in mathematics. And a proof is a path in that multi-way graph, which goes from one statement to another statement. That's, that's proving one statement from another statement corresponds to a path in this, in this uh, multi-way graph. And so then it, it turns out that the, when the density of proofs is very high, you have, I think, this is, this is new stuff. This is a few weeks old. So this is not yet fully, um, uh, fully settled. But um, the, um, it, it looks as if when the density of proofs is too high, there is an inevitable collapse, like the singularity theorems of general relativity, that leads to inevitable decidability. And once there's decidability, it means that an area of mathematics is finished. It's over. You've got everything there. It's you can. It no longer has sort of this infinite path available. And so that's so. In a sense, the picture of the future of mathematics is very much like the picture of the future of physics. In the future of our universe, we'll have a bunch of black holes where time has ended, and then other things will be happening in the universe. So similarly, in mathematics, we'll have a bunch of burnt out theories that have become decidable. But there'll be other areas of mathematics that continue to expand. I'll it's very, it's very now. weird Thank that you. you can make those analogies, but, but uh, that, that's, this is the, my recent sort of excitement has been realizing that there are these close analogies between mathematics and physics. All right. Thank you um, for this question. So I'm going with uh, uh, the next question is about uh, the Wolfram language. So we go uh, back into from physics to the Wolfram language. Um, can you expand on the transformation rules on symbolic expressions and how you use it in the language, expanding on the example of function definitions and why it is such a powerful concept? Right. I mean, I think the thing one has to understand about computational language or programming languages for that matter is there's all these sort of things that computers can in principle do. And then there are things that we humans think about. And kind of the goal of language design is to make a bridge between the way we humans can think about things and the kinds of things computers can in principle do. And so one of the things that's important is to try to capture how do we think about stuff. And this idea of you've got a thing that looks like this and you want to transform it into something that looks like that turns out to be a very convenient way to think about things. Now, you say, well, what can a symbolic expression represent? Well. At the beginning, we thought of it as representing programs. We thought of it as representing mathematical expressions. Then we realized it also represents graphics. It also represents user interfaces. It also represents running programs. It also represents, uh, oh, just all kinds of different things. And so this one idea of symbolic expressions gets expanded to represent all these different kinds of constructs. And then it turns out that this notion of, I've got an expression that looks like this, I want to transform it into one that looks like that, 
is just a very powerful thing that maps very well into something that we humans are good at thinking about. Now, in terms of, of what a typical piece of Wolfram language code looks like, for example, object-oriented programming, what does it look like in Wolfram language? Well, there isn't such a thing because all you're doing is you're saying, uh, you know, if you say, I'm gonna make an object, it's gonna be called G or something. It's gonna be a G-like object. Well, you just have the head G and then you have its arguments or whatever the payload, whatever that thing is like. And then if you want to make a method for doing something with G, you just say F of G of X blank or something, whatever the in innards of the G are, colon equals whatever. So you're just saying you're taking this thing that is now this sort of object that is symbolically tagged in a sense with the head G, and now you're saying what to do with it. And that's just something you can do just directly in terms of a transformation rule on a symbolic expression. You don't have to introduce sort of a meta level of talking about objects and, and, and so on. Now, another thing is, again, in terms of types, the language doesn't have any types, or has one type, which is a symbolic expression. Now, that, that doesn't mean that internally, it's not, you know, the actual hardware of computers is very much based on things that have definite types. So there's lots of effort internally to convert what is specified in terms of symbolic expressions at the top level into things that are optimally run in an actual computer as a computer exists today. And actually right now we're in the middle of a, of a giant project to make a much fuller compiler for our language. That's a giant exercise in kind of theoretical type theory and so on. Um, but but uh, you know, the, 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 main, the main point is that it's, it's just a, um, I mean, if you look at, okay, so when you look at design of Wolfram language, um, one of the things that I've worked hard on is to maintain a coherent design across the building of, you know, 7,000 different functions and lots of different domains and so on. And it just turns out once you have this idea of symbolic expressions and transformation rules on symbolic expressions, just a huge number of things kind of fall into place. Whatever you're doing, whether you're doing computational geometry, whether you're doing, you know, geo computation, whether you're doing uh, uh, other kinds of things, whether you're doing things with, you know, cloud processes and so on. Um, it's uh, it's just a, it's a very convenient thing. I'm not sure I'm not sure that I have a great other meta thing to say about it. I, I will say I will say one thing that um, this whole idea that it's possible to do computation by having transformation rules for symbolic expressions that you keep iterating until you reach a fixed point. I'm in a sense glad that I don't know didn't know the things that I know now about physics and term rewriting and so on that I didn't know those things 40 years ago when I started inventing this stuff. Because had I known those things, I might have been very scared. Because the fact is, it's not obvious, you know, like, like for example, the universe as it runs in physics is a consequence of a non terminating term rewriting system. Yet in our language, the language is based on the idea that you're going to get answers, that things are going to terminate. And so that's kind of a, a strange sort of uh, uh, a strange correspondence. And, and the fact that it is a practical thing to just do term rewriting and, um, uh, and then uh, and go to fixed points is a non-trivial uh, empirical fact about our language. I mean, it's worth realizing that if you type X equals X plus one into Wolfram language where X has not been given a value, what is it gonna do? It's gonna go into an infinite loop. It won't actually be an infinite loop. It has guardrails and so on, but it, um, that, that is something where you might have thought that you know x equals x plus one would just blow up the whole language, but it doesn't. And there, in a, in a sense, these are empirical facts about the way humans think about computation that 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 things like that end up not getting in the way. But there, there's probably a lot more to say about this. But but um, uh, that's probably about as much as I can come up with immediately. Thank you. That was a wonderful response. So. Next, we're gonna go back into the more computer science realm. And Porks or Domus, AKA Bobby Towers, asked on Discord, a really fascinating thing I heard you say about computer scientists was that they tend to have an aversion to heuristics and that a big surprise you experienced with Wolfram Alpha was that you found heuristics to play such a large part in interpreting natural language. If you could let me know precisely how badly I've misquoted you, and also, he's curious how, from your perspective, the rapid shift to machine learning has changed the landscape of computing. Are classical algorithms going to become obsolete soon? Okay, so a couple of things to say. So no, your quote is actually fairly accurate about heuristics. I mean, in, for many years in designing Wolfram language, I always wanted to make sure everything is very precise 
it all, it's very well defined. You kind of know what to expect. Then we started building Wolfram Alpha, where we wanted to have just pure natural language. Whatever somebody says, we got to do the sensible thing with it. And what we realized is that you can't do that in a precise way. Human natural language doesn't work in a precise way. It's full of hacks. It's full of weird historical coincidences. And the thing that I learned, which surprised me, was that heuristics kind of have a logic of their own. Once you have a giant boatload of heuristics, you start to kind of understand how heuristics interact with each other. And it's a different kind of thing than what you expect with sort of precise, sort of uh, axiomatic programming language construction. So that that's some... Um, that's about heuristics. I mean, it's a very scary thing. You know, when you're when you're doing like unit tests, let's say, for a natural language understanding, you might think, you know, that uh, I don't know, you have a test that says um, uh, you've got uh, you know forty nine cents. What does that mean? It's some piece of you know money. Fifty cents. Oops, no, that's the name of some wrapper somewhere. Oh no, somebody else. Now you know you think it's a modular thing, and you're going to test you know twenty five cents as a separate test. Well, that's fine until somebody comes out and says you know now I'm a famous rapper and I've got that name, and then then you know it, it just it is bizarrely non modular and and messy in that in that sense. Now in terms of machine learning, uh, it's sort of interesting. The, the you know I think what we've seen is an evolution of machine learning that's very similar to the evolution of things like linear algebra, where you know there was a time when when sort of computational linear algebra came into existence, it, it allowed computer graphics to develop, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There was a period of time when sort of it looked like everything could be solved with linear algebra. That was the 1970s or something. Well, that, you know, machine learning is, again, a very useful methodology. It's very convenient for many things. It will not be the, the you know, the full story. Let me give you an example. When, if you're trying to, you know, you say, well, why do we need programmers? Why not just have, uh, you know, why don't you just, uh, you know, tell the computer what you want in natural language and have it just do everything? So I had an interesting example of, of uh, sort of understanding that process. I was writing a book about Wolfram language and I had exercises in the book and the exercises consist of saying, here's a statement in English, now write a Wolfram language program that does this. The beginning of the book, when the programs are really simple, that was working just fine. I could write an English language sentence, people would understand what it meant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By the end of the book, the sentences, if I was gonna describe a particular program, were bizarre. They sounded like pieces of legalese and patent applications or something like that. They were you know, full of, full of complicated hair to be able to describe these operations that were corresponding to a program. And I realized that's why we built this computational language. That's why one would have a programming language as well, because it is a succinct way to describe these kinds of computational operations much better than the kind of vague thing that we have in natural language. For short utterances, it's great. You can use Wolfram Alpha, you can type in, you can even do that in Wolfram language. You can type a kind of a short utterance and it will convert it into actual Wolfram language code, a short piece of natural language you can do that with. But anything longer than something short, the tower just doesn't have strong enough foundations and the tower will kind of topple over. You, there's, there's too much sort of uncertainty in how the language is interpreted and so on to be able to do that. Now, you know, what's happening with machine learning and algorithms is in, in a lot of what is in Wolfram language is meta algorithms. So let's say you're solving some partial differential equation or something. There might be many different methods for solving that equation. A big part of what we end up doing is trying to automate the solving of that equation by having essentially a meta algorithm which picks between those algorithms. For these types of meta algorithms, we've long used essentially machine learning methods to, to build those meta algorithms. And that's a very useful thing. If you get the wrong branch in the meta algorithm, well, it's unfortunate, but it's not disastrous. When it comes to the underlying algorithm, it's not something for which you're likely to be able to use kind of the fuzzy machine learning kind of approach. And, and so, you know, what we find is there are particular applications that we've long used and, and increasingly use machine learning kinds of things. And there are other places that are just sort of hard algorithms where I don't expect that machine learning will be particularly important or relevant. Um, it's, it's for the, you know, it's, it's like, like when you're simplifying mathematical expressions, okay? That's a place where there are hard, precise transformations you can make. And if you kind of fuzz those out, you'll just get the wrong answer. But deciding which transformation to make is something that you can potentially do in a machine learning kind of way. And so the thing for us is putting in functions in our language, like classify, like predict, like feature space plot, and so on, that are underneath using machine learning 
to do things, but which are sort of elements of the language and can be called in other places, that, that seems to be a pretty powerful thing to do. Awesome. Um, we have one more. We have somebody with their hand raised here. Jacobo Cordova Flexiana has a question. And just want to remind the audience here that we are prioritizing people with their hand raised because we want to get, we want to hear from y'all. We want to get you to ask your questions directly. So uh, let's more hear from that, Jacobo. Uh, thank you so much, Jordan. Um, nice to meet you, Stephen. And congratulations for your theory. It's very exciting. I, I have some question about um, uh, all the space is like this atom of, of space who are fixed in some place. We don't know where is that. And we are recreating uh, through a complexity rule. You know, when I made um, this movement, uh, the atoms are uh, recreating by a kind of complexity for millions of years of evolution. So. Are you trying to find the rule of complexity of the universe? And are you using the constant of Planck, the mass of electron, the light speed, trying to figure out one atom of hydrogen or something? And if is this the way you are trying to figure out, uh, how can I um, trying to play with this computer, trying to find the... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so first point is there, there are two basic approaches one might take in finding a fundamental theory of physics. One is to take, <coughs> to take physics as it is, as we know it, and to try and reverse engineer from that to see, well, what could be underneath the physics as we know it. The other approach is to say, let's start off with a very simple model, and let's see what consequences models of this type have, and then build up from those very simple models and see whether one gets something which one can recognize as being like physics. We're more doing the second one of those things than the first. When you ask about uh, you know, speed of light, Planck's constant, mass of the electron, things like that, okay, so the speed of light is just a scaling factor. It's just the definition of meters. The thing that the only fundamental thing in our theory is the elementary time. So there is a there's an elementary time, and the translation of the elementary time into distance in space is just the definition of a meter, basically, which is defined by the speed of light. Similarly, the definition of energy comes from Planck's constant. So Planck's constant again is just a thing that is a scaling factor that's associated with our human way of parsing the universe, so to speak. Now, something like the mass of the electron is something which in principle is derivable from our models. Um, we haven't derived it yet, but it is in principle derivable from our models. And what I think is going to happen, it's, it's a pretty tricky thing because you might think the electron has a definite mass, 0.511 MeV, whatever it is, right? You might think it has a definite mass, but even in existing particle physics, we know that that isn't true. In existing particle physics, the mass of an electron depends on essentially the energy scale at which you look at it. The electron has what's called a running mass. And so it has that the mass usually quoted is the mass that corresponds to essentially zero energy, looking at an electron with zero energy, kind of a, in a zero energy way. As you, as you change the energy scale, the effective mass of the electron changes. So similarly, when it's, it's a rather complicated thing, it depends on kind of one's model for the observer of the universe, what the mass of the electron will be. And so that's a, that's a tricky, complicated thing in which one realizes that in addition to modeling the universe, one has to have some kind of at least approximate model of the observer to be able to make conclusions like that. But I mean, this is a, the, the, the thing that is sort of perhaps, okay, so our models of physics depend greatly on a bunch of intuition that has come from, in my, in my sort of experience, doing lots of computer experiments. You know, one might have assumed that if one has a simple program, it would just do simple things. That is profoundly not true. And it is sort of the experience from realizing that that's not true that's led to this whole kind of ideas about how physics might work. Now, when it comes to saying, can you find sort of a mechanical identification of, oh, you have this thing and you can sort of think about it in a very mechanical way, um, in a sense, the that can be quite sort of dangerous because the things that we're familiar with at our size scale are really different from the things that might exist at 10 to the minus 100 meters and things like that. 
So it's it's a little complicated. And, you know, in my ad- efforts to explain what's going on, I try and use analogies with things which are at scale sizes that we know. But those analogies are they're decently accurate. But the true story has to be coming from kind of the underlying computational processes and a bunch of mathematical physics connecting those to things that we know about physics and so on. So it's a it's a slightly more complicated chain of, of, of reasoning than than I'm probably giving it uh, doing justice to here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jacobo. Um, so um, we have we're going in order, I think, and we have uh, Robert uh, with another raise hands. Hi there. Thank you very much. This is like really stimulating. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned um, that you know, based on the the models, there there should be anomalies in the universe uh, that are observable. And I'm wondering if there's any proposed experiments, just like, you know, there were all the experiments that kind of showed that Einstein's theories were correct. Um, so I'm yeah. just wondering if there are, if there's like sort of a X prize for proving this, you know? That, Not uh, yet. I mean, see, the thing is, there are a lot of experimental physicists who come to us and say, we'd really like to do an experiment on this. And we say, we'd really like to tell you exactly what to look for, because we don't want, you know, don't fly a spacecraft and go look for something when the calculation wasn't done correctly yet. Um, the, the, I mean, it's just the difficulty with these kinds of things is we know there will be dimension fluctuations. What will be the effects of those? Exactly what happens to a photon propagating through a dimension fluctuation? We don't really know. That's a piece of essentially difficult classical electrodynamics, and it hasn't been done yet. And so it's, I think we're still a few years away from knowing exactly what experiments are worth doing. I think the ones, I mean, we suspect, okay, so the, the, uh, the, there's several different classes of experiments. One are essentially making gravitational microscopes. So what we want to be able to do is make a gravitational microscope powerful enough to see the underlying structure of space. In other words, to see below the continuum structure of space. And the best candidate for where that might happen is a supercritical spinning black hole, where essentially what seems to happen is, so black holes, uh, as they're observed, they there's a limit to the, the rotation rate of black holes that's been observed. And that limiting rotation rate has some consequences in general relativity. Um, but right at that limit, we think that essentially the, the structure of space is held together by a small number of causal edges. And that if the if the black hole was spinning any faster, a piece of space would break off. And that's kind of why the black hole doesn't spin any faster, but right where the black hole is spinning at its sort of maximum rate, we expect there to be kind of a small number of causal edges kind of holding the universe together. And it is possible that there will be measurements from gravitational waves and other things that could be made in which you would see those effects. But actually calculating what you would exactly see and how exactly to detect it, that's just a lot of work. It hasn't been done yet. There are also a bunch of experiments we think might be possible with people's attempts to make quantum computers. In our models, the, the, the ultimate quantum advantage of quantum computers probably isn't really there, but there's still a lot of value in kind of looking at the um, uh, sort of making computers out of physical things that aren't just semiconductors and so on. And it's my suspicion, at least, that there are some effects in essentially many body quantum mechanics, things that people use to make quantum computers, where we will see the effect of what we call the maximum entanglement speed. So in, in, in physical space, there's the speed of light, which is the maximum speed at which influences can propagate. In branchial space, there is also a maximum speed. We call it the maximum entanglement speed. We don't know its value. We just know that there has to be a maximum speed. It's essentially the maximum rate at which quantum states can affect each other. And it might be possible in one of these quantum computing setups to observe that maximum speed. We don't know what it is. A rough estimate we have of it, and it has weird units, is it's about 10 to the five solar masses per second, um, which is sounds very big. But the good news is that um, these, uh, these systems operate on short time scales and they have a large number of atoms in them. And so it might be possible to, even if that's the scale size, might be possible to reach that. That, that scale size would also be reached um, in uh, mergers of very large black holes. Um, if, the, if black holes the size of the center of our galaxy merged, then if we're right about that scale size, there would be an effect from, um, uh, from the, the, the way that the black hole merger would happen would be limited not only by the speed of light, but by this maximum entanglement speed. The bad news is, an estimate of how often 
black holes the size of the one at the center of our galaxy merge is maybe half a dozen of them have merged in the history of the universe. So okay. it's not a it's not an experiment that's easy to do. Um, so we have to, you know, that that's again that there, there are sort of issues like that that come up. But yes, we're, we're I mean, it, it um, we we'd love to have a more sort of complete picture of what actual experiments can be done. And I think I, I would I would I would say there's quite a lot of enthusiasm for people to actually go and do the experiments. We just need to know what experiments they should precisely do. Um, Thank you. Yeah, good good question. The, well. We have a lot of enthusiasm. We are getting close to time. We could talk to you all night, Stephen, but um, about 20 more right. minutes, I think we're probably going to wind it down. Right. Okay. And that, that will work for me too. I, perfect. I, I'm late for well, it, yeah. And so with that being said, I know that Edward Hughes had asked a question in the Discord um, in regards to a speaker we have tomorrow. And I also see that Edward has his hand raised now. So I will go ahead and let him ask the question directly. Hi, hi, Stephen. Uh, thanks, thanks for your time talking just today. Uh, I was wondering um, if you had any familiar familiar uh, familiarity with the work that uh, Gerald Sussman has has done with structure and interpretation of classical mechanics, which is similar uh, in this approach uh, of of using. A computer to sort of feel our way down like the the sort of possible many worlds we might be in and like what rules uh actually run them uh and so i was but wondering that wouldn't be quite my interpretation of jerry sussman's work there i think you know his primary interest has been in doing things like predicting the behavior of the solar system over over the course of long periods of time and that's that's a problem of kind of solving gravitational and body problems um one thing that's interesting about gravitational end body problems is they're hard to solve. When Newton was originally working on these things and tried to solve the problem of the motion of the moon, for example, famous, famous fact in history of science, you know, Newton had this whole theory of gravity and so on. And uh, he has this big chapter where he tries to predict the motion of the moon and he gets the answer wrong by a factor of two. And he kind of ends the chapter by just saying it's wrong by a factor of two. Now, some people might have said, oh, that means the theory must be wrong. In fact, what happened is that the calculation was really hard and he didn't manage to do it at that time. It took another 150 years for it to be done decently accurately. And what Newton, in fact, already knew, I think he said, uh, you know, to know the effect of the motion of many planets orbiting according to mutual gravity, I think he said, exceeds, if I'm not mistaken, the force of any human mind. Mm -hmm. And so he was kind of understanding the beginnings of this phenomenon of computational irreducibility that I've studied a lot. This idea that even though you know the rules by which the system operates, actually knowing what will happen can be very hard. And that's what Jerry Sussman, for example, in his sort of digital orrery efforts and so on, um, and Jack Wisdom and so on, uh, 